and we'll pick it up with Rocky. We'll fix it in post. I'm looking at the restream page right now to see if it shows up. Okay, I see Pedro. We're back on, on Twitch. Okay, we're we're on restream. So okay. if you want to just spotlight Pedro, and we'll just start all over again. We're not going to redo the introduction, but we're going to start over with introducing Pedro, and um, and we'll take it from there. There you go. There he is. There's the handsome man. All right, so Pedro, pretend like we're just doing this for the first time. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pedro. How are you guys doing? <laughs> hey, dude. Uh, so for a while there, uh, well, I wanted to make a cocoa board, uh, and I called it the Cocoa Plus Plus, these files that I have um, that I've already uploaded based on the Cocoa 3. And, you know, I have a bunch of ideas of what I want to add to it, um, you know, sort of feature creep sort of stuff. But one of the things that I really think it needs is that it needs a uh, USB keyboard support uh, just because you have USB keyboards, you know, they're ubiquitous, right? They're everywhere. Um, and, you know, interfacing a, a USB keyboard to something like the Coco can be a challenge. You know, some you can do, you know, really easily because they're PS2, they have PS2 signals coming out of them and stuff like that. But uh, most of them uh, these days, I don't think come like that, wired like, like that anymore. But anyways, uh, there is a chip out there that understands HID devices, like a keyboard, natively out of the box. And uh, someone out there has made an Arduino shield with this chip um, and provides a nice API to easily talk to these uh, USB devices, HID devices. And so it turns out it's actually not that hard to talk to a USB keyboard with one of these Arduino shields. Now, you do need you know, uh, some sort of microcontroller to talk to the shield. Um, obviously it's made for an Arduino, so I chose that. And um, really fast, you know, I came up with a circuit um, to be able to use a keyboard, a USB keyboard uh, on my Coco 3. It's a prototype circuit and it's based on how, you know, the, the PIA scans uh, the keyboard matrix. Um, but, and the circuit works and it works well, you know, for the test cases that I use, but, you know, after conversations uh, with several people, uh, you know, it may not be the best way to go about it. So uh, Jim Brain uh, recommended a chip um, that I could use that's inexpensive. So I, mean, I bought it and that's probably what I'm gonna use for, you know, the second revision uh, of this board. But I'm sorry, I wasn't ready uh, to show the thing off. So I had already disassembled it, um, but I- So got have... your videos will be coming up in the news. I can show some of it there too, so. Oh, okay, okay. So I, I do have the circuit uh, that I came up with here. Does that um, go inside the Coco? Well, this is just for development, but uh, eventually, yeah, I do want um, a small little circuit board that will go inside of the Coco. And what I did make, and I thought I had it here, but this place is a mess. I did make a little um, interface circuit uh, with um, some analog switches uh, to be able to do this. And, and it works, but the way I, the way I went about it, um, it wouldn't necessarily work in every case, you know, so I, I will, you know, redesign that portion of it. But all of this will not go in the Coco. Um, eventually it's going to be a reduced size because I only really need like, you know, on this shield here, that one little chip that's right there and a couple of other little support chips. So I think I can make a something small, but my goal is to not only just make it small uh, for the Coco, but inexpensive. I want it to be cheap. And that's another reason I, I designed it the way I had designed it before. Um, but again, I want to get it to work on the Coco, uh, on a Coco, Coco 2, Coco 3. I don't know if it'll work on a Dragon. I, I imagine it would. Um, but eventually, once I, I figure that out and it's working the way I want it to work, I want to include that uh, natively in this Coco++ Plus Plus board um, that I'm working on um, with the idea that um, the board itself later on, the Coco++ Plus Plus board will have some sort of uh, standard form factor, like an ATX, mini ATX, something to fit into, into cases, uh, standard cases that you can buy anywhere. And so, I mean, that's basically it in a nutshell. I don't know what else I can say about would the, it. Would the USB uh, have a, a dongle hanging out the back so you can plug it in? Or um, would, would you alter the case a little bit? Or? Well, what I was thinking of doing uh, was having on the board itself, um, 
standard USB connector. And so the, the Coco, I guess for other markets, it has like a little punch out at the bottom uh, near the transformer. And let's see here. And it seems that other, you know, you can route power through this punch out. You could maybe in other markets, this was used um, to power the cocoa. I'm not sure, but it's it, it's clearly some sort of plastic punch out there. So I was thinking maybe I could punch that out and have a dongle hanging out the back of that so that one can plug in a USB keyboard. If you don't want to do that um, and you want to use a wireless keyboard, you could plug it, you can plug your wireless dongle uh, onto the board that will will sit inside of the cocoa so that you can use a wireless keyboard. So, you know, those are the sort of two things um, I was thinking. I don't really want to modify the case all that much. And, you know, I'm not, I don't like to modify the case, uh, but there are people that don't mind doing it and they can do that too um, if they wanted to. Now, well, one thing you showed on the videos, which we'll get into the news segment here, um, you probably won't be around for that, unfortunately, but uh, no. you're at least here to answer some questions I had. So uh, one question that came up when we showed your original first video about it last week from Nick and me, because you showed it and it was looking like both the Cocoa keyboard and this USB keyboard adapter hooked up at the same time. And one of your videos actually showed both keyboards work simultaneously. You can yes. switch between them. If you want to do programming, you might want the PC keyboard. If you want to do gaming, you may want the layout of the Cocoa keyboard, for example. Yep. So I designed it with that in mind uh, to have it to have a pass through so that you could switch between the two uh, without any issue. And so in theory, and it, it worked. Uh, you should be able to use both keyboards simultaneously. You don't need a switch. You don't need you know to do plug anything, unplug anything to get it to work. It will, it will just work. Yeah, and then another thing you showed in one of the videos too is that you have a PS2 adapter, so you can run PS2 keyboards if you happen to have those around. Now I do remember in the old days PCs, if you tried to plug or unplug PS2 devices, mice or whatever, while the machine was live, sometimes that didn't work very well. Exactly. But in your case, I saw you, you do what you're doing and it was working fine. So you can even hot swap them because you hot swap in between one of the videos a couple of keyboards. Of and I did that on purpose uh, just to show that. Um, and, it, and, it, and I'm not sure if it's because of the USB shield, host shield that I'm using or the adapter that I'm using. But I did buy a USB to PS2 adapter a couple of years ago, which I know on my computer, I cannot hot swap the PS2 keyboard when I'm using that adapter. So I'm leaning towards it's the USB host shield that I'm using that allows you to do that. So every time you, you know, unplug and plug something in, instead of uh, redetecting it, I think, I suspect the whole thing restarts. And that's how it detects, allowing one to do that. And then another so, thing you showed is that you've actually got the caps lock key maps, which does the equivalent of a shift zero. Now, will you be doing a control zero if you want to do that in OS 9 to do the equivalent? Or is it something you can set in some way? Well, so it is, uh, I did set it up. Uh, that way. And uh, I, at the moment, I'm just, I was just trying to, you know, do the regular cocoa mapping, you know, get the simplest sort of mapping out of the way. And then, you know, that was an easy thing to do, you know, to, to tie the shift lock into that. And what the shift lock does when I hit it is uh, it just sends a, a shift zero, right. To, to activate and deactivate. And then there's some, some uh, semaphores and stuff in there to track it. So, you know, some just glue logic or whatever, but um once this is done, I do have, um, you know, at least the idea, and I think it's possible to have a whole bunch of uh, pre-programmed mappings or the ability to remap it, you know, on the fly to put the keyboard in a mode or rather the, the, the circuit in a mode uh, so that you can make these sorts of mappings. So if you wanted to do a control zero or whatever or anything else, you could. Okay. And do you have any uh, plans? Like I know some of the other third-party keyboards like Cloud9s and the Eagle and uh, I think Chris Hawks did one at 1.2 and a bunch of others of having like say function keys where you can actually program macros for them. So you can hit, you know, whatever. And it does like, you know, load M, blah, 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 exec or whatever. Yeah, definitely. I thought about doing something like that and it's totally possible. There's plenty of memory uh, available in these Arduinos to do, you know, uh, a bunch of macros and uh, to have and them stored in there. And as far as programming these special things, function keys, so, you know, the control zero, shift zero type thing, is that something that's going to be programmable from the Cocoa itself? Well, I thought about doing that. I'm not sure how I would go about doing that at the moment, um, but it's definitely, you know, one of the goals. Um, like and, maybe some uh, special key sequence, you know, like we have control reset, for example, to, to get the, the three amigos, maybe some multi-key thing you got to hit at the same time that nobody would never normally do. 
Yeah, well, so 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 the question is, you know, there's a, se a key sequence, like you said, that would put it into a mode where you could program it. Um, and so there's two types of programming, right? So there's one that you can do from the keyboard, right? Which I'm thinking, I'm envisioning, you wanna put a macro in, you just put in this weird key sequence and you can go ahead and uh, program your macro. I think that's totally possible. And it's part of one of the easy sort of reachable goals I have. The other one is to program the actual, um, um, the actual microcontroller via the Cocoa, which is something is possible. There are people that do that, but that requires this, uh, it requires a microcontroller to be connected to the data bus. Right, and you need control lines and that sort of stuff. And at the moment, that's not how this works. The it's just a one-way sort of communication. Um, and it's literally it's just simulating a keyboard, so it's only connected to uh, the PIA at the moment. And so, um, I guess in theory, you know, somebody could write uh, something where you can use the PIA to program it, the microcontroller. Um, uh, but I haven't, I haven't, uh, you know, thought along those lines too much. So right now, I'm still on the basic goals. But, you know, is it a possibility? Absolutely. Cool. So are there, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, are there other things you can attach to it, like uh, joysticks, or can you, you know, do a, a USB printer or a mouse? Do? I don't know about a USB printer. Uh, no. A joystick is a, huh? No printers. No. No printers. <laughs> <laughs> do not go down no that rabbit hole. No to the no printer. What? No to the printer. Joystick, no the yeah. Printer. Yeah, joystick. A mouse. So this shield uh, does understand joysticks um, natively. So in theory, you could use a joystick. It would understand a joystick and you can map the joystick to keyboard presses, right? So you wouldn't be using it as a joystick in the traditional Coco sense. It'd be a keyboard. So let's say you had a game that, um, you know, you play with your arrow keys, but you instead wanted to use a key, uh, joystick, you can certainly do that. And you'll be able to map you know, your, your, your joystick presses to, you know, say a D-pad on there to uh, the keypad on the Coco. So that, that is possible. Now, you know, uh, there is another project out there, uh, you know, uh, the, I don't know if you've been to, to uh, Scott Wentz site, the uh, Malfunct, where he has, uh, I think he's using a similar shield, if not the same one, to use a joystick, uh, an Xbox controller. Uh, but on the joystick port. Yeah, I have one of his prototypes. Yeah. Yeah. So no, not traditional joystick, but yes, you could use the joystick, a USB. Right. <clears throat> and, and, and I am not a hardware guy, but I will play liaison to the non-hardware people because I've learned enough to know what can and cannot be done. So we're so used to seeing a USB port on a computer and realizing that we can plug anything into that USB port and it's gonna work on the computer. But the amount of processing overhead for all of that to work is being done by the computer's processor and your operating system and drivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To do USB on an eight bit system, you really, you really have to set realistic expectations and you need this microcontroller to, ask, to act as the converter. So while yes, it is a USB receptacle, you can't just plug anything in and have it work like it would on a PC or a Mac because we don't have the advanced processing to talk to this thing. So like one of the questions with printing, you know, you can, most printers now, all of the interpretations happening in the driver on your computer. It's not like the old days where you sent control codes to the printer and just sent ASCII stuff to it and it printed, right? So most USB printers are not going to work on a vintage system, right? And right. since your thing is really inputting into the keyboard, the, anything that's going to plug into it has to be keyboard compatible, kind of like you said, right? But I used to ask a lot of the same questions. Well, why can't we just add USB? Why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Why can't we have HDMI? You know, <laughs> and yeah, but there there are because there's magic you can't yeah. see, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, it's, it's, but, yeah, especially in the case of printers, a modern printer has zero ability right. to print. The computer a, knows how to the print. Compu the computer yeah. is the printer tells now. Yeah, the yeah. computer. What yeah. to do, yeah. So it would be would nice, break. right? Now, what you're doing, Mr. Dave has done a lot of this stuff too. So, if you need to bounce stuff ideas off someone, Mr. Dave has made, um, you know, he kind of did like a um, 
I, he uh, helped you with the shift key, if I remember. He did. Correctly. I was going to say yeah. that. Okay. He, so, yeah. Okay. So you, ha- you have spoken to him. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. Yep. Um, he gave yeah, me a so very he, good he, suggestion. He did, uh, and there are people who have found the little RGB keyboards that fit inside the Coco form factor, where you can get a new keyboard to fit in your Coco. So there's people who've done those mods. Yeah. They've taken a Coco case, yeah. um, and and added those types of um, added those types of things. So yeah, but yeah, I, I mean, I know enough to at least understand the technical limitations of what you can and cannot do, but I'm not, I'm still not a hardware guy. Right. So and you can um, run wireless keyboards on this too. That was another demo you did in one of your videos. Right. Exactly. Right. Cause at that point, yeah. the, the, the USB shield that doesn't know, it doesn't care. It's just looking for, right. So that as is as long as cool. whatever you attach to it uh, is a standard HID keyboard, it right. should understand it. And, and, and HID also, being human interface device. Human interface right. device. Yeah, that is a, that's yeah. what that stands for. If Those it are adheres lo- to the protocol, l- yeah. Low yeah. bandwidth, no problem. <laughs> Printers, no. No. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do you handle key repeat as well? Like, is that a settable feature where you can... I, I can in the code, but I, I hadn't implemented it. Okay. But those sorts of things can be implemented. And you, you also said that it could work and it should work on a dragon. Well, part of it is just the actual interface part, but the other part too is the dragon matrix is different than the Cocoa matrix. So you might need to have a, it's a, a, tra- a translation. For yeah, that. it's a translation. Yeah, I, it's, translation, it's, it's the yeah. exact same physical setup. It's just, you know, which row, which column generate, which keys is yeah, different except yeah. in one. But that, that, that could be like a sense you're saying you can have different personalities in the, in the firmware, you know, have a dragon personality and a Cocoa personality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Another thing cool. that it has, and I don't even know if this is of any use. So in theory now, you should have, um, so two things. If, I, if I'm using a microcontroller like the one I'm using now to you know, drive the thing, it'll have a serial port available. So in theory, you can use that as uh, you know, an ASCII input into the Coco. So if you have something on your computer you want to transfer and say a basic program, you could in theory inject that program into the Coco. You don't have to type it up or I know you can load it from disk and all that sort of stuff uh, these days, but you know, it's another way in. But that's not as cool. So. Yeah, no, it's not as cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to hear a little distortion so, there when you said <clears throat> to bring that up. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about a USB mouse? So, like a USB one. mouse. Um, that's like this one. That's fine. <laughs> huh? <clears throat> like, <clears throat> like this one. Oh, we can't see you because you got him spotlit. Oh. Well, David Land was working on a PS2 mouse adapter. Mm-hmm. And it works. It works, is, is it it works very well. Mark's supposed to be manufacturing that. Are you already, Mark? Yeah, I have. Yeah. I've sold a bunch. Yeah, so yeah, it works there's, great. There's a product out there. So why, why are we not promoting that if it's out if it's out there? <clears throat> because right. I'm a low key guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this this uh, is the thing I built up where yeah. uh, it's a similar kind of uh, uh, HUD board that you've got, and I just basically uh converter to uh, joystick movements yeah and of course by chance it, that also works well with uh, wireless mice oh perfect yeah uh, so yeah a wireless dongle in there so the coco community has this already so how was it be hard to interface the it, keyboard so yeah you can do one or the other yeah so there is a shield out there uh i learned uh, the other day speaking of scott um that uh, I think we'll do them simultaneously, I think. And so in theory, uh, we can use that shield and port these designs over and uh, you could have both of them at the same time. Yeah, I don't well, know. Especially sure. on your plus plus board. I mean, if you can integrate those into the new motherboard design, so these are built in, yeah. you can just you know, plug in USB joysticks on the back and have them work and plug in the keyboard, et cetera. Yep, yep, yep. That is one of the, one of the things I want to do. So we don't have to keep adding, adding dongles and you know inserts and put stuff inside the Coco type thing. You just get your new replacement Coco three with all the stuff built right in. Yeah, well, you know, and now and I know this. Here's is your not... Coco four, boy. Am I going to start a controversy with that? <laughs> 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 I guess you could still call it a Coco three because it is a Coco three, right? Three plus maybe three B three, three plus. Yeah, okay, three plus. <laughs> so it's not going to tap more of the power supply, so we're not going to need a, a room full of power supply to power <laughs> uh, our gimme X and uh, all this other stuff attached to it. Mm. No, you just need a six foot long power strip for all the little bricks. <laughs> exactly. Uh, or you know what I'm going to have? It's not fun if you don't have like this big lever just <laughs> <laughs> power the thing. The Dr. Dim. Frankenstein <laughs> thing, yeah. <laughs> That's eight bit computing. Well, watch it drain Scott's RV in, in seconds there with all the. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, you are cool. in an RV. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Oh, cool. 
So coming soon, USB keyboards to you, the color coming computers. Coming soon. This week, I should get the, the chips that were recommended to me. Um, and then I think, hopefully by next week, I'll, I'll have a, a working sort of prototype. But again, you know, it's hard to work on these things sometimes. Have you, touched, right? have, have you touched base with the guys who did that retro repair roundup show? The, I know no, they joined our Discord. Base, no. Okay. They're, I know they're in our Discord server now, too, a couple of them. So well, yeah. I did... I did mention to, uh, what was his name? Mm, oh. uh, we did sort of had a little bit of conversation, but I think- uh, Javier, I think it's Javier. Uh, no, it wasn't Javier, it was- uh, Joe, uh, Rick, or yeah, Rick, it's the guy from Toronto. Maybe it was Toronto. Rick, maybe it was Rick, but I think he had different goals. Yeah, I think I misunderstood what he wanted. Or maybe he misunderstood what I was making, I don't know, but uh, I think, I think what they want to do is take their keyboard and use it with an adapter to make it a USB keyboard that, that they could use on their computer. Oh, that, that, that already exists too. That product, yeah, you know, opposite, Paul Fiscarelli has made that. Yeah. 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 No, but I mean, I just, the, that, that I joined that uh, video podcast of the guys who do the retro repairs and I was talking about you. I think you would be a good guest for them at some point in time. Cause you do actual hardware, hardware. you know, so. <laughs> sounds like fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. So well, yeah, I don't mind. Definitely talk to those guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you yeah. I, I don't know what else to say about this. No, that's cool. That's, that's cool. You're, problem, doing, you're, I, you're doing a lot. Just don't talk enough. So yeah. are, are you going to have a little store pretty soon with all the different products that you're making? Well, I don't know if there's demand for it. I did talk to a friend of mine that's a, a tax fan and he's like, oh, I'll help you set up a small little LLC to, so you can sell these things if you wanted to. So I, I may be coming up with a web store um, soonish um, to sell these things. And you got other people who can make it too. So you got like a Canadian retro rewind. He can manufacture stuff and things yeah. like that. And you got other. Yeah. If you so want if to you just be the design guy, not yeah. everybody, but all the you don't want to do all the manufacturing, manufacturing and, and stuff. I don't, I, I'm not really into the manufacturing part of it, but you know, I do want to make, I don't want to make money off of this to live off of, but a, a little bit just to pump sure. back into the hobby. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cause it's expensive. It's, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. why I do software. It just costs me time. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I should do that. Forget this hardware <laughs> nonsense. Cool stuff. Well, yeah. we appreciate what you do. You've been a breath of fresh air, just bringing all kinds of new ideas and new things to. Uh, yep. uh, thanks to appreciate the platform. That. That, yeah. that, that, Thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank. You. And by the way, this is fun. You know, I'm and that. You know, this is. I'm having a lot of fun. It's a great community. Yeah, that's what a hobby should be, right? A hobby should be fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and when it's not, it's no longer a hobby, right? Now it's a chore. So exactly. <laughs> so that's what does that, that that it is what keeps me up. You know, you know, I'm tired or whatever. I'm like, you know what? I I want to have some fun. It's like one in the morning, and I'm yeah. you know, cutting traces or soldering. And, you know. <laughs> that is so opposite of the word fun to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's <what> my wife says. <laughs> She's like, how did we end up together? <laughs> where did i go wrong i brainwashed her right. i'm sure she was hungry and cold <laughs> okay well we'll, we'll cover uh, your videos a bit later on because i know yeah. you have to go so uh thanks for yeah, coming I'll, on and giving us the update and uh, we'll we'll keep an eye out for future updates as well yeah no no thank you for having me on i do have to get ready and eh, not so soon but in a little bit Oh, well, thanks for, thanks for jumping on, Pedro. We appreciate yeah, it. No, thank thanks. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a bonus special guest right there. Are we now ready to get to our main plan, guest? Our, our main special guest now. Is everybody ready for this? Does anybody need a, does anybody need a break? Ron, do you need a potty break before we get started? Can I always go. Ron's our bladder uh, barometer, so <laughs> okay. I think I think the the P gauge is starting to get into the red. So how about we just take a brief break and then we'll come back with our uh, with our special guest. Uh, well, actually, I can't press any buttons here at this point, so <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for the button to press. It's not going to do anything. So. You need one of them big plastic buttons you can push. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here we go.
I'll mute mine. Hello, my name is uh, Brian Bruderer. I made uh, P-51 and Space Raiders. You can catch me live on Coco Talk, February 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And we're back. We're back. Okay, so hopefully uh, everybody heard everything on the stream there. <laughs> So our special guest today is Scott Griepentrog, and uh, welcome Scott, who's actually coming to us live from the side of Interstate 75 in an RV, which we'll get into a little bit later in the interview, because that's kind of his life now. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got excellent bandwidth, and I know when you were last on, uh, we interviewed Gene Turnbow, because uh, he was another one of the STG Net uh, sysops at the time, that you've got a pretty complicated rig on your RV for, for getting good bandwidth. Um, yeah, I've actually upgraded it since I now have a dual uh, cell modem router. Uh, it's a Mo5 Mo5 5500 if anybody's interested. Uh, and it's basically the same as your Wi-Fi router at home, except that uh, the upstream WAN connection uh, has two built-in cell modems. And there's so there's literally eight antennas hanging off this box, <laughs> <laughs> half of which are cell and half of which are Wi-Fi. Um, but that gives me um, two simultaneous carrier connections, um, and I'm actually working on some software to uh, uh, to help manage that a little bit better. Right now, I'm coming to you through AT and T. I'm pretty sure. Ah, check. Have to do five G or just four four G. Uh, right now, I'm I'm sticking with the four G modems because they are more stable. My requirements uh, are not speed. My requirements are um, ping time uh, for SSH connections. And I'm trying to, you know, edit code over, and also um, uh, just raw reliability. You know, being able to hold a Zoom conference like this, which I do all the time as well. I I, I run one. Is um, it, it's really necessary to have not so much the bandwidth, but the lack of dropout, and that happens quite frequently, uh, depending upon the network and where exactly you are. Uh, there's also certain parts of the country that it is extremely to get, difficult to get a signal at all. I have um, antennas on my cell antennas on my roof um, and have um, occasionally thought about uh, getting a Yagi just so I have a way of pointing directly to a uh, cell tower when I'm in a fixed position long enough to need that. But uh, for the most part, the rig that I have works pretty well. Um, and uh, gives me a reliable enough connection that I can do software work. I can do video work. Um, uploading and downloading large files is sometimes a little bit slow. Uh, but, um, you know, until uh, Elon Musk comes out with a mobile version of Starlink that you can actually take with you on the road, um, this is the best as it gets. <laughs> I was just about to ask you about that. <laughs> yeah. I know when Terry Stegi has just, just got Starlink at his house or is installing it this weekend, actually, so because he's out in the boonies. Yeah, for those that don't know, the Starlink is um, uh, location limited. You can't go out of a particular circle or the um, satellites as they fly over are transmitting at the wrong time uh, and you don't get a signal. So it's not, it's not something you could take on the road yet, but we are promised a new version that will do that someday. Okay. So anyway, just to, uh, we'll get back into a bit of your history here. So I guess the first question is, what was the first computer you ever used? Well, ever used would have been the TI-44-9A. I think that was it. Um, uh, strange piece of craft, um, but functional. I was, it was what was at the school that I was at at the time. Um, of course, very shortly after getting my first touch of a uh, TI, I actually got my hands on a live working Model 1, Level 1, 4K computer. That was my first. I owned it. It was mine. It was on my desk. And I wrote code on it and learned how to program in BASIC and everything. And then got tired of BASIC, went into Z80 language, machine language, uh, hand compiled stuff on paper because I didn't have anything more than a tape cassette that you would load this basic program and it would, it was so long, it would wrap around the end of memory, come back around and overwrite certain registers. So it would load a machine language loader that you could then type the hex in 
and run it and pray that it worked because otherwise you'd have to start all over again. But that was, that was a really fun learning days. Um, and strangely enough, there's a little interesting side story to that. At the time when I first touched the computers, I was actually in Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan. I was there because my dad as an uh, electrical engineer for RCA, they sent him to the RCA plant, the family with him for a couple of years to oversee the first color set that was being produced in the Taiwan plant, which incidentally also produced the black and white monitors for the TRS-80. So that black and white monitor with the big logo on the right side, well, that big TRS-80 logo on the right side of that screen was actually where the knobs would go for the black and white color television, I'm sorry, black and white, not color, uh, tuner, where the tuner knobs would be. So you would have a set produced uh, in Taiwan, shipped to the U.S. for, uh, you know, U.S. use that was a, or other countries, but it had the tuners there. And that's why that black plastic cover was there that covered up the holes where the, where the tuner knobs were. So they had those on the assembly line. Uh, they had the TRC model one level ones on the assembly line until the level twos came out. They replaced all the level ones with level twos uh, to test the monitors as they went by on the assembly line through the level ones in a closet. My dad brought one home one day and said, here, it's like, okay, this is fun. It's a keyboard. I can practice my typing on it, but what am I supposed to do with it? He hadn't brought the screen or the monitor or uh, the uh, uh, power <laughs> supply brick uh, or a manual to tell me what I could do with it. I had, I was clueless. And uh, fortunately, he did bring those by and uh, they never saw me again. I was just buried in the computer <laughs> from, from then on. When we got back a uh, year and some later uh, into the States, um, I kind of got tired of the TRS-80. It was um, Model 1, Level 1, 4K. It was kind of limited. There was only so much you could do with it. And I wanted a new machine. And I went shopping for what was going to be the most powerful machine. And I chose the color computer not so much because it was a, you know, color gaming system and, and there was not a whole lot of those are out at the time, but really because of the 6809 processor, I knew Z80 and I looked through the 6809 instruction set and I'm like, this is way more powerful. Um, you know, it's practically a 16 bit system inside. Uh, and so I was really, I'd fallen in love with the 6809 instruction set even before I had bought the computer. So when I, um, when I got the color computer course, I tore through all of the basic and poked around in the machine language, wrote my own terminal programs, rewrote the ROMs, all kinds of, of uh, fun, uh, crazy, arcane things that most normal people don't do. Um, and, but I had, a, I had a blast learning how all that worked. Um, then OS 9 came out and um, with some familiarity of Unix, um, I just... I just loved the OS 9. It was it did the things I wanted to do. I was actually in the process of uh, adding a lot of features by doing the ROM rewrite, you know, flipping the last uh, uh, portion of uh, RAM over so that you could, um, you know, cop copy the ROM into the RAM and then leave it in RAM mode so that you could actually run off of your own modifiable copy of the ROM. And I actually was rewriting it to, to do fun stuff that you couldn't otherwise do and then I learned that, oh, OS 9 does this for you. Uh, there's all kinds of, you know, redirecting input and output between things. And, you know, all the devices are really IO paths. It just, it made a whole lot more sense as an operating system. And so um, I dug into that and um, I, I really spent most of my time that from then on in OS 9 and learning C uh, because C was the big, powerful language that's what all, uh, when I got to Purdue, that's what all the Unix stuff was written in. Was It was all C code. And I had some access to some of that, discovered how they did things and how OS 9 had kind of copied a little bit of the concepts in places, but did some things a little differently. One of the big things I wanted to have was the ability to run a multi-user, multi-line uh, uh, multi BBS. So I had a screen. Somebody else could have a screen. We could have dialed in users. Um, you know, dumb terminals, whatever, you, to actually be able to use it like a true Unix system where you get multiple people running on the computer at the same time. I wanted to do that. I loved running a BBS, even at Purdue. I ran a BBS on my uh, line at the, um, uh, you know, where I stayed at the dorm. The, my, my dorm phone number was actually a BBS for many years. 
but I, I, although I love doing that, there was a lot of limitations. And one of the things that I had run into was the password file. It wasn't really safe to give somebody shell access to your machine because the password file itself plain text. was in plain text. <laughs> yeah. So I dug into how they encrypted passwords in the Unix source code. And looking at that, and it's like, uh, yeah, Cocoa doesn't have enough power to really do that multi-hashing over and over again. So I wrote a streamlined, simplified version of it, but it still ended up generating a, a hash system that worked. So I created my own login. That's how I got started with the STG.net system was I wrote my own version of login just to improve the security on my own machine. Uh, so that I could have user, have people dial in and poke around and, and have fun interacting with other users. Um, and it, it kind of grew from there. One of the things that I also learned they had uh, on Unix was UUCP, Unix to Unix copy program, which was the fundamental building block that allowed SendMail to send messages, email that was username at this computer uh, from one computer to another. As long as I had a UCP connection that would, you know, at night dial up, um, messages would eventually get there and somebody would write a response on theirs and that would eventually get back to your computer. So, you know, in a day or two, you'd get a response to, an, to a message. I was kind of handy. So I thought there's no reason that we can't do this in OS 9 as well. And so using that as kind of the model, but again, you know, that wasn't good enough. I wanted to rewrite the interface instead of transferring all the data in one direction and then transferring all the data back in the other direction i wanted to do it simultaneously so i wrote my own algorithm for splitting the data into blocks and transmitting them just burst mode just continuously transmitting in both directions to use as much of the bandwidth as possible of the modem connection to get as the the entire transmission done in both directions as quickly as possible once you ran out of blocks and all the blocks have been okayed with a small little act message from the other side you then had uh nothing more to send or receive you'd shut down both sides and then process the file that you got in to say okay well these messages need to be uh sent off either into local mailboxes because they are at my machine or sent to the mail the the system mailbox for the machine that was named for so if i had an email that needed to go to zog um you know that messages that came in uh for something at from some user at zog would end up going in zog's mail zog system mailbox because i had a direct connection to zog and then the next time zog connected or i connected to him those would exchange and so that way either side could initiate the connection and as soon as you had the connection started the mailboxes from both sides would be uh transferred over and then retransmitted locally if uh either delivering to a local user or delivering to the um, mailbox for that other machine uh, that was somewhere else. And if you didn't have a connection to that machine directly, then the um, description of the system block, the, the, the configuration block for your SDGNet system would turn around and say, all right, well, let's send it to my parent. You had to register which node, and you could change this. You had to register which node was your parent node. It didn't matter how many other systems you connected to, um, but if you had, a, as long as you had a parent node, and of course, everybody ended up parenting back to STGNet, to my node, um, the, um, eventually it would all come back to a central point and get redistributed down one of the other chains. So as long as I had a connection to everybody else, and I ended up having to come up with a, a, a mapping algorithm would know, okay, somebody hanging off a of Zog over here, I got to send it down Zog's path. So I, it would go up the chain and back down another, uh, up, up the tree and go back down another path to get to somebody. So it might take a few traversals, but that way we had a way of doing email across the network of OS9 computers running on Cocos, running this BBS software. And that, that was one of the commercial things that I had come up with and why. <laughs> So how, how big did STG net get? Like how big did the whole system note? I know, I know you had some like in Canada, you had some in the States, did you yeah. have some in other countries as well? I think we were like 12 or 15 nodes at one point uh, would have been nice. There was stuff that came and went over the years. And eventually um, I think uh, I, I had dropped out at one point and, and Zog took over as the root node, but um, uh, it was, uh, it was not the hugest thing in the world, but it was really cool to be able to have that ability to, to send messages to other nodes. 
Yeah, and you had some competition too, because I know Ron Byler made ribs, which was based on the fight or oh, thing, yeah. which was you know a PC based one, but we were linked into that as well. Yeah, but and you, you a, did a system that was completely cocoa centric, started and exactly. finished on the cocoa. Yeah. Yep. And I, and I borrowed as all as a lot of other operating systems do. I borrowed the good ideas I liked from other operating systems, most specifically Unix, uh, where I had had access to the code and I could look and see how things were done. Um, and get ideas on 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 how you know how, how how did they do something, and then I could make my own decision as to do I want to do it the same way, or do I want to improve on it. So now did you um, do did you do much programming for the sixteen uh, bit systems when they were first coming out, like the MM one, the TC seventy? Did you get involved with that? Oh yeah, so yeah. I got uh, basically um, I started out on the color computer because I loved the sixteen or nine. I did a lot of machine language and basic and whatever else not on the color computer side specifically, but really when OS nine, both level one and later level two came out, um, I really went whole hog into the OS nine operating system. That's where I felt my future was because I saw this multi-user multitasking Unix like system as the way of the future, as, as, as what I wanted to spend my time on, what I wanted to learn this was the uh, way things should be. And just the modular way that the operating system worked was just fabulous. And I was actually able to use it later in a job where I worked in OS 9, both um, OS 9, uh, well, I think at that point it was PC based. So it would have been OS 968K. Yeah. Or OS 9000, maybe if it was yeah. between different CPUs. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, the OS 9000, exactly. Yeah. Um, but we did, um, well, actually, there was uh, no, there, there was actually the, the underwater robot thing, and this is mentioned in some of my Oscar uh, magazine stuff. Uh, the underwater robot thing was actually, I'm pretty sure, was a 68 or nine based platform. Because what I ended up doing for this one company was, I was hired specifically because of my OS nine experience, and asked to port their engine, their PLC engine, into uh, the OS nine for 68K, the 68,000, and and um, the uh, the we would have done some OS nine thousand as well, some OS nine six uh, on the PC. We had we had programmable logic controllers that were based on different processors available to us, and I had to do ports for everything so that you could then using their editor, which had nothing to do with OS nine, uh, their programming editor, you could then upload the resultant code, the executable version of the resultant code, uh, push that into the target machine, whether that was running on OS nine or you know, a whatever platform. Uh, but we did a lot of work with um, uh, making the uh, making use of the fact that OS nine could be loaded into ROM, so that you could actually load all the modules you needed to boot up from scratch on whatever hardware platform uh, into the ROM, so that the so that the um, the entire uh, underwater robot system, for example, when it booted up. It had all the pieces it needed to. Now, if we needed to, we could break down and actually um, load an update over uh, over the top of some other module uh, into the RAM, reboot the system, and because you hadn't dropped power, it was still in RAM. And when OS nine rebooted, it found the new copy of that module and would reuse it, or would rather use that in place of the OS of the um, of the ROM version. It was one of the really cool features of OS nine was the ability to patch a live system, even though the bootstrap is in ROM, you could still replace any of the modules by having a copy in ROM. In RAM. Um, so that was something that, uh, since they kept thing powered all the time over the long cable, um, that was something that was uh, uh, possible for them to do. And even if they did have to power cycle it to clear something, they could start over with reloading uh, the few patches they needed to uh, for th anything that had been changed since the ROM was burned and, and the machine sent down. Actually, so, good, just for our viewers, because I know we talked about it on the pre-show, but they don't really know too much about it. What exactly was the underwater project? Like, what what was its purpose? And uh, well, it was one of those things where it was a customer of the company that I worked for that wanted um, wanted this capability. They had apparently uh, chosen OS nine as the platform because of these features. Uh, and I was brought in to actually do the port and then stuck around with the company uh, and did a lot of uh, features uh, beyond that. But um, uh, basically what they were is they were controlling the robot 
remotely over the data connection over a long cable. So they had a certain amount of lag time, but what they were really using this company's software for was the ability to give incrementally autonomous functions into the robot. So they would add new features into the robot, load that into the programming code, the, the, the runtime code that was running on the robot itself. And then um, they it shut off something. Uh, and then uh, they could update that as they go. And so the robot could do certain things for them. And then the lagged controls, uh, uh, they could uh, run other things manually. Uh, so it was, it was a way of allowing the robot to be more functional and more productive. Oh, wow. Semi-autonomous. Pretty, yeah, more autonomous over time. They could develop it over time. And I'm pretty sure this had to be something with oil rigs. I don't remember exactly what they were using the robots for, but it was it was deep sea diving, uh, either data cables or oil rigs or something like that. Um, but they they were really happy with the platform in the end, uh, with the flexibility that they had with it. But that was that was fun getting to work on a project like that. Um, and there was a lot of things that back in those days ran OS nine. You didn't even necessarily know it, including the post office scale systems. Yeah, and I'm like I, like I know some of the uh, like the Pirates of the Caribbean, the original version in Las Vegas, like that whole show was controlled by OS nine underneath the microcontrollers yep. and traffic light controllers and stuff like that. So it's- and CDI and um, another job that I did because I had my OS nine experience uh, was a uh, short lived, unfortunately, uh, development of a um, uh, what do you call it? a set top box uh, a TV video display back in the old days where um, you know, the internet was still relatively young and they were just starting to do video on demand over your cable connection that your set top box would play that. And we were building a version of that, that ran OS nine. And, uh, that was a really fun project. Um, I got to work with some designers that were Apple centric, uh, that the idea was that the, um, the mouse response time is the most important thing. And then, you know, me being more of a system centric approach, I was more concerned with, look, you can't go messing around, poking around in memory in such a way that your MMU, your memory management unit can panic and kill your process. Uh, You have to, you have to follow certain rules. So if you want a copy of something out of another process or out of the system, you got to allocate the memory ahead of time and ask the operating system to give you a copy of it. Not just go grab that from memory from a pointer from somewhere else. Because the MMU may may tell you you can't do that. <laughs> it may not even be in a in a uh, if you got a page switch system you don't want even you may not even be in a page you can access directly. So there was things like that that uh, uh, we had a lot of interesting argument discussions over the design of that set top box <laughs> system, but finally got it uh, a, a demo up and running to the point where you know we had a remote and we had a NTSC monitor hooked up to the set top box and we could actually play fake uh, video streams. Uh, and and control it, and it all worked in OS nine. It was OS nine thousand, so it was a x eighty six based uh, platform, but it worked. Did you ever do any work with David then and stuff under David was Which? It? Well, David uh, Microware had their audio video thing called oh, David. That, I can't the David which. platform actually. David <laughs> was the platform we were starting with doing that. The the, the David stuff for D, for the DVI and whatnot. That that multimedia uh, libraries. For OS 9000, that's actually what we were basing the uh, set-top box platform on. That's okay. where we started. And then we were doing the user interface layer on top of that. Because I, I know OS, 9, or OS K and, and OS 9000, I think both also had versions of X Windows. So I don't know if you did any work with that stuff. Or G Windows is an alternate one by a third yeah, we, party. And- we, weren't, we, were, we weren't doing Windows. We were doing a... Um, uh, a more raw level of um, uh, controlling the video display directly. So we had primitives for how to draw on the screen that David gave us. Um, but we also had to do, do weird things, which David had ways of controlling um, that was like, okay, I've got this video stream coming from this interface port that needs to go here on the screen. And then I still had controls up on the side because one of the requirements of the platform was to be able to have, you know, like an ad or a status information that would either lay over the top of the video or you would squish the video down a little bit and put it here on the side or below or whatever. Um, So we had a lot of things like that. And then we also had 
um, we, we also needed to be able to play games. So, you know, your DVI style games where um, if you picked a game off the menu, that game program came up and it was forefront on the display. So it was running the display. It was in charge of the display. The uh, process that uh, um, uh, if you hit the home key on the keypad, on the remote control keypad, um, that would need to interrupt the game. But it was a handshake to say, okay, game, I've gotten this, um, this thing. I've got to take over. You need to save or pause or whatever and give me back the display before I kill you in so many seconds. <laughs> and, uh, so we worked out all of those details so we could prove that we could go in and out of, of, of game programs that then had the ability, much like in the old um, uh, iOS, uh, not iOS, but uh, the um, the Apple OS days where, uh, you know, in the 68K days where they had complete control of the display. So a game could draw on things directly until it was interrupted back by the operating system. You know, that kind of stuff, we were trying to replicate those abilities so that the game developers had some freedom so long as they obeyed this one call, because if they didn't, they were going to get killed. (laughs) (laughs) which actually ran into some memory leak problems because unfortunately one of the features of the operating, the OS nine operating system is that any process that is, that allocates memory has to return it by pointer and length or it gets lost. It doesn't know it's there. Yeah. So uh, uh, back to the OS K systems here for a bit, like there was a system four and five by Ed Gressick by, uh, I can't remember what the name of the company was off the top of my head. And then like the TC 70 from, uh, Frank Hogg Labs, and then the MM1, yep. MM1A, et cetera. What involvement yep. did you have with those? Did you do multiple ones or just single ones? Or Well, I had, I had, I grabbed the machines when I could, um, poked around on them. Um, I had an MM1 for many years. That was a nice platform. I did a lot of actual development on it. I actually took that out to uh, my 9X job and, and uh, uh, used that for um, some of the test, initial test code before we got our uh, hardware platform to work on. So there was a, there was a lot of, uh, lot of stuff that, that was, and I was trying, I actually had come up with a version of the STGNet system for the OSK platform. So like the MM1 and similar, I was planning on supporting uh, using the same base code as the STGNet. Unfortunately, that never really got completed uh, or released. So um, I think we might've had a couple of test systems out there that were actually running it, but uh, unfortunately it didn't really get any further than that. Were, were you involved at all with the OSK? Like, uh, you know, Kevin Darling and a few others were working like uh, the whole GUI system and stuff like that, you know, based on the Cocoa with a lot of additional power. Were you involved with any of the... the oh, no, I wasn't, there? unfortunately. I, I, I learned about that after the fact, but but thoroughly enjoyed uh, the uh, the new uh, window op- windowing operating systems uh, when they came out. Yeah, and there was also like DMA and stereo sound and all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. there too, so... If, if David Ladd were on, he'd, he'd be spouting off about it because he's still got his MM1. He's trying to get parts of it work, up and working again. So so do you have any of your old equipment still? Like a Unfortunately, or? no. Uh, I have I have over the years, um, you know, as I would move or or whatnot, you know, um, got a wife and family and kids and and uh, uh, moved houses and, and so forth and so on. Over the years, while I did try to keep stuff, and I actually did have... Um, uh, I did have, have an opportunity for my own kids uh, to play around with Cocos, although they weren't as interested as I was. Um, uh, I unfortunately did over time finally either sell off or, or otherwise dispose of, um, uh, of my old gear. Most of the time I tried to find somebody that was really interested in having it and, and uh, give it to them, if not. And were you doing this just because you were you just didn't have the time anymore, or is it because you you got the nomadic I, lifestyle where you don't well, really have the nomadic, room? Or? The nomadic lifestyle didn't really start until uh, this until uh, more recently. Um, what happened was uh, is that of course the the uh, color computer wasn't wasn't the only hardware uh, things that I was interested in. I had all kinds of things. You know, I I uh, even when I went out to the nine X job, I took with me a sun three monster workstation in the back of my van and use that for a lot of the, the uh, video development um, because I had a big hard drive in it and I could, you know, I had a whole one gigabyte hard drive uh, in that full height uh, SCSI. And um, uh, I really ended up with 
way too much hardware. I mean, <laughs> by the time I got, I remember you you brought the Sun 360 to Coco Fest, and it, yeah. it's literally like the size of I don't know what you call it, like a, a, a fridge. fridge. It's yeah. a fridge. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was bigger than a microwave, uh, smaller than a range top, but it was, it was, yeah, it was. Um, it was on wheels. It was that dorm, big. You had to roll it, it around. It was dorm, too heavy to carry. Yeah, bigger than dorm fridge, and it had its own wheels because you had to push it around. It was, it, I mean, the whole thing was just solid metal frame. Um, but I love that machine because I could do things on it that, that um, it, 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 it allowed me to play around in, uh, in real Unix. Um, that uh, I had learned at Purdue and also was continuing to do at other locations. Uh, IEPY, uh, where I did some work at, as well as an outfit that was a, uh, an Indianapolis uh, uh, dial-up networking, dial-up internet, rather, startup called Indy.net. Um, and I used that, uh, that box there as well. So I was, co- I was accumulating too much gear and... Um, and at some point, as things got more PC and more virtual, um, I just didn't have the need for the old hardware anymore. And it got to a point where all it was doing was, you know, sitting on my shelves in my basement, rotting. I literally, half of my basement was just rows of shelves, you know, kind of <laughs> like uh, the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, of old antique gear that I hadn't touched in decades. I mean, the other thing I was huge into was pen computers, still still into pen computers. I have a pen tablet laying around here somewhere. Uh, Pine 64, I don't know where that thing was. Oh, here it is. So I just got this in, which is my, my latest, you know, runs Linux and um, allows you to, to scribble on PDF documents. And it's open source. Uh, you know, I live for this kind of stuff and I'm sorry, I spent all my money on hardware <laughs> in order to be able to play around with all the new things coming out. And, um, you know, I got married, had kids, and uh, really had to slow down on spending the money and storing all this gear. I mean, I got to the point I would cart it, I'd box, every, box a whole bunch of stuff up off my shelves and cart it to shows and try to get rid of some of it. Uh, it put it relocated in somebody's hands who really wanted it. I um, mean, I still get occasionally on the internet get requests for old archives that I've kept of some of the old um, uh, pen system, the pen Windows drivers from back in the um, uh, the Windows three for pen uh, days. Um, so it's uh, I really have uh, I got my start really in TRS-80 and color computer specifically, and then OS nine and whatnot. But I have I've really enjoyed getting to play with all kinds of different gear over the years, and that's continued. I mean, I've I've now gotten into um, you know uh, building code and hardware and such for upgrading RVs, and uh, which I now travel around the country living in one. <laughs> yeah, and actually, we'll, we'll get into that pretty quickly. I just wanted to mention uh, John Strong, who knows you from Coco Fest yeah. days, of course, uh, yeah. has joined us on the call. So I thought oh, you yeah. might want to say hi. Yeah, hey, John. Hi. hi, I'll kick the uh, uh, video on here in a minute. I had to let my wife know first before I turned it on. And uh, yeah, I can verify the fact I go visit Scott. He actually lived uh, really close to me part of the time. And, uh, you know, go in there and the computers and the stuff for the laser, my uh, uh, microfilm equipment and stuff he was working on. And oh, so yeah, on. I forgot about that. And uh, so that's kind of when I met them, uh, really got to know Scott. He was working for a place over near Alexandria for a while, and then he was based in Marion, Indiana for a while. And uh, probably the last time I seen him, we met up in Indianapolis at Steak and Shake. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I sent him on here, I had to pop on. I just, uh, <laughs> I and, and say hi and, uh, and say, you know, he was a, a great contributor to the OS9 stuff. And, uh, a good friend. So, uh, yeah, I was busy trying to make my reservation for Coco Fest. <laughs> and I did join <laughs> early. Yeah, well, we, we approached Scott about doing that, but he's already booked through May. So unfortunately he can't yeah. make it. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we get pretty busy. I, I swear one of these years, I'm actually going to show up, you know, RV and all and, and, uh, and attend again. It's been a few years. So, and, and I have a, I have a personal connection to 
the Color Computer Club out of Chicago um, because our lovely monk brother, Jeremy, actually helped officiate my wedding in Indianapolis. That's right. He came down and um, uh, he was actually doing, um, along with my pastor, was doing part of the ceremony. And then later he was the entertainment doing his DJ and guitar bit with the microphone uh, at the reception. Um, you know, I, I really want to get back together and and uh, and come hang out at, at the Cocoa Fest again. Um, it's I think Brother like, Jeremy is still in the UK, from what I understand. But yeah, I uh, yeah I've I've heard he's been out about, so I haven't heard from him in a long time. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, we have a question from Jet Tennyson. We did ask you this in the pre-show. Um, I guess I'll expand on a bit, but he's asking, do you have any of the code from those days? You know, for the old O's nine stuff. Now you mentioned that you sold off all your cocos, and you mentioned the pre-show you don't have the code anymore. But well, did the person that you gave it to do they still have the code? I don't have the code anymore because I very carefully kept copies of the code, and I kept CDs that I burned of the code, and then I kept hard drives that I would, you know, over years I would upgrade from one storage system to the next. And I got to the point where you know I had dual hard drives for for uh, for mirrored for backups and everything. And at one point I screwed something up horribly. Uh, one of the drives is going bad and I reversed the DD and I literally destroyed all my old historical <laughs> documents oh, by running the DD the wrong direction and copying the bad drive, to the good drive. And <laughs> it's an evil command. So um, unfortunately, all of my old stuff that I was very careful to keep track of because someday I wanted to go back and, and muss with that, if not share it or something. Um, unfortunately, that's all gone. Uh, but I very carefully copied the code from from uh, uh, from the color computer up to the 68K on the MM1 and whatnot, and then later into PCs. Um, but yeah, I was, and of course, I always had a copy of it on the old Sun. But yeah, over the years, if I was getting rid of a piece of gear, I certainly wasn't going to leave my special uh, secret code on how the SDGNet stuff worked. I wasn't going to leave that in the open. Um, I almost wish I did now. It's entirely possible that somebody out there has a copy of it. If anybody did, it would be Paul Jerkatis. Uh, uh He was the guy that that uh, helped me with the development uh, in the early days. He was more of a test beta testing uh, than code development, but he uh, he would have had access to some of my code, and he would have uh, he was actually one of the very early nodes. Uh, S A N D V. I don't know what it meant ever, but he never told yes, me. Yes, and Sandy. Sandy was was his node. Um, and uh, he did that for many years. And then uh, when he came out of Chicago, I had him come down to Indianapolis to help me work at one of the companies that I uh, was doing at the time. He actually ended up getting out of the software business and uh, he has a side business doing um, it's PRJ performance. I think if you Google that, you might find him. Uh, he does uh, souped up hot rod cars. Um, I think it's out of his garage. Still. Uh, but he's at, uh, Southwest of Indianapolis. Um, and uh, that's what he, that's what he does. Uh, is uh, um, occasionally he'll call me up uh, with a question on how do you do this, that, or the other. But um, you know, we we haven't uh, haven't kept in touch as as much as I would have liked to, uh, which is really true of of um, me and a lot of the OSN community. So this is, or, or even color computer community. So this this is uh, this is fun. <laughs> Getting to talk about this old stuff and and triggering old memories that you know I haven't thought about some of these things for years. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you'd mentioned that uh, at some points you were doing some backups up on CDs and stuff. Are any of those still in existence? Or No, what happened was um, I had actually decorated a wall with them. I had uh, <laughs> in my house, I had I had uh, nails that I had put up in a grid pattern and it hung all the CDs. You know, 90 percent of it was, you know, um, it printed, you know, mass produced stuff. But I had a, quite a number of CDs that I had burned as backups of things as well. And I would keep on the wall because I would always have have I was religious about trying to keep the backup copies that I wouldn't lose track of. Well, over the years, I finally, you know, relied on having those hard drives with mirrored backups. I thought that's never that's never going to die on me. I'm, I'm always going to have that that uh, backup uh, stuff. And I let the CDs go. I finally just got rid of them because they, you know, it was one of those things that had been sitting on my wall for five or six years in my bedroom and of course, my wife wasn't terribly happy with that. 
and it matched uh, the decor she wanted, I guess. Eventually got rid of them and pulled the nails out and re, uh, you know, re uh, drywall, re uh, redid the uh, plaster a bit uh, to fill in, and uh, then she wallpapered over it. But um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be able to find anything. If I have anything, it's on an old USB stick. Uh, that would be about the only thing that that hasn't gotten accidentally destroyed along the way. Yeah, because uh, anything at all, like uh, like like I mentioned in the pre-show, we're we're trying to archive everything Coco related uh, on the ClickerBeerArchive.com. So if you find anything, even if it's only partial pieces, if you if you want to upload it there, that's a perfect place to do. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't even have the physical media anymore. Is the problem? So um, I will keep an eye out if I do come across anything at, at, ever. I will certainly get in touch with you, but uh, I don't. Yeah, and if you get a hold of Paul in the in the next you know years yeah. or whatever, there if he still got I'll some stuff, him. I still got his email address. I'll ping him and see what he knows. Yeah. Also, I wanted to mention there was a person that was going to try to be on here to to ask you some questions too. Uh, he wasn't able to make it. Uh, Damon Beals. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Damon Beals and I are old friends, going all the way back to the Indianapolis Color Computer Club. Um, and he actually got me a job at IUPUI. Uh, which is I, Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis. Oh, we call it Uipui. And um, I did some work for there. Basically, he was IT staff uh, for one of the science technology buildings, I think it was. Um, I don't know if he still works there or not, but um, uh, uh, he was actually, um, uh, I had come in on a project that was being run out of that um uh out of that building uh in the offices next to him so i got to hang out with him a lot and i wrote some some code for some of the profs uh there uh fixed a problem where they had with print servers wrote a new um uh, multi uh multi-threaded so to speak uh, it was cooperative threads but uh a multi-threaded print server handler um that was all visual so you could see exactly what was going on um so this um some fun stuff like that that I uh, I would do in addition to the the primary job, which was testing these uh, hierarchical storage systems. Um, that uh, was the main project that that group was working on, but all kinds of fun stuff um, uh, that I did over the years. Um, but um, yeah, he would. Uh, I think he came up to the uh, Chicago Fest a couple times with me as well. Yeah, because his one comment says, yeah, yeah, that you're living the RV in the RV, traveling the country. He's still one of the best programmers I know. We would knock out code so quickly. So <laughs> big props from him. So one yeah. other thing, like you, you did all the, uh, the like a low level programming of the SDG net system and, you know, duplicating a lot of Unix functionality of the OS 9 and then working with, you know, OS K, et cetera. Another thing you did that you mentioned briefly here was the Oscar magazine. This is one copy yeah. I happen to have. So I guess uh, being a fairly low level systems programmer, what prompted you to want to suddenly decide to do a magazine? Because it was a little venture. Well, so one of the things that happened was um, I even actually, believe it or not, had a booth one of the last years of the Rainbow Fest. I'd actually bought a booth from Rainbow. I had uh, for about three or four months, I had an advert in the Rainbow magazine for specifically the STGNet software um, uh, BBS login package, whatever I called it at the time. Um, that was a... Uh, 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 that that was kind of like a, a reason for me to absolutely have to be there every year because I'm trying to support this. I was actually selling along the side of the software package. I was also selling um, uh, UART carts and adapter cables so that you could plug multiple serial ports with a real DB, real DB25 connector to go to a modem. Uh, so you could hang your multiple modems off of your OS9 system. I was actually selling that at first Rainbow Fest and then later the Color Computer uh, I mean, the, the, um, the forever re happening, uh, last rainbow fest, um, it was 91. Uh, so I, I would have met you then though. I wouldn't have known you at that point. Yeah. So the, so the, the, the continuation of, uh, what was rainbow fest in the Glen said, of course I did the same thing. I always made sure I had a booth, always had things to, to sell. Um, and, uh, at one point I was even selling, uh, keyboards, you know, there was the commonly available, uh, PS2 keyboard adapter, or maybe it was the five did, I don't remember. Um, and I would, I would sell the, um, uh, I'd found this one particular Chinese manufacturer was making this tiny little keyboard, uh, for this one computer and it was a perfect size and it worked fine with the adapters. So I was selling those on the side as well. That was a very popular item. Um, but, um, 
yeah, I, I just, uh, I kept coming up with, uh, with new things that would be an excuse for me to do something. And the one thing that I was annoyed with really was the dearth of information around the 68K, the OS9 um, uh, specifically uh, software. And so I was, because there was, there really wasn't a, a magazine for that, you know, the, there was information some on OS 9 and a lot of stuff on Makoko, but there really wasn't uh, uh, something for the, the OS 9 um, 68K stuff. So I figured, well, I can do that. So it was just another one of these, I'll get, I'll figure out a way to do it and I'll make it happen. And so I invented a whole bunch of ways of processing the text and uh, printing the, uh, the, the shipping tags directly on the back page. I would literally open up the back page of, a, of the magazine I got from the offset printer house, stuff it in this special Fujitsu printer I found that would wind it backwards, print out the address on it and inject the, the paper back to me. So <laughs> even though it was already bound, I could print the address label without having to get a sticky label. It was just uh, crazy things like that. You know, why bother to get a, uh, a sticky label and run it off normally? I was going to do it the hard way. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Was basically a one-man show with you or, or yes. did you have other people involved? Well, yes and no. It was a one-man show in terms of everything from uh, offset press through the getting it out to the customers. And then I handled the editing and putting the, the stuff in the magazine. Um, Alan Sheltra, known as colloquially as Zog, um, it was his uh, SDG net uh, BBS name as well. Uh, he actually did all the graphics. So he would send me the images. I would do all the text. So if it was something text, that was something I did. If it was something images, adverts, that was something he did. And I, it, it, most of the times I would do, um, you know, whole pages of text, whole pages of graphics. But occasionally I would cut and paste a piece of his graphics over the top of my text or vice versa. Um, and, and then send that, that, you know, taped version, you know, uh, cop, literally cut out pieces of paper taped together. I'd send that version, bring that version over to the uh, print shop in Speedway, Indiana on 16th street and yeah, I'm, um, have them run that off on their offset press. Curtis, I don't know if Mark saw that, but I don't know if, if he could do a shared spotlight because I know you were holding that up for a second there. That's yeah, one of Alan's uh, cartoons, actually. Let's see if yeah. we can get uh, Mark Give me to his, do a shared spotlight. His artistic style was very unique and very cool. It's like Almost undergroundish, I guess, would be one way to describe oh, it. Oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, it was perfect for the magazine. Sort of, sort of like Robert Crumb. For it it look, kind of very looks like so. the keep on trucking type stuff. Exactly. Yeah. I think that may have actually been his inspiration. I don't know. That's another character that you should see if you can find and get on the show. <laughs> and I guess he would have done, well, maybe not this particular issue, but usually he had more cartoonish style covers and stuff too. But uh. well, that would have been him too. Uh, anything, anything graphical at all. I just didn't do the graphics. Yeah. That, that was all, um, that was all uh, Alan uh, creating the graphics. I, I literally just did the text and fill in. Now this would be um, this would have been his Zog character, isn't it? Yep. So was he the one that ran Animagic? I know they sold like the like here they've got uh, they're selling so. your STG Net BBS. Yeah, so. yeah. That, I think that it was either him or somebody next to him that was um, somebody related, somebody he knew that was doing that, and then was was uh, you know selling some of those different software packages. So anyway, there's there's Zog for everybody in a couple of different poses. Yep. And and um, I mean, you obviously you're shooting more for the OS, OSK because you called it Oscar with a K, right? Um, though you did cover six to eight hundred nine and stuff too. Um, well, OS I don't, I don't have the last couple issues. Did you ever cover OS nine thousand, or was that even a thing at the time you were publishing the magazine? I don't. It, it only went six months, and by six months, I mean like a year uh, with like six issues. I think it was six issues. Uh, I don't think it went longer than that. But um, I mean, I. It, it became, it got to the point where I was spending way too much money keeping the magazine going. Um, and I think the last, the last issue, the big difficulty was um, uh, it was it, by the time the print shop got the stuff done and um, shipped down to me emergency express in the Atlanta show, the show was over. Um, so I couldn't even get, you know, couldn't even uh, sell them. So I, I ended up with a whole stack of them left over 
um, that uh, I ended up um, uh, selling or giving away any way I could. And uh, we ended up, um, it just, it, it wasn't something that ever made money, but it was a whole lot of fun doing it. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've talked to some other publishers too. Like we talked to Bill Sias, who was the guy who did Color Computer News, the first Coco magazine ever, and uh, probably the most technically oriented. That would have been one you would have liked. If, you know, I'm sure you've probably seen it back in the day, but it only ran from 81 till uh, September 83, I think it was. But publishing is something that is quite risky. There's a lot of costs yeah. involved, even more so than hardware, I would venture to guess. Uh, Back in those days, yes. Yeah. Nowadays, you have shipping costs and printing costs and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, you can just you know rattle it just off. Upload the, the internet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have a large run, you can send it to print shops that it's all electronic. You can pre-prepare everything so there's no pre-press charges and just print it. Yeah. I mean, now nowadays you upload your PDFs to Amazon and they'll print the book when somebody buys it. Yeah, all on demand. Sure. So there's no you know I have yeah. to print a thousand copies with plates, me type thing. So yeah, it's 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 really crazy how much. Um, the technology has turned multiple worlds on in their head in terms of the costs of doing business. So some of the things that we were, you know, risking money doing back in the old days, it's, it's a no brainer now. Yeah. Anybody can do that. We had a question from Ron here. who's on the panel. Um, wondering if you ever did use the model 100 or one or two, the little portable computers. Yes. Yes, I actually carted around a Model 100 ever since my Purdue days. Um, uh, eventually, it was a 102. I had to replace it. But I would actually, when I was learning C code, and I was learning C code on a dual floppy model, probably still would have been two back, back way back then. Uh, took the C class at Purdue. Um, I had the uh, what little... I could do on OS nine that took forever because it would, it would have to boot up off one floppy and you had to have your code on the other floppy and it would do little steps and write the output file each time. And I learned more how to program in C by stopping it at 68 or nine assembly language, which I knew forwards and backwards by that point and seeing how it translated the C code into assembly language and thus re in reverse learned how the C code actually worked. So I could just take an example out of the KNR, the Kerning and Ritchie book, type it into this OS 9C compiler, compile it down, stopping at assemb 16 or assembly, and get a better understanding of the overheads involved in how you did things. How you, if you wrote it this way versus that way, what the efficiencies were, which helped me greatly in later years uh, doing different jobs. Um, but I would actually. Um, go to the C programming class, sit in the back of the conference, uh, the big, huge, you know, humongous lecture hall, right? I'd sit at the very back of it with my Model 100, and I had put felt underneath each one of the keys so I could type quietly. And I would type in the program exercise that was handed out at the beginning of the class. You know, it was like, write a program that does this. And I'd sit there and just spend, you know, half listening, but mostly because I'd already learned this stuff by that point, because I'd read through KNR, um, typing in my answer, my solution, and then walking across the hall at the end of the, cl at the, end of the class period uh, to the terminal bank, ADM 3A terminals for those who know. Yep. The, we had those at work too on our OS 9 system. And I always carried a screwdriver, always beware a programmer carries a screwdriver, so I could unscrew the serial connector off of the back of that, plug it on my Model 100, upload the code into my account, compile it, fix any few minor last bugs, make sure it passed all the tests and upload it. And I invariably, I was uploading the code with a correct answer because I had the first class in the day before the prof got back to his office. So I ended up getting called into his office because he thought I was cheating. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was just using the one, Model 100 for convenience, you know, a shortcut, you know, I could get a, more things done if I got that out of the way right away. Um, but yeah, I, I loved and played with the Model 100, 102 um, for years, had an expansion box and the disk drive and all, all that stuff. Um, it, it finally, you know, like 15 years later, um, uh, I gave up the ghost and, and wouldn't turn on anymore, uh, regardless of, of what power supply I hooked it to. And, um, but yeah, I love that machine, just the sheer portability of it. Was and battery life that you know they still don't rival to this day. Oh yeah, yeah. But you had to be very careful because you had a very limited amount of time. If you accidentally bump one of the battery cells out, uh, you had to get that back in right away, or you're going to lose your memory. Yeah, 
Yeah, he, he carried enough that I remembered that he had the model 100 of the questions asked, but figured he needed to answer it. So let me yeah. begin. But, but uh, it, so half this stuff, I, I, it's great getting prompted like this because I'm remembering things that I haven't thought about for decades. <laughs> In so it's one of the reasons we do these interviews because you want to capture those memories, you know, for posterity with, yeah. and having people like John on who's, who knows you quite well and knows you from back in the day, we find that the, the kind of a, having a, almost a guest interviewer, cause they know things to ask that we wouldn't even know you, that you did to ask type thing. So, well, and, yeah. and we would always, especially when going to the Atlanta show, we would always have a group of guys that would get together. Some of them, the Chicago would come down to Indianapolis and we'd all, uh, we'd all caravan together down to Atlanta and we had our FRS radios so we could chat or, or CBs. I don't remember which one we were using when. And we even had the, the radios as the walkie talkies as we were doing the show. So we could, we could, you know, call out to each other. Um, it was, I um, don't uh, no, What was the guy that did Sabatha? Alan Huffman? Alan Huffman. Alan would, would come over and caravan with us. He I actually, uh, um, uh, that was one of my, my fun memories of it was, it was, you know, it's it was us group of cocoa nuts just driving down the road together, uh, going to these things. Uh, I even remember one year when at the Atlanta show, we went over and caught Penn and Teller, caught their show, and they had a signature autograph session out in the uh, grassy knoll afterwards. And I had a pen computer with me at the time. I was big into pen computers and actually had them sign, had one of them sign on. So you had, had pen sign computer. your pen. I had had this, <laughs> had them pen digitally sign on the it was not very legible but uh it was they were impressed that of the technology so that was uh yeah I, pen, I was pen's always, a bit of a technology nut himself so that would have been perfect yeah yeah the, i was i was always big on what's the new next uh big technology thing going to come out so i was uh i like to be on the forefront of that and um uh and i enjoyed uh working on uh, some of those new things. So, you know, pen computers was a big thing of mine. I even uh, did some article publications for a pen computer magazine, wrote some code for uh, pen computers. Um, uh, I, you know, did, did all the, a lot of different platforms, uh, worked in different microcontrollers. Um, you know, I've just, anything that I, 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 I got interested in, you know, I would dig in wholeheartedly and, and learn all the way down to the nuts and bolts of how, the hardware worked. And, and, and this, you know, even started back in the, the very first computer I had, the TRS-80 model and level one four, uh, 4K machine. By the time I got back to the States with that computer that I was kind of sort of bored with now because I figured everything out, I'd actually gotten the schematic that, pub, that Tandy, believe it or not, published a full schematic for the computer in a book. You could buy it for another like 15 bucks or something. And it had the schematics of all the different parts and how they were all wired together which was great because now I could experiment on the digital level, rewiring things in the computer to do stuff that, you know, like adding a, a game a joystick or something to, uh, off the interface port. So fun uh, stuff like that, that I, I was learning how to do that on stuff on a hardware level, um, just because it was another challenge. It was another puzzle to go figure out. It was another layer of technology that I could dig through and everything that I learned over the years, I had then later used to be able to accomplish things for jobs or for fun um, later on. I mean, even to the point now I have, um, I have a 3D printer I carry on board my, my rig and I have these um, modules, if I can get one open here, that it's a, um, no, I'm gonna use a knife for this. Um, one of the things that um, I have to do on the RVs is uh, to get the generator to start automatically from low battery condition is I have this printed circuit board. There we go. That's, um, it's just an off the shelf. I originally found it on um, Amazon and I buy them out of China, but there's a eight pin dip. And this is actually uh, a AT tiny 85. Uh, which is uh, one of the AVR line, which is the same platform, the AVR32 platform that Arduino is based on originally. Now they've gone into other things as other types of processors. Well, actually my chip is missing on this board at the moment, but uh, that's where it would be. And this is just a two input, uh, two relay. It allows me to uh, program the relays to 
switch at different times when I, you know, according to my own program. Uh, so one of the tricks is that there's two buttons to start and stop the generator, but the call for I need more power, the batteries are low, is a single relay closure. So you have to switch that into pulsed uh, uh, relays and you want to push the stop button and hold it for 10, 15 seconds to prime the gas pump on the generator so that when you do hold down the start button later, it actually starts up <laughs> uh, instead of coughing and chugging and uh, so, you, so there's a whole program sequence. Um, and so being able to figure out the hardware, you know, that came from when I was playing around with the TRS-80 back in the day and flash micros, I've, I've uh, learned how to do that. And then I got into 3D printing. So I print my own case. I can't really see this, but uh, I'll print my own, own case and the, and the back cover to uh, lock the, um, the board in so it's safe because you have you know, 12 volts on some of these. You don't want it to short to something. And I turn around and sell these and put them into uh, people's rigs. Um, and uh, his, that's uh, kind of fun stuff I'm doing now. <laughs> his interest goes back, and I've seen it. We actually, uh, he's talking about uh, Atlanta Fest. Uh, you remember going to the Stone Martin uh, laser show? Oh, yeah. Well, and uh, Scott had, had got there and talked to the guy and found a lot of information about him, about it. It was actually running a TR-80 with ROM if I recall right, and uh, a bunch of information. So his interest- That's Steve definitely... Neiskowitz or whatever his name was? No, no, this was the actual commercial one at Stone Mountain, Georgia. Oh, okay, okay. They have a big laser show. So a group of us from Atlanta Fest went to the, the laser show and Scott was one of them. And he'd, he'd wandered down to him, got a conversation going up and get a lot of in, interesting information. Yeah, they they yeah. use a uh, a bank of ROMs for the different patterns. They just switch to which ROM they wanted to play out, and the ROM would have all of the steps for where the laser would need to go. And it was some kind of either I don't know if a stepper motor or other kind of actuator, um, but it would play out extremely fast. So they could do complicated, uh, two dimensional, but complicated patterns that were lasered up onto the side of the mountain that you could see from the viewing area around the laser. Uh, a, a complex there. But At the that, time, yeah, really cool. if I remember right, you you mentioned they'd used the ADT, so that means they were using a, a servo system of some sort. Okay, or yeah, uh, one of the, yeah. So the other thing I wanted to bring question that you brought back on this, uh, I know long ago you was considering designing your own CPU. Did you ever do that? Oh, um, I did. Never got to that point. So what happened was I went to Purdue. Um, in order to get a, a computer engineering degree was what I thought I wanted to do. What I came out of Purdue with was the understanding that hardware is hard um, <laughs> and unforgiving. If you make a mistake um, in wiring something, you blow up and you lose a $20 chip or more. And so I learned very quickly, although I love playing with the microcontrollers, um, I didn't like how easy it was to lose time and money uh, by having simple mistakes that it, I didn't even understand how I made the mistake in the first place. Software, no matter how bad the mistake is, it's okay, you have to reset and start over. You, the only thing you're going to lose is time. Yeah, um, that's exactly so, my philosophy. <laughs> yeah, so I, I very quickly pivoted, um, not quite quickly enough, but I, I very quickly pivoted towards maybe interfacing with some hardware, but let the other guys do more of the hardware parts. Although I did get more into hardware as I went through uh, different business, uh, different jobs, um, but concentrate more on uh, just the software development aspect um, where uh, it wasn't as costly if I made a mistake. Of course, the hardware prices also came down. You know, the, yeah. the chips that I put on these boards, it's a dollar microcontroller, 116 megahertz. You know the 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 resolution the the speed of that processor is way overkill for my applications, but I can do all kinds of weird stuff. I mean, this thing is fast enough; it'll do low speed USB on an eight pin chip. It's it's crazy how um, how flexible and powerful uh, some of these flash micros are, and how cheap they are. You know that for less than a dollar, you can have a hid device plugged into a USB interface. 
It's crazy. Yeah. So I, I wanted to co- cover a couple more specific little cocoa bits, and then I wanted to get into kind of stuff you're doing now, like you showed in the yeah. pre-show your your power monitoring system. So I'd like to show that. Yeah. But first of all, from the uh, cocoa side of things, uh, there was some comments from Jeff Tennyson in the uh, chat. He's actually been redoing the C compiler. Uh, he's called it DCC. So it's got some more features added to it. It's better optimized. It runs faster, a bunch of other things. And he's still actively working on it. So if you ever got into getting back into the Cocoa stuff through an emulator or you know a, a Raspberry Pi running Cocoa, whatever, that you definitely would want to check that out. Um, and then two, I want to ask you about the CB radio. So I had heard this story before that you guys, you know, communicated via, via CB between the cars while you were caravanning down. Yep. Did you ever have truckers listening in trying to figure out what the hell you guys were talking about? <laughs> well, and we had our, I don't know that we had uh, that much interfacing with truckers other than certainly we were listening in sometimes to their communications as well, which was helpful, uh, especially if there was um, a ufologist up ahead. Uh, now I have to explain that because we came up with our own, uh, road trip slang, um, and of course, a, uh, well, not a ufologist, it would be a UFO. Uh, anyway, the one of the things that that we 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 referred to um, a ufologist is a speeder, and the reason we called it that is um, that's a person who's looking for UFOs, where the UFOs are the guys that come with the flashy lights and abduct you and take you away. <laughs> um, and we had all the things like, uh, of course, we had our um, NMI rating when we went into uh, McDonald's to, for a, a stop to get a burger. Uh, if there were some pretty girls uh, around, you know, you had your um, uh, various interrupt levels and then, of course, a non-maskable interrupt. Um, we, we had all kinds of, of fun slang like that. But, yeah, we, d- we didn't necessarily... Um, worry too much about <laughs> if anybody else was understanding us because we were just having too much of a blast um, i just wondered we were, did, did any of them ever like ask you like what what are you guys talking about or anything on this oh evening? no 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 i don't think we ever did that we occasionally would have a conversation with somebody else driving the same same direction as us but i don't think very much came of that um but i do remember uh one year um that uh i don't remember who it was i actually had uh somebody was, was writing some code. I had the MM1 in the back seat, powered on an inverter and a pen computer as a screen. And I had a keyboard plugged into it. And the guy actually wrote some code on the way to the fest while traveling, because I had that all, all set up because I wanted to be able to, you know, work when we stopped from the car occasionally, if I needed to do, if I thought to do something. And I figured, well, this is going to make the trip go a whole lot easier for him. So I, I set it all up and, and he enjoyed that. He actually wrote a whole program uh, on the on the way to Atlanta. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of the, the, the story of the Altair basically with Bill Gates and Paul Allen, where they were writing it on paper, mind you, but on the plane flying down. So, yeah. Yeah. We, those were the good old days when you could you could you could play around with the technology like that and do strange things. Nowadays, you, you don't even think about it. You know, you got a. Um, you know, you get a, a, a cell phone or, or, you know, keyboard or whatever, uh, tablet. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's second nature. I mean, we have, we're all connected on the internet, you know, the cell towers everywhere. Um, it's, uh, it's not hard to do the things that we thought were magic back in the day Yeah, that, that yeah. took a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> So but, now to get um, more into modern times, so you decided to do the nomadic lifestyle a few years back and you don't really have a fixed yes. address anymore. Uh, I don't. Uh, in fact, I just sold my house in Indianapolis. Um, it's staying in the family. My son bought it. Uh, but the long story short of that is um, uh, I had always based out of Indianapolis, even when I was working in New York or Twin Falls, Idaho or whatever on whatever job. Uh, you know, wherever in the world. Um, so one of the companies was some, sending me all over the place to fix their stuff. But uh, regardless of where I went, Indianapolis was always home base until 2013. And what I ended up doing was moving to Huntsville, Alabama uh, to take a job with a company that I've been working with their software anyway called Asterix. Uh, the company was called Digium uh, that's now bought by Sangoma. So it's all Sangoma. But um, it is, Asterix is the open source telephony engine. It's a PBX software, basically written in C, runs on Linux, and it talks to anything SIP, anything old TDM hardware that, that you know, talks old school uh, telephony uh, protocols um, and allows you to run a PBX, a PBX a call center or whatever. It's just an engine 
that you program to do whatever. So I was on the Asterix open source team for a while, worked on some of their side projects as well. While I was in Huntsville, uh, which was um, an education, having moved out of Indianapolis, although we'd left the house for our son, um, I had discovered first cigar box guitars. So I found a uh, shop in Huntsville that was selling kits to make your own cigar box guitar. I got into doing that. And then I got into running the shop for a while. So that was another little side fun thing. It was more of a, of a builder technology. You had to learn how to get the things in the right places so it would actually be playable because if you you know you put put things in the wrong place you know you couldn't get the right notes well um ran that shop for about a year and a half and then uh we got the urge my wife and i to figure out how we could travel and see the country without it costing us an arm and a leg and the answer was well let's go make an rv as in let's buy a van and retrofit it in the inside of it ourselves to make an rv and allow us to travel around because i can do this work remotely uh, you know doing software development I don't, I don't need to be in one particular place. And what we ended up doing instead was buying a used one that was pretty much, you know, built by Winnebago. It's a Travado 59G. Ours is built in 14. And um, uh, it's uh, 20, just under 21 foot long. So it's a big, long uh, Ram Promaster uh, one-ton chassis that, that Winnebago puts all the RV stuff in. And then I've just done a gazillion upgrades since then. I've automated things. I've put in lithium batteries, inverter system, a control system. Um, and we travel around and we got to the point where we didn't need the house in Huntsville anymore because we were traveling full time, got rid of that. And we ended up uh, really just getting to see the country, getting to go around and see family and whatnot uh, all over the country and still working. Um, and then eventually I got to the point where I was so good at, at, upgrading and fixing things on these vans. I was doing it for other people on the side. And that turned into, oh, well, you've posted on the Facebook group for this vehicle, how you did this this uh, lithium battery and inverter uh, uh, upgrade. Can you come do one for me? So I got started doing that on the side. And after a year or so of that, um, I ended up becoming my full-time gig. So as of la March of this last year, it's almost a year now, I have really just been traveling the country doing upgrades on people who have these same vans are very similar. And, um, and that's what I do. And I'm uh, having a blast at it. And it's much better for my health. I get to actually work on things and, and uh, um, get some exercise instead of sitting in a chair for, you know, six some hours a day programming and then turn around and drive for another three or four hours a day. Uh, just completely unhealthy. Um, yeah, really, really helps to get out and do things. And especially at this age. And uh, I'm, I'm just really loving getting to get, go around and, and see people. And what I've, what I've, what's happened is I've found a new community. I mean, I really enjoyed the community that we had doing the Cocoa Fests. All the people that were into Cocos, going to the fests, you know, getting together, even just at a Glenside meeting. Um, and getting to have fun and talk about the things that we were interested in and how we were doing modifications to our color computer to upgrade it, to do things. This is the same world. It's just in an RV. It's in a $100,000 vehicle. But then we're putting, you know, expensive modifications, some cases very cheap ones, on top of that to customize it to do what we want. I mean, I have, I've upgraded my, uh, the kitchen for my wife. She's got an induction burner and a fancy copper uh, sink that just went in a, a few months ago. Um, a microwave with uh, uh, a um, convection oven mode and an air fryer mode. Uh, she even got an ice maker for Christmas that I installed. And it's hooked up to the uh, 0.5 micron and UV filtered water from the tank. So the drinking water is extra filtered uh, so we can uh, feel safe traveling around regardless of, you know, what strange source we got water out of. <laughs> um, but we're really enjoying this. And it's a similar type of experimental, getting to have fun, customizing, programming, if you will, your rig to do things the way that you want it to do. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it doesn't require the level of skill necessarily that software development does, although I do use some of my software development skills uh, to do some of these upgrades, but I've turned it into a business and I even uh, sell upgrade kits and parts 
uh, through Amazon, but over uh, really origin on my own website, which interestingly enough is called stg.net. I grabbed that domain way back in uh, in the early days, must have been early 90s. And uh, because I had everything STG and um, I've operated that domain one way or another ever since. And now that's my, my place that people come to uh, to get me to, to either purchase some of my products or to uh, get me to come and do their RV service. Um, so a lot of fun. And I'll show you, um, as you said, uh, sharing the screen, I will show you. Uh, let me go set this up. Also, I just want to give you a personal thanks, too, because your STGNet website actually hosted my game site for quite a few years, too. Oh, so yeah, I, I did uh, web hosting for many years as well. Uh, that was a... Um, uh, that was a little side business that I did also. Let's see if that, uh, you can see the thing with yep. the little blue dots moving. This is actually my live uh, power system. Uh, this is a Victron based system. It's a company that uh, makes the inverters and the solar controllers and everything. So it's showing me my power coming in from my uh, solar panels. It's showing the AC power that's going out. It's showing the DC power that's going out. Um, and how much is coming out of the battery? Um, you know, some of it's being offset by the by the solar, but not enough uh, to to cover all the other other uh, loads right now. Um, and you you've got other other display modes. I can start the generator there. Uh, I don't have any tank hookups yet. I'm working on that. And um, and then I can even have. We just I just got this going the other day. I can even come in here and check on my fridge temperature. So my uh, <laughs> fridge is above uh, uh, 32 Fahrenheit and my freezer is below 32 Fahrenheit, which is the right combination to have. Um, and the cabin is a nice warm 23 at the moment. <laughs> what, what is extra? So, uh, it was just an extra. I bought four of the, the Bluetooth sensors that are compatible with a system. And I haven't decided what to do with that. So that one's just hanging out on the other side of the cabin. So it's about the same temp. But this allows me to um, to change the settings and uh, control how things work. I can plug into a 15 amp outlet and turn the max power from shore uh, limit down on the inverter uh, to uh, 15 or less. And that keeps me from overloading the circuit and popping somebody's breaker um, and still allows me to use more than that power because it'll use some from, from the battery as need be through the inverter uh, to supplement what it's limited on pulling from shore. So it's, it's a nice system. I stopped the generator so I can uh, run the generator when I need to, um, uh, to keep the, uh, uh, the system uh, charged up. If I'm, uh, if I'm, uh, uh, if I'm not getting enough solar or not driving enough uh, to charge batteries, that'll take, uh, uh, take over, do that for me. And then of course I got the uh, STG net website itself with various products. I sell a lot of 3d printed stuff and some other uh, add-on uh, kits and then the service page, which also has a copy of the same information on it, although it's probably not going to display right on my screen and my schedule. And uh, some of the places we've been over the last few years. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> which is just a uh, an example for uh, potential customers. It's like, yes, we will come and visit you wherever you are in the 48. Um, although we, we, we are- That's also almost of, a map of the interstate highway system of the US. Very much so, yeah. I mean, there's some places where we've deviated to go visit certain places, but yes. But that uh, um, this is the, the kind of fun stuff that I've been uh, uh, doing now. Um, still staying in technology, um, uh, still, st still in a kind of a modding community. I actually run a, one of the Facebook groups for uh, mods on the Travado. RV platform, uh, RV rigs. Uh, I run one of the, the groups for that. We have a regular Monday Zoom meeting um, uh, where we talk about uh, different mods. A lot of it ends up being people asking me questions on, because I've, I've dug into uh, all the schematics, just like with the TRS-80. I, I dug into the schematics on how this thing works and gained an understanding to the point that when somebody asks an off-ball, oddball question, it's like, okay, I, I know how that's wired, this is what you should need to do to go fix that. Um, you know, check this fuse in that spot. Uh, it's probably gone if you're missing power there. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, 
and uh, just some of the common failures that that happen, uh, which is normal. There's there's a constant repair. It's just like a house. You know, you got a house on wheels, except that you are traveling down the highway um, as if you're in an earthquake zone continuously, and um, really beaten up on things, and and uh, uh, stuff will fail. And you have to have a good understanding of, of how it all works to, to get things fixed. So do a lot of, a lot of upgrades, a lot of, of novel new uh, designs where I've, uh, you know, come up with uh, my own um, uh, design for, for something to solve a problem using um, uh, 3D printing technology where I've, I've uh, I actually use a, uh, another open source tool called OpenSCAD, S-C-A-D. It is a, C-like syntax language that you use to program literally the dimensions of objects. And you can add and subtract and curve things and extrude things and, and all the different mathematical operations. And then you can end up with a, um, uh, an actual 3D printed object that, uh, let me see if I can pull up one of these here real quick, um, that can be useful for solving problems on a rig. Um, so I've got a, uh, oh yeah, the old shower drain cover. Let me pull that one up. Uh, let's see here. Hit the right buttons. Usually helps. There we go. That's, um, uh, it looks like a disc with holes in it because that's kind of what it is. But if I go back and do, uh, other side of it. What it really is, is it fits into the depression where the shower is on these models, screws into the, you see the, the, uh, the thread fittings there, screws into the fitting on the drain floor and funnels all the water through the holes in the top uh, into the drain. Um, and then the language that is used to program these objects is called SCAD. And it's literally like this C-like language that you define a function and you use these um, stacked mathematical functions to do things. You know, the most simplest would be create a cube, create a cylinder, subtract the, uh, uh, the cylinder from the cube, and now you've got a square with a hole in it. Okay. You know, that, that's a, the, the, the simple concept of, of how you do this. But of course, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing a lot of strange. This section, for example, does a, um, it rotates around uh, 360 degrees, um, putting the pattern of holes as a hexagon. Um, uh, it's a hexagonal pattern it ends up doing. Uh, puts the pattern holes in the top side, but cuts the channels underneath for the water to drain through into the center drain. So this is one of those things. I created this just to solve my own problem that I hated the way that the shower drain worked. And then this is one of the very first things that really got me started in the uh, uh, RV selling things to other uh, people in the community business uh, is I had solved the problem and I wanted to share the solution to other people. So again, still a lot of programming, but now I'm programming objects too. <laughs> yeah, I imagine the 3D printer space is something you really latched onto when that started coming up. I did rather late though. I mean, by the time I got into the, um, the printer space, it had already been, um, uh, it, it, it was fairly, a fairly good reliable machines were available cheaply. Cause I only got into this in the last three or four years. Um, and, uh, and I now carry on my roof in a um, Pelican case so I can get it down when I need to and put it back together. Um, I carry a, uh, a net, a ET three X, a sorry, ET four X, uh, 3d printer, uh, and a bunch of spools of the PLA plastic. Um, and so I can print that. I also print adapters for when I take a control panel out for some of the gear that I've replaced and the new control panel is smaller, but needs to fit in the same hole. I print a little adapter ring that fits into the original hole and the original screws and allows you to put the new control panel in place uh, with less muss and fuss and having to cut holes in the wall and things like that. So it's, um, it's really been handy to be able to, you know, when I'm at a, uh, when I visited somebody with a rig, they want some upgrades to be able to come up with a new design on the fly as I need to get it printed, get it installed. Um, and, you know, as a part of the, of the process. Yeah. And that's something you never could have done before. 
has oh, really yeah. increased. Really but made a difference. Yeah, the 3D printing has really made a big advance in the last few years uh, on what the theory, you know. Uh, okay. When I started, the uh, machines were, you know, about $600 to get something that was semi reliable. Okay. And they have really drastically dropped in price and, and so on. And my start was similar but, uh, with code. I used SketchUp for a while, uh, mm -hmm. but I was using the, the uh, scripting language with it primarily. And so, you know, very similar things <laughs> for people coming from the same area of Indiana. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, you know, totally identify with what he's doing there. And it's a big learning curve. And congratulations there for all you're getting done. <laughs> also, from uh, somebody else that you've met at the fest numerous times, there, Scott, there's a comment in the chat here from James Jones. He says, Is that object oriented programming? Runs and hides. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, over the years, because I do so much stuff that's low level, uh, a lot of times embedded uh, systems, I have found that object oriented isn't always the best case. Interestingly enough, there's a, uh, a uh, um, uh, OS, or not OS 9, sorry, Asterix is actually a good example of this, that um, converting to uh, object oriented, converting an existing working project, let me qualify this, converting an existing working project in C uh, to an object-oriented approach in C++ is usually very, especially if it's a, a very well-working, very complex project, uh, it's usually very difficult uh, to overcome the initial lift to get back to a working project in an object-oriented without too much extra bloat, especially for embedded. I mean, Anytime you're going to upgrade and put new features into the code, it's going to run slower. That's just a, there's no way around that. And one of the things that uh, even the OS 9 project discovered was that though they had started a separate uh, project branch to try to go and build a C++ version of Asterix, um, it eventually failed. Now, they had wonderful ideas. They had really redesigned how it should work inside and a lot of the engineering improvements that that new project had come up with ended up being done later in a version of OS, of Asterix um, but keeping it in C we literally wrote our own primitives for how to do some things in an object oriented way such as uh, reference counting uh, in order to keep track of the lifetime of object of objects even though it was all pure C code. Um, it, and and that, was, that was done so that we could incrementally convert instead of trying to start over uh, from scratch, which was fraught with danger of not being able to get to a completed project. Um, instead of starting over, we actually incrementally over years brought some of those new ideas, those new concepts, better ways of handling things internally and brought them down to the C level uh, code and did them in some object oriented like ways, but never using the object oriented C++ uh, methods themselves. We did it purely in C. And that's not the only project I've been involved in where an attempt to go to C++ and rewrite the code from scratch in a better way ended up failing. So object oriented isn't always the end all be all. Uh, if you start with it and you do it right, it um, you know you can end up with some decent, well maintainable uh, code, but you really do have to watch the overhead. If you're trying to do things in a real time environment, C plus plus may not be your best choice. Uh, sticking with C com commonly is, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. it has nothing to do with Cocos. Uh, oh, we wanted to cover to some do. of your modern stuff too. It doesn't have to just be about Cocos. So yeah, yeah, so yeah the OS. Design. OS 9, by the way, this is a, uh, happens to be a, a soft phone that I um, uh, actually have it uh, connected up uh, to my uh, in-house uh, uh, Wi-Fi internet system. Uh, so if you, know, if you were to call one of my numbers on my website or something, that phone rings and I can just pick it up and answer. Speaking uh, of your asterisk call, um, call center things, there yeah. is one. <laughs> there is one what? Asterisky call center looking phone thing. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a uh, oh well, it's a it's a it's a SIP phone. 
So it talks the session initiation protocol mm -hmm. um, that is the most common uh, internet protocol for voice over internet. I, I just find it interesting. We, I worked in a place that ran call centers and we had a whole bunch of AT&T, Definity, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And we went to Asterisk and VoIP phones. And yeah, here we've yeah. been talking about Asterisk all this time and there's a VoIP phone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, um, it's it's uh it's easier for me to deal with having you know multiple lines and being able to because I, I can go grab a phone number from a voice over IP provider, uh, an ITSP internet telephone service provider, and attach it to this phone and have it live and running you know in just minutes. Um, so I, I have that flexibility that you know if I was to start a new business tomorrow and needed a different phone number to segment it uh, away. You know, I've already got all the, the gear I need on board to do that. I just got to got to configure it into the, into the into the phone. And I don't even need that phone to do it. I can actually do it on a soft phone on the laptop or the uh, cell right. phone. I just find this slightly more convenient uh, to have a central point where I can uh, grab the phone and and uh, uh, talk to people without having to worry about um, making sure the computer or the or the uh, Android phone is in the right state that it's talking to the network correctly. Have you got a picture of your RV so we can understand oh. how big it is? <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah. Let me grab um... seven meters, Nick. <laughs> is that length or height? Length. <laughs> but the intent it, is yeah, it might be the height. I don't know. It's it's actually um, it's twenty foot nine is the official nose to tail in, in the. Um, doesn't your really website have a picture of your of your? Uh, uh, I've got one on my Facebook group, so I was pulling that so, up. Yeah, mid seventies Cadillac. And uh, here we go. Uh, share that page. So um, this is actually a um, uh, a picture of the front of it and a picture of a side angle. Now this is um, long before this was taken. Very shortly, these pictures were taken very shortly after I got the rig. Um, it looks a lot different now on the roof, at least. There's a whole bunch of toolboxes and solar panels, and that little TV antenna sticking up there is gone because, um, you know, I took the TV out. Um, but it's, it's been heavily upgraded. Uh, I carry way too much extra weight of tools and parts. I mean, I'm carrying, you know, um, probably 50 pounds, probably more than that, actually, of a one aught cable that I use to go between the batteries and the um, inverter, and we're, we're talking about uh, cable is thicker than your thumb, uh, all copper. It's uh, really heavy, and I use quite a lot of it um, to, uh, to make the, the high power connections because you're running uh, easily 200 amps or more through one of these cables uh, to power the inverter to be able to run things like the air conditioner or the microwave at the same time. So it's... Um, uh, it's a it's a nice rig. It's about as long as you can get, uh, and still fit in parking spots normally. I can go into a downtown and nine times out of ten find a spot to park in, even in between other cars. It's uh, you know if they're crowding the lines, I'm I'm probably not going to fit in that. But as long as I got a little bit of extra space to squeeze my way in, uh, I can do that. Um, but we we like it that way without extra things sticking out because it's easier to um, to um, to get around and go into a downtown and, and go see, you know, a jazz show or something, um, you know, or blues show. Uh, of course, we haven't been doing that as much uh, late recent years with COVID and whatnot, but we've really been enjoying getting sent all over the country doing these uh, install jobs and uh, upgrades and such and seeing things that we want to see while we're at it. It's like, oh, we're going to be in that vicinity. We'll go, go check, you know, this thing out that shows up in, uh, um what is the the random stuff on the road thing that you have oh, atlas, obscura. atlas obscura very fun if you're traveling uh to look up uh you know strange things that have been around for years that you might want to go check out uh atlas obscura as well as there's a bunch of facebook groups with fun stuff to go see but um and and sometimes it's like oh there's an rv museum we'll go see that <laughs> <laughs> there's one in elkhart indiana by the way if anybody wants to see some really cool old, old and new RVs, um, Elkhart by um, uh, up by 8090, 80, I think it is. Yeah, it's northeast of Indianapolis, isn't it? Way northeast, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, up up uh, sixty nine. Almost to Chicago. Well, Michigan. other direction. Other direction. Uh, yeah, Chicago northeast. would be northwest. Northwest. Yeah. yeah I, I, is, if I remember correctly, there, an ex of mine, her daughter was a competitive baton tour on one of the main baton manufacturing plants is in Elkhart, if I remember correctly. So I think I've actually been there. There's a, a lot of RV manufacturing in Elkhart. Interestingly enough, uh, Winnebago produces the class B's and A's, uh, A being the big bus rig, B being the vans, just stuff in it, but it's still the original van shell. C's are the van nose, but it's got a new box on the back. Um, all the A, B's and C's are pretty much produced um, out of uh, Iowa, out of their facilities, uh, Forest City and surrounding cities in the Iowa, Northern Iowa area. And then um, they have bought a travel trailer operation that operates in Elkhart. So they actually do have some manufacturing uh, just on the travel trailer side um, in Elkhart as well. They own, they own Newmar also for the last couple of years. Yeah. So that's a class A manufacturer. And, and they bought Chris Craft, which does boats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Winnebago has really been growing. I've, I've been very interested to follow along with that. And we do GNR every year, which is Grand National Rally which is held in a big, huge field, you know, think a thousand rigs in a field, um, just south of the plant itself. And they do plant tours and they entertain us for a week. Um, and we have, we have get togethers over different, you know, uh, uh, we have, um, well, it's like, it's like a cocoa fest only, you know, for modding our rigs and they have a, a vendor tent with uh, uh, different stuff you can buy to, to do modifications and things. So it's a, uh, it's a whole community that has built up around, um, you know, the Winnebago platform, as you would. So it's, uh, it's interesting how, how we, I, I've just gone from, you know, different groups, you know, there was a, the, there's, there's all the, the, you know, software and hardware enthusiasts. There's a huge amount of cigar box guitar enthusiasts, especially in the Huntsville and surrounding Alabama area. A lot of, a lot of uh, rock and roll blues music coming out of that area. And, um, and I still go to uh, cigar box guitar fests all over the country as much as I can. Uh, there's one in Alabama, in Huntsville every year. And now in the RV community, we still have this, uh, you know, people getting together to mod their stuff, to, to customize, to make it their own. Um, and, and being inventive and coming up with, you know, new ways to do things, you know, changing the plumbing, changing the electrical, um, even just, uh, you know, changing the arrangement of beds or cabinets or whatever, you know, I took out the, the, uh, shelf drawer system and put in, uh, pull out, uh, drawer units, uh, that gave, use more space for my wife to store our, uh, foodstuffs in. Uh, in well, the, speaking of communities, our, one thing we do have to try to do is get you to the next Cocoa Fest, obviously you're already booked for this one yeah. in May. So Grant Lady, who's actually one of the organizers of the Cocoa Fest is actually on the call. So Grant, do you know roughly when we'll figure out when the next Coco Fest will be? Assuming he's not stepped away from the mic. <laughs> yeah, but as soon as I, we get that information, I'll make sure it gets put on our calendar so we don't. Uh, we so don't how, how much lead time do we need to give you, do you think? Six months. <laughs> My wife there, is saying six months. It's usually spring. It's supposed to be spring. So it's, be, yeah. you know, late April, early May. Yeah, but the, as soon as that information's out, we'll put it on the calendar. We'll lock that down. Uh, make sure we get there uh, there next year. Um, yeah, because we'd but, love to see you just for the cocoa camaraderie, but also I'd just love to see your rig and see all the modifications you've done here. Well, I can give stuff. you a quick tour. <laughs> Ooh, so, cool. There's my wife. Wow. Hello. And uh, I, of course, uh, the um, stained glass cabinet is not original. I put that in. This is luxury. Very much so. And uh, this um, picture here is actually just covering up the old control panel, which I completely <laughs> rebuilt. Um, and uh, we've got the kitchen here with uh, microwave, convection, air fryer. Uh, this is the uh, pull-out drawer cabinet system that stores all of our foodstuffs. It goes all the way down there. Uh, wow. Got the fridge. Nice. And then um, the new sink that I just got put in. That's a little bit of a mess. Excuse me. And... Uh, a uh, induction burner that uh, you can cook on with just electricity. So you got to use a metal pot. It'll get hot. And then um, this guy is the. Um, uh, I like that backsplash there. Yeah, the, the, the brand new uh, ice maker. Oh, wow. Look at that. 
uh, that also dispenses cold water. And of course the front seats uh, swivel on this so they can turn all the way around and you sit around the dinette table and the bench seat here uh, for dinner. And of course we have a uh, bit of a messy bedroom area. This folds down across the space to become a bed. Uh, that's my air conditioner, by the way. And then a uh, bathroom complete with a uh, toilet and sink and shower and everything. And I've done considerable upgrades here. I put in a new uh, light fixture here. And then this is a fancy, and I actually sell these on my website. This here, get that picture statement for you. Um, this here is a thermostatic faucet. So it has a flow control on the one side. And on the other side over here is a temperature control. But what's f really super uh, fancy about this is that you set the temperature and it will adjust the mix between hot and cold to reach that temperature. So it thermostatically changes the mix. If the if the uh, if the temperature is cold, it'll go full hot until it gets hot enough to reach your desired temperature. So that it's always the right temperature when you're taking a shower. And I had put in this extra switch here, which turns on a hot water recirc pump uh, that runs the hot water in a loop past this faucet and back to the hot water tank so that it raises the temperature of the um, uh, uh, temperature of the hot water up in the line so that when you start a shower, you're starting with uh, a hot water right away. So you're not wasting water, which is important when you only have 25 gallons of fresh water to begin with. Of course, it goes down at first because it's starting to circulate but we, if I leave that run for a good you know five ten minutes 15 if it hasn't been on recently um, that will get uh, uh, that, that will get nice and toasty hot and she'll do the same thing for the uh, for the sink here this is a vent fan this is pretty much standard uh, equipment uh, to have one of these uh, fancy automatic vent fans that opens up the top and then uh, spins up and you can blow in or out uh, it's actually got a thermostat automatic thermostat control on it so we'll if you put it in auto mode, when it gets hot in here, it'll turn the fan on automatically, open up and-, and uh, Look, cool. Looks yeah. like a fantastic. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Of course. Uh, no, 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 this isn't a fantastic. This is a Max Air. Max Air, okay. It was originally, for this model, it was a fantastic fan. Um, and I took the fantastic fan out, which doesn't have the auto control, or not the one I uh, had originally. Right. not the one you had. And uh, put in the, the, um, uh, the Max Air fan um which I've, I've really enjoyed um and there's a lot of other mods to this what you don't see hiding under the bench seat is 270 amp hours of uh, one big humongous lithium battery attached to a 3000 inverter uh that powers all the electrical systems so my um uh, you know my, my um microwave is on um, my ac power to charge my laptops and such you know the, run the um induction burner or the ice cube maker, all that's powered on all the time, unless the battery runs down too far and it drops voltage and shuts down automatically. Of course, we don't try to do that. We try to get the, uh, you know, I've got an automatic generator system like I was showing you that circuit before. That actually is part of a mechanism so that if the battery does get run down too far, uh, you know, you're using so much power, you got the air conditioner running in Florida or whatever that, um, and you don't have enough power coming in to keep the battery charged or cover the, the power usage, it'll automatically kick the generator in uh, so that it can get charged back up. And then once it gets closer to the top, it'll shut down again. And so it'll cycle the generator on, on, on and off automatically to keep your power on. Uh, so you're only running the generator as need be, and you're pulling as much power as you can possibly from the generator. So you're maximizing the, the use of the generator runtime. So where would I set up my color computer three? <laughs> <laughs> Probably on the table. <laughs> Probably on the bed. That's one of the, the drawbacks of this kind of lifestyle of living in a rig that's only 20 some foot long is that you have to have a place for everything. You know, so I got clothes and cabinets. I've redone uh, the space under the sink to move plumbing out of the way to get more storage capacity. Um, you know, eventually I'm going to redo some of these drawers because a lot of wasted space around the drawers, the way that Winnebago puts them together. The same thing with this other, these other pullout cabinets. This is a recent upgrade. Uh, Most RV manufacturers are really bad about <laughs> making smart decisions. Extremely bad. Extremely bad about um, not wasting space, especially in a bay rig where it's super critical. And they're also very bad commonly about insulation. Uh, so uh, one of the other 
huge sets of modifications I've done on my own rig because we have to go and visit family in Indianapolis every Christmas for birthday, Christmas, birthday, birthday, all in a row. Um, we have to be able to survive even if there's snow on the ground. And that means I've got water systems in here. So one of the tricks I've got is over here, I can show you is a thermostat control that monitors the temperature of the uh, plumbing that's along the floor going between the water tank and the water pump. And the idea there is that if the water, if the temperature there starts to drop down too low, gets too close to 32, it actually closes the relay to call for the same hot water research system where I switch it on from the uh, bathroom or the, or, the, or the kitchen sink here, which turns on the electric water heater, which turn, turns on the, the research pump. And it, the hot water feed and return lines are on either side of the water tank feed line. So that keeps my water systems from freezing um, even in down to 10 degree temperature, no trouble at all. We had that happen uh, just this last month uh, while we were in Indianapolis, snow on the ground and everything. Um, I did have some trouble, some trouble elsewhere with things not wanting to drain right out of the tanks uh, that I think I've got uh, the right heater pads in the right places that I can turn on. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a constant battle, trying to keep the rig running correctly. And also if you're trying to, as I am, uh, operate it 24 seven, 365, without winterizing and without staying out of 32 below temperatures, is that a um, diesel? It is not. Actually, the fun thing about the Ram ProMaster uh, chassis um, that Winnebago does actually three models. Well, it's the, the Travados are on the ProMaster and the Solus, which is a relatively newer model with a pop top for a bed on the roof. Um, those are both on the Ram ProMaster chassis. They also have a pocket one that's on the ProMaster as well. It's on the short ProMaster. The ProMaster chassis is unlike the other two vans in this class in that it is a front wheel drive gas V6. Um, so it's, it's front wheel drive, the rear wheels are just idle. And the, the deck, the bed of the, um, of the van space, the cargo area, if you will, um, is lower because it doesn't have that drive shaft going to the rear wheels. So unlike the Sprinter or uh, the Ford Transit, which have the, uh, the extra drive shaft and, and brings the cargo deck level up higher, uh, this is easier to get in and out of. Um, and it's easy enough to drive uh, being a front wheel uh, vehicle. And it has just enough power, unless you're trying to tow something, to go up down hills without too much trouble at all. You, you're gonna run higher revs, of course, climbing up the mountain, but that's just the way it is for a, a V6 3.6 uh, uh, liter engine. Um, but it, uh, but it, it, it gets, gets me where we're going just fine. Is that the um, uh, Pentastar? Yeah, Pentastar engine, okay. same as in the Jeep, I think. But you could put the um, Hellcat in there with no trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if yeah, it's it's pretty tight in there. <laughs> it's I'm, still I'm what, 300 horsepower or so? Yeah. Sorry? It's still what, 300 horsepower or so? So he's looking yeah, forward to like eight that. miles per gallon. Yeah. Uh, actually, if I am on a flat highway um, and I am not trying to keep up with, you know, 70, 80 mile an hour traffic, if I'm going 55 on a flat highway, um, I can easily get. 18 to 22 miles per gallon on this engine. There you go. Especially if you're going, if you're keeping it down to 55, you can get 22 miles per gallon on this on this vehicle for short distances anyway, <laughs> a flat highway. And a good um, tailwind. Yeah, well, tailwind helps. Uh, eat, eat, uh, you can get 18 on the highway pretty easily as long as you're not being really lead-footed. Um, what I have been averaging over the lifetime of since the ODB2 monitor device that I put in called an ultra gauge, um, I have been averaging 12, but you have to understand that that 12 includes all the times when I'm sitting parked with the engine idling because I need the charge power, I need the heat from the engine or something. You know, I'm, I'm running the engine uh, for other reasons, for reasons other than I'm wasting gas. Yeah, other That's than it. driving then. Or other than, I'm not getting miles I'm just sitting there burning fuel. Um, so 
even with that into account, and that's not terribly uncommon that I do that on occasion, uh, especially in super hot weather. Um, the uh, uh, even with that, I'm still averaging 12. Uh, normally, if I do a um, if I reset the tripodometer and look at the MPG uh, live over a period of uh, you know 100 miles on the interstate, you know I'm getting 16 easy. Um, if if I'm not you know, in the left lane, trying to, trying to, you know, pass all the trucks. If I'm just cruising along in the right lane with, with, uh, with the slim, slower vehicles. Uh, yeah, it's not too bad. It's, it's all in the speed. The faster you go, the more that, that miles per gallon drops, but it's, it's, it's very good for miles per gallon compared to a lot of other vehicles because it is that, uh, V6 and mostly, mostly because of the transmission, the, uh, distance between fifth and sixth gear is actually very small. Uh, so when it drops into sixth gear, it becomes very efficient on the highway. Cool. I, I don't personally have any more questions. Any more questions from the panel? Or has anybody been monitoring stuff from the uh, the chat there that I may have missed because it scrolls by pretty quick? I just want to mention one thing. I see the power distribution graph and all of that. And yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of people are doing that. But to mention recirculating the hot water so the pipes don't freeze. Okay, now we're getting into a serious RV here. You need to sell oh, these things. <laughs> I do. I actually, I actually do exactly that. If somebody well, wants wants that mod put in their rig, I do that. In fact, I do um, a version of the hot water research pump for a lot of these same G models. I do a hot water research valve. Um, and what it is, is instead of having a separate pump that you have to run power to, you just put a line, you tap it off of uh, the hot side of your shower faucet, and you feed it back in just before the water pump, the regular water pump, and you put a, a shutoff valve in the middle of that. So when you open up the valve, the water pump that you already have circulates the water around through the hot water tank, gets the lines all hot, and when your valve feels hot, you turn it off, and then you can go take a shower, no trouble. Uh, I've, I've installed dozens of that and people really love that mod. Um, uh, the actually doing it with a pump is something that I did specifically on my rig because I've got the older one before the new water heater that does both gas and electric. I've got the old electric only water heater, which to me is an advantage because then with the same single switch, I can both turn on the research pump and turn on the relay that powers the electric water heater. Um, so that I can get my uh, water up to temp easily with that. And that also then allows me to do that temperature controlled uh, mechanism as well. I could do the same thing on, um, on later models with a different water heater, but you would have to make sure that you left your hot water heater mode turned on on the, on the water heater system, whether it was uh, in propane mode or electric mode. But, there yeah, was I, a couple of questions too about your appliances. Are your appliances DC appliances or some of them AC? Because there was some comments about having to yeah. do the inversion and wasting energy from going from, you know, well, DC so the to Victron AC. Inver yeah, the Invictron inverter is really very efficient. Um, really, where you think you would waste a lot of power is is you go from 12 volts to 120, and then you go one of those power bricks and you bring it back down to a 12 USB C to charge a laptop, right? That's where you would see the inefficiency. And even that's not terribly bad. I've done the, the measurements and the math on that. And it's, uh, it's only about a, a three, three to five percent loss at most, worst case, even through both inverter and the, the brick to bring it back down. But um, uh, I do have a lot of AC appliances. I've converted some things like there was originally a gas stove in this rig instead of the induction burner. We prefer the induction burner to the open line flame just for safety purposes. Uh, much much less likely to have an accident right. without that uh, actual flame um, going. And um, I knew from day one, the second I bought this rig, even before that, when I was planning to building my own, I knew I was going to have an inverter because having AC power is really a requirement for somebody running laptops and such like this. Now that said. My phone, my Wi-Fi, my, my voice over IP Wi-Fi phone runs on 12 volts. My router that talks to the two cell carriers and runs the Wi-Fi network runs on 12 volts. Um, 
Ooh, what else? I've also got a 12 volt to directly to USB-C charge for my laptop. So I can do that. I can bypass that as well. I've had to use that on occasion. Um, all of the um, all of the control systems. So the Victron GX controller, the solar controller runs on 12 volts, the um, uh, the other different, you know, logic control systems uh, in the rig, they're all 12 volts. The heater pads for the, um, for the tanks, uh, for the water, for the uh, gray and black tanks, uh, for the output water, um, that is uh, also all running on 12 volts. The only heat element I have that's not running 12 volts, I got two of them actually. One of them is a uh, single line that heats up a short run of uh, tubing going from the shower drain underneath the floor of the rig back up uh, that gets pumped into the gray tank. That I had to add a uh, heater cord and I used, a, it was easier to find an AC 120 volt heater cord than a 12 volt. So I just used something I had available there. And then also the fridge, generally I run that off of a 120 volt heater. So that's my 180 amp, 180 watts of power being used that's keeping the solar from charging the battery is it's actually going in the heat to run the micro, the fridge, to keep the fridge cold. Um, I can I run it. the fridge on propane, but it's it's a finicky gas thing that that uh, I have to go in and clean it out on a regular basis to keep it operating correctly. And right now it's not, <laughs> so it's on AC. I got one last question. <laughs> the uh, In the future, you know, they're going to have electric vehicles. When I, just I, came just out wonder, I just wonder um, where the heck you're going to put the battery. <laughs> 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 well just like on a Tesla, you put the battery as low to the ground as possible so you oh. um, it's it's not a, as much of a, of a problem you can't you can't put it up in the living compartment and you can't put it on the roof you got to put the battery below the floor there's there's really in, right. in terms of, of uh vehicle design for electric vehicles that's really the only option i think pretty much all the main factors wait wait and safety right. well yeah and if you have a tesla battery or two underneath your floor is sort of preheated. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> so you're good to go. Low yeah, and you have lots, lots of current. Wow. Yeah, you've got lots of power to power all your AC appliances uh, through an inverter. So that's no trouble at all. The huge advantage of, and Winnebago just came out with this. I haven't seen it yet, but it was de debuted at the Florida RV show about a month ago. Maybe not even that long, like two or three weeks at most. Um, they came out with an actual plug-in electric drive only RV where all the inside RV electronics run off of the same battery pack. So you can literally drive from an EV plug-in to an EV plug-in and charge yourself back up and keep going down the road. And you're not spending money on propane. You're not spending money on gasoline at all, even for a generator. Now you try to cross the desert with that thing. Good luck. <laughs> right, right. Uh, you're going to want to grab a generator and stick it on the hitch in the tail and cart it along <laughs> with you and fire it up on occasion because you're not going to get enough solar power to charge that i know one guy i mean you, you think you think some of us us you know uh computer people are weird with some of the modifications we do right um nothing to the rv community as a friend of mine from texas he actually now i have 500 no 600 and 80. I have 680 watts of solar on my roof, and I'll usually, you know, get to at least two or 300 watts out of that, even on a not terribly bright day. Out in the, out in the desert, I get like 500 plus. But um, it's a friend of mine that he went so far overboard, he put 1,500 watts of solar on his roof. He's got the same Pro, uh, ProMaster that I do. He's got the, the different layout on the inside, but it's the same roof space. And what he ended up doing was uh, basically stripping everything else off the roof. He put solar panels on the front. He put a solar big solar panel on the back. And he put it in a box raised up. So there's two extra solar panels below the top, uh, the one on the top and the rear. And they slide out. So when he parks <laughs> in the desert, he slides his extra solar panels out, turns on the air conditioners, his batteries don't go down. Wow. He actually got enough watts. Because it takes about 1,200 watts to run the... Uh, the air conditioner he's actually got enough watts to run the air conditioner from the solar but he's That's awesome using more roof real estate than he actually has he's cheating by putting the wings out 
Um, and that's, that's the only way to do it. But if you're parked, why, why worry about it? Yeah, I mean, if you're parked in the desert, nobody cares. Now, you're not going to do that in the middle of the highway. But all right, Close them up before you go into the underpass. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and one of the Make other comments, motorized. too, was saying that, that you, well, I was thinking that you should be a consultant for Winnebago if you aren't already, if all the things you're doing, they should be. There's a little bit of that already happening, yeah. Okay. Sweet, and then sweet. and then another comment was that the Elon Musk should probably be talking to you when they, when you start working on the Mars uh, rover program to get some efficiencies going on there, too. So, um, Well, the, I'm, <laughs> really, the, the cool thing about this, this uh, um, the RV modding community right now is most of what you need hardware-wise, uh, inverters and chargers and, and cabling and batteries and everything, most of what you need is already available. You know, I mean, getting into the EVs where you're coming directly off the same batteries that are running your, your uh, drive system, that's a different animal that we, we haven't gotten to yet. But uh, in terms of just being able to throw lithium batteries and an in, inverter charger and solar and a control system to keep an eye on everything for you and report it all up to the internet, even when you're away from your van, I can literally remote start my generator from the internet. Wow. Um, it, Hope you don't that, get hacked. Yeah, <laughs> right. all of that stuff exists. It's existing technology that's been around for years from well-known companies, usually in the UK, that have have this gear, have it figured out, and have it readily available. Um, and this is literally what I'm doing: is going around and installing this in in people's RVs. Um, have and, you left uh, the continental uh, United States in your rig? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, the batteries actually the the batteries that I use are a brand called Battleborn, uh, and they're actually coming out of an outfit in uh, Nevada, near I think they're near Las Vegas, um, and uh, they are lithium cylindrical cells. And of course, as everything, those all come from China, but they put them together in the case with the control computer that makes it safe, called a BMS, battery management system that um, watches the power in and out of the batteries and make sure that you're not uh, uh, overusing it, either charging or discharging, or the temperature is too cold that it can't charge. And it turns off the power to the battery or the charge power to the battery anytime that there's a problem. Um, so it's a, it's a safety, uh, safety monitoring valve system um, that basically makes it foolproof. You just grab as many of these batteries as you want, figure out a place to mount them in your rig, you know, hook up your one op thick cables uh, across all the batteries, tie that to your inverter, you know, a couple other modifications to get that tight in your rescue 12 volt electrical system, and you're set. Um, it's, it's an easy, it's a relatively easy upgrade, even though it takes me a couple of days uh, to do a full upgrade, a full overhaul uh, on somebody's system, just because there's so many, uh, you know, holes I got to drill and things I got to construct to get things to, to the point where it's, um, uh, installed correctly, wired in correctly with new cabling and, and uh, uh, the batteries are strapped down properly and all that. I think Battleborn I, I, and Dragonfly are closer to Reno, if I remember right. And uh, yep. they're, they're the same form factors like a 12 volt car battery. And they're, they have they're, multiple form factors. Yeah. yeah the, have, ones I've, the ones I've seen look just like a regular 12 volt battery, but they have a lot yeah, more the, power. The standard, standard one is a group 27 size which fits in place of the group 31 AGMs that these vehicles generally come with. And then um, I have a 8D sized uh, single 270 amp hour battery. The regular ones are 100 amp hours each. Um, but I've, I've got a different one because I wanted to try uh, one of their other uh, battery technologies. Um, and I ended up figuring out a way to fit it in that was really convenient for me but only because I'm on the older model, the, the new rigs. There's no way I'd want to try to install this for a customer. It's much easier to uh, just replace the AGM batteries underneath. So have you done any traveling like in Canada, Mexico, South America as well? Have you? Not in Mexico, and we're definitely not planning on going to Central America. That's just too far away. Um, but we do go into Canada. We haven't been recently, uh, but there was a time prior to me doing RV full time. I was actually working for a software development firm uh, that was based out of Canada. I was their only U.S. employee, so um, I was uh, did go up and visit uh, visit with them in Toronto before they moved uh, to the other coast. So um, we we get around. Uh, you know, we'll wait for all the COVID stuff to to yeah. uh, settle down uh, when the restrictions start going away. That it's easier to get in and out of Canada like it used to be. Uh, you know, we'll definitely go visit Canada again. And we have a 
ha we have a plan. We don't know if it's still going to happen uh, to go up to Alaska uh, next uh, next summer. Um, uh, do a whole trip all the way up and back. Uh, probably do it as a caravan with a bunch of other uh, similar rigs like ours. Uh, my wife's been planning that for some time. And we're hoping to get that in next year. Uh, of course, you know, conditions may warrant us uh, delaying that. Who knows? Have you ever been outside of the Americas? Have you gone to any, any other continents, like gotten on the ferry or anything like that? I've, yeah, I personally have been all over the world. But, I mean, with, with your rig, has your rig left? Yeah, no, my rig doesn't leave the U.S. 48 except for Canada so far. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll probably get uh, dipped down into Mexico at some point. Um, but we're um, right now we're just concentrating on the U.S. 48. Yeah, that's um, cool. There's a lot to see. <laughs> yeah, well, and, the, and the, the thing is that it, it doesn't matter where we go. Every place we go, we's like, oh, well, that's cool. That's cool. We don't have the time to visit that now. We need to remember come back, when we come back around this way, we need to go visit that. Yeah, there's always something interesting, more more things interesting to do in a town, uh, especially larger cities, than we have the time to right now. And so we're, we're we're not going to run. We're not coming off the road anytime soon because we've run out of things to go see. That's not going to happen. <laughs> right. Right. That said, I am looking at uh, getting some property, probably in Tennessee, and setting up a shop to do some of this type of work in where I can use some larger equipment like a four by eight CNC, uh, more 3D printers, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, do some things that I can't do on the road uh, just for the sheer equipment size. Uh, you know, one of the things when I do these um, installs, I always have the customer buy all the big, heavy, expensive stuff and have it ready for me. And I come in with cables and hook it in because um, I just can't carry that gear. Right. right. I don't have the space. Um, but it's easy, it'd be easier for me to actually sell the gear out of my shop as well. Um, but I don't know how much of that we're going to do between, um, you know, there's certain things, certain types of upgrades I would want to do there. Um, and uh, so I don't know how much of that, that home base operation uh, will use versus continuing to, to travel around uh, the majority of the time. But yeah, we're having a, we're having a blast. We're enjoying That's awesome. the freedom of being able to go, go around the country and see things. Um, and, and visit stuff that we wouldn't have had the right. opportunity to time to. And I'll I tell you the, the one biggest thing that I need to mention about having an RV set up like this, where you can live out of it and you can drive it anywhere and you park it at any parking spot is sh surely the, um, the ability to spend time with family when it really matters. We've had a number of incidents, even when we first bought the rig where a family member was in the hospital or there was funeral or whatever. And we were able, because I was already set up as remote working, we were able to go and spend that time with family, you know, park in that hospital parking lot for a couple of weeks um, while my wife visited her dad in the hospital and I could keep working in the rig, uh, bring her food. That, that kind of thing, this flexibility of having yeah. your mobile house yeah. is unbelievably useful when it came down to being able to be there for family because we're mobile, we were able to do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. That more than anything, I think, has um, really impressed on me how lucky we are to be doing this right now and how much, you know, I'm, there's no way I could give this up. You know, I, I, I right, right. Well, in a way, you're, you're like that guy on vacation that pulls up into the front of their house and wants uh, to put a, a sewage thing in. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that's Randy. Qu that's Randy Quaid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cousin um, Eddie. Yeah, but uh, in a way, you you're already kind of uh, pandemic prepped. You're almost like doomsday prepped as it is right now. Maybe get some air filtration stuff going on there and maybe some, <laughs> some reinforcements against uh, hostile mobs and stuff. But you're, you're pretty much able to oh, yeah. self-sustaining survival um, yeah, out when there. The, right. When the pandemic hit, I was already remote working and yeah. literally yeah. nothing changed. We just didn't get to go <laughs> visit things like we were doing. Right, before. right. No, it is just. Uh, it, restaurants were closed. All of the. Well, so. So. I, I, you, you're definitely, you're not slumming it. You have your, you get really nice interiors and I'm sure your mattress is comfortable too, but every now and then, do you just want to get a hotel and sleep on a different bed than the one you're always on? I mean, there's gotta be 
where you want, you want to change a pace? Are you just so content in your environment that you don't need anything else? I'm pretty content, but my wife does enjoy the opportunity and we have done a, a, um, a hotel stay or you yeah, know, like a, a Airbnb or something, or something like that where she can sit in the tub. We don't okay. Have- <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or pick a hotel with a pool or something just to get a yeah, bit of oh, swimming. Oh yeah. Hot tub in a pool, hot tub in the pool. Absolute draw. Um, and, uh, and, and there's some RV parks where we've had the hot tub opportunity. Right? Okay. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, they don't do that anymore right now, but, um, yeah, hot, hot tub, uh, uh, at a hotel or even just having a tub at all to go soak in. Yeah. Uh, that is a plus for sure. Um, but in terms of, of, you know, being functional, you know, I don't have to go into the truck stop and take a truck, truck stop shower. I've got all that on board. I have right. to watch my water usage, right. uh, which is the reasons I put in that hot water circulation loop to begin right. with, so I could keep my, uh, my water uh, wasting down to the very minimum, you know, get it all hot and then, you know, trickle it on and, and uh, I can get started very soon. And I'm only using, you know, a few gallons for a shower. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a bit of a Navy shower and then rinsing down, but it's um, by using, by having the right gear, by having the right mods put in yeah, like a static faucet and a hot water research. And um, by using some techniques, I'm able to extend the amount of time I'm on the road before I got to worry about where am I going to go get my tanks dumped and, and bring on uh, fresh water again. Right. But that's not terribly hard to find usually um, in the Northern Midwest, especially uh, in uh, wintertime, it can be hard to find water because you'll find a dump at like a flying J or something where you, know, you can pay your, your three, five, seven dollars, ten dollars, whatever, and get a dump. Uh, so you can empty your tanks, but then they'll have shut off the water because it's too cold. You know, the freeze is coming. Mm. Um, so sometimes you have, sometimes I have trouble getting water, but because of this job where I'm usually visiting somebody's house they get the rig parked in the driveway we come and park next to them and do do the work for a few days i'm i'm usually able to borrow water from them without too much trouble so i come right. in with the tanks um i make sure i empty my tanks on my way to the next job but sometimes if i can't find water i can you know run a hose from the uh from the customer's house and there's no trouble All right well here how about this how about you use your 3d printer and you print up some moisture evaporators like they have on tatooine you'd be Boom, you're set. <laughs> Believe it or not, this exists. There's a 12 volt appliance. There's literally, there's a 12 volt appliance you put on your roof and place on one of these holes like a vent. Uh, and it, or you just mount it on the roof because it actually require a hole. And you give it 12 volts and it runs an air conditioner cycle and collects the water and it drains into a tank. Wow. It is is it a purchasable item? I've looked into this because uh, one of the thoughts is if I find the right property out in the middle of nowhere, uh, and I don't have uh, uh, I don't have city water, and maybe a well is a problem too. Well, I can at least you know get one of these um, uh, store one of these um, shipping containers, put this guy on the roof, put a tank inside, put all my lithium batteries and solar up, and I'm set. I've got enough power to keep that system running. Um, and then I've got water and all I need to do is dig a, a septic and you can put a septic anywhere pretty much. Hmm. So yeah, I've thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> discovered that yes, yes, this is a purchasable, somewhat expensive, but purchasable item. At this, at this well. point, you're just about well, ready to take your RV onto the moon and set it up as a moon base. Cause you're yeah, right? self-sufficient. So. <laughs> I, and, and that's the way I approach it is that I want to be as self-sufficient as possible. That's amazing. I have, you know, I have my my main, you know, Apple laptop. I've got backup computers. Um, I've got, you know, I've got a, a certain layer of backup gear in case this fails. I've got a backup way of doing that. Um, you know, I've got redundancies in the system. I can charge from the generator. I can charge from just driving the, or just running the chassis engine. Um, I even had one instance, and this is is. Um, uh, I, I had put in that new battery, the new large battery, and I hadn't adjusted the warning point where it would start beeping to tell me, hey, you're running low. And I didn't have the auto generator start system hooked up either. And we had parked at a um, Cabela's for the night. Some of the Cabela's used to have dumps, but they've got, they're getting rid of them, which is unfortunate. But we'd parked at a Cabela's 
and um, I went to go into my shower and got the hot water research turned on and everything got started. And a little while later, the lights dim and the pump stops running and everything just goes dead. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Apparently, I was low on power and didn't realize it. And I didn't have an alarm going. So I thought, okay, no problem. I'll go start the chassis engine. Turns out my isolation cylinder had failed closed. So it had drugged down the chassis battery to dead as well. So now my chassis battery is dead. My house battery is dead. <laughs> I've got no way to start the chassis. I've got no way to start the engine. I've got no power to start the generator. I've got nothing. i got no way to get going. I am dead in the water. I can't drive away. And after I had gone through my initial panic, I realized that, well, you know, actually all I got to do is um, wait for the sun to come out. I can start the generator. You know, I got the, the isolation solenoid disconnected manually and then I uh, got the batteries charged up enough, lithium battery charged up enough to get enough power to start the generator. And with the generator going, I closed the isolation again to get the bootstrap the um, chassis. So I started the chassis basically off the house side. Um, and then I had both charging going on at the same time and, and I got caught back up. But um, yeah, yeah. Some, there's a comment from, uh, from Alice that it sounds like the, that, the, the book The Martian by Andy Weir, right? Where he had to do all this creative <laughs> stuff to get his uh, hab unit going and everything. <laughs> the, 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 the key to surviving uh, is redundancy. Yes. And being flexible. And being flexible. <laughs> In yeah, today's like, news, someone's been able to survive off of potatoes for a year and a half, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> somebody stole all the cordless drills in Bo Dunk, New Hampshire. Hey, yeah, it's actually <laughs> um, an option. I could I could have jump started my lithium system with the with the six uh, cordless battery drills that I have in the tail. Hey Scott, uh, Kevin Holloway wanted to know what's the uh, what's the lifetime lifespan of those uh, Battleborn batteries. They are rated, they're actually guaranteed for uh, 10 years. Um, mm. They're rated for something like 5,000 full cycles. So we're talking nice. you know, 100% charge to zero mm. and back to 100. Nice. 5,000 yeah. times. Now they've, they've come down slightly on those numbers. I think they're starting to worry that the um, that uh, it's not going to work quite as well as they want. And a large, large part of it is you got to have the right charge system to make sure that you're topping the battery off properly. Yeah. Um, but it is um, uh, the the warrant the ten year warranty alone on the Battleborn batteries and the fact that they are so good in support um, is worth every penny that you. I mean, it, it, if if I had the option of paying, you know, six hundred dollars for some I don't know where it really came from out of China uh, lithium battery LIFEPO four type the same same chemistry battery. Um, if, if, if I was going to pay only $600 for that, which is about well, as low as I've seen them now, um, I would really have to second guess whether or not that would, uh, uh, would be a, a, the right choice as opposed to just going ahead and getting the Battleborn at eight or $900 because mm -hmm. the Battleborn is guaranteed. I, I'm, 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 I'm not going, I know that even if I do end up with a problem with the battery, they're going to swap me out. They're going to fix it up for me. And I've already mm -hmm. been through a cycle on that where I thought I had a problem with the battery and sent one in and uh, they refurbed it and sent it back. So probably um, the BMS, but yeah. Well, in my case, um, I had a misunderstanding of the charge system. And what had happened is I was sitting in Florida. It was hot. And the, um, uh, I was running the, let's see, how is this? Oh, no, I was, I, I, I had the, um, the auto start for the generators all set up and running. So I was leaving the air conditioner run because it was just too hot not to. So the air conditioner runs the battery down and then the generator charges it back up. Now, the problem is that um, although originally I'd had uh, three or four batteries at different points, depending upon different incarnations of which batteries mounted where I had done in my rig. At this point, I had disconnected one of the batteries. So the entire 120 amps that the Victron 3000 charger puts out was going into two batteries. The problem is that the batteries are only supposed to be charged at 50 amps. So they were literally going into heat overload mm -hmm. and the BMS was shutting down charge. Well, when the BMS shuts down the charge, what happens is that um, the battery monitor sees that as, oh, you're not taking a charge. 
you must be full. So it switches the charge level to 100%, thinking that it's finished a charge cycle because the voltage has come up, the current gone down, therefore you're not charging anymore, you're done, you're full. So 100%, that shuts down the generator, <laughs> air conditioner is still running, the battery, set, the battery monitor says the battery is 100% and it's probably only 30 so the battery monitor gets down to 70 and the batteries are now empty mm -hmm. and my inverter starts beeping and I lose power. And I'm like, how can I be losing power at 70% charge? So I thought I had burned out the battery. I had, I had somehow overloaded it. I had, I had done something, I'd worn it out. I had, cause I had had those batteries for years uh, prior to that. Uh, they were about three years, two or three years, two and a half, three years old by that point. And I had been using them continuously and really heavily and they were still, you know, still in the same spot. So I thought for sure, okay, I've broken, the, uh, I've done something. I'm gonna have to send them in and get them refurbed. So I sent them in and lo and find out that, uh, oh no, I just overloaded them. I overloaded them on the charge side and they'd shut down. And uh, once I figured that out and um, adjusted the charge system and then later switched out and put uh, the extra battery capacity in, I went up to four batteries and then later switched out uh, all four for the 1D, uh, 8D battery. Um, then I haven't had any problem since then with that at all. And I learned a valuable lesson, which I've then used in my uh, installing systems for customers, which is don't ever put less than three batteries in conjunction with a Victron 3000 inverter because it'll overload them, it'll overcharge them. And you should always read the instructions from the battery manufacturer and the inverter well, manufacturer. And I, I tell customers this all the time. I read the well, instructions, but what, yeah. what happened was I interpreted the don't, they don't charge over 50 amps as the BMS prevents them from charging over 50 amps, not don't charge them over 50 <laughs> amps, <and just laughs> shut down. <laughs> so you know, once I my, my got that clarification with support, then I was like, yeah. okay, I need to tweak yeah. this. I adjusted my instruction sets so, and changed my policy. <laughs> my appliance and light controller on my Coco can run all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing Look is, up, uh, 100 amp hour 12 volt battery will run a cocoa for probably about five days i think huh? right wow. yeah. but but it's look up really Ly lion or lipo overloads even better on youtube to see what can happen if you don't charge them right oh yeah it's fun times it's, yeah uh, you don't want to mess with lithium batteries without a a charge controller without a, a, a bms system especially if you bolted them under the floor of your vehicle in a solid plane all the way from the front to the back <laughs> which is why although a friend of mine has built his own batteries i'm just not doing that <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to depend on the, the battle born because i know no matter how stupid i get the battery is going to save me from blowing up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, this is, um, and, and the, the, the great thing is a lot of all the stuff that I've learned over the years, going all the way back to Terra Sadies and color computers, especially, has come into use now that I've, I've, I've used stuff I've learned doing strange things back then to do even more strange things now. Um, and and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm still learning, you know, I, I've had to learn this high power high current rather um, power systems um, where in order to stay at 12 volts for compatibility with the uh, 12 volt uh, systems, it's easier to keep the batteries um, at a 12 volt. There's a competing, um, there's actually a, a lithium already pre-installed by Winnebago. There's a lithium option uh, for Travados uh, that you can buy that comes from an outfit called Volta. And they use similar lithium technology, but they arrange it in a 48 volt battery which makes a certain amount of sense. You don't have to have as thick of cables and the inverter is more efficient, but that means they have to have a down converter from 48 down to 12 to run all the 12 volt stuff, um, which isn't necessarily a problem, um, but it does mean that they don't have compatibility with the original alternator. So you can't charge off the original OEM alternator in the chassis engine. What they do do though, in order to not have to have the uh, noisy Cummins own generator, is AC generator, is that they put in a second alternator on the chassis engine that will charge the 48 volt batteries and will do so very fast. So one of the advantages of a Volta based system from Winnebago as it comes, if you pay the extra money for that, which is like an extra 30 grand, wow. uh, is that you just charge it by running the chassis engine. Um, so every time you're driving, you're charging your, your, your house batteries and you've got 
twice the capacity of one of my four battery systems in terms of runtime on the air conditioner and everything. So um, not that you can't install eight Battleborns and have basically the same amount of power. Um, it's just hard to find a place to put them all. <laughs> Yeah, been I've been seeing a lot of chatter on the uh, auto side. They're really thinking about going to 48 volt across the board. So that seems to be a trend a, just because of the efficiencies, yeah, which would make things like this idea. easier. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, any anytime you're going, I mean, we do the same thing with uh, solar panels. I've got, 12, uh, instead of the usual 12 volt solar panels, I have 24 volt solar panels uh, so that I can get more power, less loss through thinner cables, bringing that down uh, through the roof into the charge controller and then finally into the batteries. Um, it's, it's more of anytime you can run higher voltage, uh, you want to because it's more efficient on power. Even USB-C does the same thing. Um, in order not to burn out the cable as fast, uh, your computer asks the charge device, uh, okay, I see that you're feeding me five volts. Can you do nine volts? Can you do 12 volts? Uh, can you do this much watts? Uh, can you bump up the voltage so that the same amount of current and thus resistance and thus lack of burning out the cable is being used uh, through the cable, but the higher voltage means that I'm getting more power through it. So you're increasing the watts without changing the amps of the resistance. Um, so that's a, that's a common technique is that higher voltage means more efficiency and obviously AC power systems do the exact same thing, you know, a gazillion volts on the super high tension power lines. And you finally step it down to 480 and then 220 to come in houses. Now, all you need is a uh, number plate or something on the back of the RV that says, we break for no one. Like in the movie Spaceballs. Yeah, I should do that. <laughs> <laughs> I should do that. The back of my RV right now has um, stickers on the on the glass back windows for all the places I've been. Of course, um, because it's too hard to see out the back, it's too far of a distance, and I just leave the, the blackout curtain things up instead. I have a camera mounted on the back that, and a, um, a, a dash cam device that is actually a display. It looks like a rear view mirror, but when it powers on, uh, it turns into an LCD display that shows me the view out the back camera. All right. So very handy when driving that I have uh, I have a good good view uh, of the traffic coming up behind me. <laughs> uh, interesting story. Back in the day, we had a cocoa guy named Will who drove the Cocoa Fest every year in his Winnebago, and he had hooked up a camera on the back of it, and then he had reversed the polarity to the yokes in his TV portable TV that he had on the dash. So that it was a true mirror representation ah. of the view out of the back of his Winnebago. Yeah. And so, yeah, God bless you. Well, he was like <laughs> 84 back in 95. So anyway, I actually understood the, the idea of switching the, the polarity on the yoke because um, uh, my, my, my dad worked on the RCA television set. So I actually had some, um, some knowledge of that playing around with stuff with him as well. That was <laughs> One of the fun tricks, if you wanted to use a big lens and turn it into a projector, is you'd swap the, um, the X yoke um, so that the picture was backwards. So it would project onto the, or maybe it was both of them. Um, so it would project onto the screen in the correct orientation. So yeah, it all came together for that one second there. <laughs> Here's a cocoa guy in an RV talking <laughs> about another cocoa guy in an RV. <laughs> yeah, there should be more of us. <laughs> You well, you, you have to sell us all on it when you come out to the Cocoa Fest next year. That's a, yeah, you. yeah, we'll, um, uh, we'll definitely give you a tour of the rig, and um, there'll probably be some new stuff by then, too. <laughs> yeah, I will get you the dates as soon as they announce them. I think they usually try to book yeah. the hotel not too long after the, the current fest, so we should know well in advance of six months. Cool. Um, when it is, so we'll get that yeah, we'll going. Look forward to that. Yeah, I, I don't really... want to take up any more of your time. we still got the whole rest of the show. You're welcome to hang around and, and comment right. on stuff, but... Uh, you know, some other people do have some outs here, so I don't want to keep them going too. Long. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. if you let me talk, I'll talk all day. I, I have my own problem with that on my own show. Yeah, no, that's great though. <laughs> it's it's definitely been great. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to. I mean, I could sit here and listen to this all day, but just a couple other thoughts came to mind too. If all the traveling that you're doing and talking about seeing all these places and and doing all these installs, 
this would be great content if you don't already have a YouTube channel on your just touring the world and doing these projects, because that could be another revenue stream too. people just, you know, monetizing your, what you're doing on YouTube. Yeah, I actually have a uh, an older blog that I did called the B dot life, T H E B dot L A I F E L I F E. Um, it's got uh, it's just a, um, a blogger, Google blogger, uh, but it's got a bunch of YouTube videos on it of some of the mods that I've done. But I haven't done anything, added anything to it in the last few years. I'm I'm uh, been working on a new uh, GoLang web server. Um, back to you know doing my own self hosting. Uh, working on a new going uh, server, and I'm going to end up uh, uh, moving all my old blogger stuff and that blog into the uh, into the my own hosted and all my videos, um, just because I'm trying to get off the dependency of having everything on YouTube. Yeah, and Google. Yeah. Trying to get the dependency off of Google, and um, uh, eventually I will start putting some new videos up there. And I've been really been asked by a lot of people in the community to come up with some additional videos for some of the newer mods that I've been doing uh, for people, because uh, there's a lot of people that do that want to do them themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have absolutely no problem with creating the video and doing that. I just need to remember the, the next time I'm not uh, hard pressed to get a mod done on a particular, a particular job done on a particular time frame, uh, to go ahead and break out the camera and talk to the camera <laughs> while, while I'm while I'm doing it, which is uh, my favorite way of uh, of recording those. Is I just set up the camera on a tripod and and it's like I'm doing this and I'm doing that and yeah. this is what this is and explain it while I'm going, and it ends up being usually a pretty good, pretty decent video. And some of the stuff has really helped people uh, with being able to fix certain things on their rig uh, or put in certain mods uh, on their own. I need to get some more of those going. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I, I have. I have no end of things to keep me busy. Doing right. That. No, that's cool. That's you're, you're in a great position. In a, yeah. you're in I'm great, loving it. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Far out, far out. All right. So uh, do we want to go ahead and take a commercial break and then transition into um, the game on results and whatnot? Yeah, one, one thing I will mention, I, Rick Adams has a hard out too, and we want to okay. talk about his so, little new game. So we'll do that at the start of the game. Or do, uh, do, do we need to do that before we do a commercial break? Uh, how much time do you get, uh, Rick? Uh, I, I need to be out of here at three thirty. What time is it for you now? It's three o'clock. Twenty okay. minutes. So maybe we do Rick and then we do a break. Sure. Yeah, that'd, that'd be awesome. Okay, take it away, Rick. You have a, a bit of a new well, game based on a super popular one to announce here. And uh, let's get Mark well, to spotlight. Yeah. Let's get Mark to spotlight him too. Okay, there we there go. You. Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, so. About four days ago, uh, I posted uh, on the Discord, I posted just for fun, uh, a screenshot of somebody playing Wordle, and they had like almost figured out what the word was, and they had figured out the first three letters were T-A-N, and the last letter was Y. And I said, so the answer's got to be Tandy, right? And uh, Scott Went said, uh, I wonder how long it's going to be before somebody does a Wordle clone for the color computer. And I said, hey, that's not a bad <laughs> idea. So I, so I made one. Um, now, what you have on the screen here is my development system. Uh, so on the bottom there is, uh, we're looking at uh, my Cocoa Pie. And uh, at the top, we're looking at my Cocoa 3. So I'm going to look at the... Uh, uh, the source for Coco LE, Coco, how, how would we pronounce that? Coco, you know, you could call it Rickle, I suppose. Uh, Pulls off the tongue better. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. It's like Coco, uh, that, that's kind of awkward. Um, so it's written in BASIC, except that uh, because BASIC drives me mad uh, with all the line numbers and editing things on the color computer, I want to edit it on my uh, uh, Cocoa Pie system. So I have, you know, like a real full screen editor. Uh, and then I have a preprocessor. So I write it in this sort of uh, funny looking basic that uh, doesn't have any line numbers or has very few. Uh, and then I pipe that through the preprocessor that I wrote and that converts it over into normal basic and then mounts it 
on a drive on a, a, a DSK file on my Cocoa Pie, uh, which is then mounted via, I guess, on my Cocoa SDC via a drive wire cable. So, uh, so if I were to type make, it's got all the pro, uh, it's got a script for how to uh, build the game. And so I do that. And you can see at the bottom there uh, is uh, the, the basic output from the, from the preprocessor. Uh, in, and that looks like normal basic that you would see on a color computer. So that gets mounted over on my Coco 3, uh, which right now is, I've got my Coco SDC set up to automatically run like sort of a kiosk program that's also written in, in basic uh, with all the things that I might want to do. So I'm going to type K for the type, run the Coco LE game. And we'll make, we'll make a try here. Because people are watching me, I'm, I'm going to be doing really terribly. So it's got an E and a U in it. That's nice. Uh, I'm just typing in some random. So, so the... We're trying to guess a five character word, and we know that it has an E and a U and an R in it. And we know that the R is the second letter. Um, so this is like mastermind with uh, letters. Then, exactly. Right? Instead of colors? Yes. Now, the funny thing is that Wordle is this, uh, it's a very, it's very much like mastermind. It's guessing a five character word, uh, and this is how you do it. And you have six guesses, and you have to guess actual words, uh, and then it gives you clues as to how close you are. And it's, it's insanely popular. The really ironic thing is that I have actually never played the Wordle game itself, even once. Um, I've just played this, and the only reason that I know how the game works is just I've you know, run across people discussing it. So... Uh, and, and didn't the New York Times or somebody just buy Wordle for millions of dollars? Oh, that was... That was hilarious, yes. Uh, it was started by this guy with the last name of Wardle, which is why it's called Wordle. And he came up with this really very clever game and he put it for free on the web and it was very clever and uh, it just took off wild, like wildfire and he assured everybody it will always be free. Well, the New York Times came calling and said, and, and basically they've been coy about how much they paid for it but they said it was in the, in the low seven figures. Well, it doesn't take a rock, rocket scientist to figure out what that means. So he got more than a million dollars for this thing. And you, the New York Times assured us all that it will remain free for now. <laughs> Capitalism ho. <laughs> so uh, let's see. So what, what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally going to guess, you know, okay, well, we know that R is the second letter and E is the last letter. Anybody have any guesses for me? And it's got, uh, the E is taken care of, so we have an R. So there's a U somewhere. Uh, U. Uh, and we know that it doesn't have an A, D, I, B, A, D. Uh, G L A D in it. That's the gray ones. It's like no, those those letters are not in the word anywhere. So, okay, so anyway. green is the right letter in the right spot. Yellow is a right letter but in the wrong spot, and gray means right. that letter shouldn't be there at all. This reminds right. me very much of a lot of Nick Morenti's games. Yes. Uh, so uh, let's see. I'm just typing in random. Try words. crude. Crude? C-R-U-D-E. Yeah. Close. Ooh, close. Cruel. Uh, Cruel. Cruel with an L. Uh, well, the C's in the wrong place. Oh, so it's got to be... Oh, so C's in the wrong of, place. You're right. Yeah. So so the C is just before the E. So let's Is see. that personal names like Bruce? I don't know. I don't oh, no, think so. B's not in there. Never mind. Yeah. Uh, How about truce? Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> All right. See, see how much fun that is. Anyway, uh, so this is done in. Uh, let's go into it, it, some interesting technical uh, things about it. There's uh, somebody. I came up with my own word list. It had about 700 words in it. Uh, and that was the list that I used for coming up. Uh, I would come up with a random word out of the list and that would be the word that you were guessing. And then uh, I would also use that to verify the words. Uh, so 700 words is really not enough. You can come up with lots of words that are, you know, that it would say were not valid, uh, but really were. And so somebody pointed out to me, they said, oh, by the way, uh, the real Wordle game uses two word lists. One for uh, uh, which words you're going to guess that get randomly chosen from, uh, and one that is the one to verify words against. And oh, by the way, here are the two lists that you know we already stole from, from, from Wordle. So I took a look at those two lists, and then I started finding funny things ab uh, about them. Uh, the, the one that you validate, validate words with looked like it was way too permissive. It looked like they had taken like an entire dictionary file and chopped off the first six letters because there was a lot of, of uh, let's take a look at, uh, this is that list. So it's like A-A-H-E-D. A-A-L-I-I. -I. Does that look like any English word that you ever heard of? Uh, ARG, I've heard of that one. A-A-R-T-I. A-B-A-C-A. -A -A. That looks like it's abracadabra, but it's the first five characters. So the first, uh, so the, the, the word list that you uh, guess against, uh, uh, or rather that you ver verify words with, uh, really looks like it's just a big uh, dictionary file with it, and it's just they chopped off every, everything but the first five letters. So it's really permissive, uh, which isn't so bad. But then I ran across situations where uh, there would be a word in the, the word list that you guessed words from that wasn't in the, the list that you validated against. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's not kosher. I mean, how can you win then? And then it finally, I thought it through I, and, and realized Oh, they've saved space by, if you validate words, you validate it against both lists. Um, so, and then I, I looked and I checked and there was about 600 words that were in both lists. So I removed the duplicate, alert, uh, the duplicate words. And so now it should work okay. Uh, I mean, it worked okay before, but, but this is a little, you know, it saves on space, which you know, I'm writing these to a, uh, uh, a, a an 80 track disc, uh, a, a DSK file that's an 80 track disc. Uh, if you actually ran this with an actual disc, it probably, I don't know, it'd probably grind quite a bit. I am doing a binary search. Uh, so, and that was fun to do in basic. Uh, you know, I'm not that great at basic. Uh, I'm okay. Uh, Basic for me, doing things in basic right now is the, the only reason I'm really doing that is for the nostalgia value. Uh, because it was the first language I ever learned back way back, you know, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. And uh, uh, it was the first programming class that I took. And I remember being given an assignment, you know, uh, simulate the rolling of a six sided die. And I did it by drawing the dice in uh, 3D ASCII graphics, which got me the notation on my paper when I, when I got it handed back from my instructor. Uh, he had written, unbelievable. <laughs> so let's see. So here's the words that you guess from, and that looks a lot more reasonable. And it's all sorted, of course, uh, because we need to do a binary search. And there's our binary search right there. So all of this is on GitHub. So anybody can go and take a look at that. 
Yeah, people. And do you have the that. disc image itself, or people just want to play the game versus you know getting the source uh, in there, or do you just have the source in your game? Yes. Nope. I, I have uh, in the GitHub. Uh, let's see. The GitHub is uh, GitHub.com slash unpronounceable word, uh, and then uh, Coco L E, and then look in. Uh, redis, re, redis, ah, repute, impute, uh, and I think it's coco le dot dsk. I think that's it. So, so, are you planning on putting it in the archive as well eventually? Or, uh, or I don't have any. I don't have any objection to that. I hadn't thought of it, but no, I, I have no. I, I have no problems if they want to do that. Because it's kind of the first stop you know, shop for people to look for, for Cocoa software as it gets released. So, cause that's sure. kind of like the repository. Yeah. So whoever, you know, does that, I, you know, yeah, I don't have any problems with that. Uh, and this is, this is, an, uh, this, when I was working on this, uh, I kind of had, it was kind of interesting to think of, uh, there is an argument that uh, if somebody's working on a project, nobody, you know, uh, other people thinking about working on the same project should maybe do another project uh, and not that one. <laughs> and that, that's a school of thought. Uh, and I looked at my, I sort of, you know, how do I feel about that? It's like, okay, the, the Wordle game itself, it's a very clever idea, but it's, it's not that, it's not all that hard to implement. Uh, you know, I mean, it took me like a couple of days really to get it up and running. Uh, and of course it's an insanely popular game right now. So I can't have been the only person to think about, uh, doing such a thing for the color computer. Uh, it turns out that, you know, so far I'm maybe the old, the only in the first, but what if somebody uh, else had done that? And my feelings on that would be complex, but really, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I would feel in my heart if somebody did that, but in my head, um, it's like, well, of course you did that. Uh, I, I don't think I could, could criticize somebody for doing that. So it's a very interesting philosophical question. And, uh, and so that uh, I, I kind of had to face that. How would I feel about that if somebody else said, uh, you know, oh, that's very nice. Hey, but by the way, I, I did that yesterday. Um, of course, I've done that with other people too. I remember when I came up with my UUCP implementation back in the day, uh, somebody else had been working on it and they were taking forever and taking forever. And finally I said, you know, I think maybe I'll do it. And uh, so I did it before they did. And they were very nice about it. That was uh, Bob Bilson, wasn't so it? So it's an interesting, uh, no, it was, uh, well, some of the CompuServe people. Uh, you know, there was, you know how there was the kind of this CompuServe versus Delphi thing going on? Yep. Uh, yeah, and uh, there were some people on the CompuServe side that, that had been working, a couple of people, and I can't remember their names, unfortunately, but I don't, uh, Bob Bilson uh, and somebody else, uh, oh, Mark Griffith was one of the people. Right. Yeah, that's right. Him and, and one other person. And, you know, they were, you know, saying, well, we're going to do it. And they were working on it, but it was just taking so long that people were like, where is it? And somebody <laughs> said, why don't you do it? And, uh, and actually, people had been begging me to do it for a long time. And they had been sending me documents on specifications for the UUCP protocol. And so I said, well, why don't I do it? And I I just happened to have, you know, the protocol document right in front of me on my shelf. And I pulled it down and looked at it and said, yeah, maybe I could do this. I don't know. So I worked on it. Didn't really tell anybody, you know, and, and then I was kind of mean. I, I admit it. Uh, on uh, Usenet, uh, Mark Griffith and crew said, if you can read this, this is the first email that it was sent from a color computer. And then I got to tell them, well, actually, I did that last week. I just didn't tell anybody. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that wasn't very nice of me.
I'm not sure there was anything wrong with it, but it wasn't very nice. Um, yeah, but they, they were like, oh, how cool. We didn't realize anybody was work, else was working on this. That's so awesome. So they were very nice about it. They were not salty at all. They were, they were perfect gentlemen. And I, I, I have to admire that. So anyway, an interesting, an interesting philosophical question. Okay, and a suggestion well, about, here from Erroneous in the chat too. He said, "If you're not stuck in stuck on Coco or whatever," he said, "How about Cocodal?" Put the D back in, so you get the, uh, the word. I thought I thought of that. That would make it actually pronounceable. So that that is yeah. And we've also thought about Rickle, you know, because uh, War, uh, Wordle was because the guy's last name was Wardle, you know. So you know, he kind of had his name in there. So so about yeah, one of, one of those <laughs> Deco. What? Dickel. Dickel. No, I, I hate the I hate the name Dick. I don't want to be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> in in any in any sense of that phrase. Cool. Okay, so well, people want to try this game can go get it off of your um, unpronounceable yeah. site. So hopefully they can read it on the screen. <laughs> right. Link is posted in the chat. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. I want to so that's about it for me. What's up, Go ahead, Rick? Yeah, I was just saying I want I want to record what uh, might thrash on the real floppy a bit sounds like and maybe set a tune to it. Yeah, <laughs> it would be uh, percussion. There'd be a lot of percussion. Exactly. It'd be like a drum yeah. solo. Well, with a binary search, I think the worst you can come up with is like about seven accesses, I think. But uh, but you got to check against both lists if you miss on the first list. So yeah, I think there would be a lot of disk activity. I think it might be a problem. And- Caching. It could be a tune. It could be. Well, it's like, yeah, well, back when it was 700 uh, words, you know, I thought about, well, what if I just put those 700 words in data statements? Could I get away with that? And I think I could, but let's see. Um, or if you could tie in the old spell and fix engine. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, you'd have to do compression. Yeah, you would. Let me take a look. Dungeons to uh, Daggeroth five bit compression. Yes. Yes. <laughs> indeed. Uh, one of them is a uh, uh, twenty three hundred words, and the other one is uh, ten thousand odd words. So yeah, I don't think that'd fit in memory. So uh, the one where you validate the words, you'd have maybe you could come up with a hash. You could use, use a hash for that. Anyway, I got to get moving. Yep. Well, got... thanks for coming on and, and uh, talking about the new game. So, if anybody wants to try it, you can go get it from the link that uh, Mark posted in the chat. Uh, source codes there as well. If you want to see how he did it, particularly the binary yep. search, or improve yep. it. That could happen. Yeah, report it to Nitrous Nine. I don't have time. Yeah, I want to. Uh, <laughs> right now, it's in uh, width forty mode, and I want to. I, I want to go to a, a more of a high graphic, uh, high resolution graphics mode, so I can have graphics with it. Uh, cause I want, I want it to be like black letters on a colored background, uh, sort of similar to like Wordle does it. Cause I think it look, I, I like to make it a little bit prettier. Anyway. Yeah. You should be able really, to do that with the attribute command, but yeah. Uh, I wonder. Yeah. I, I tried that. Well, I'll talk to you about that later. <laughs> yeah. You gotta go. I so. gotta go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> See you hey, guys. Thanks. Thanks Rick. Uh-huh. All right. Commercial. Hi Retro Tech Heads, Data Soup here. You're watching Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer and proudly Patreon sponsored by RetroTechTime.com. At Coco Talk, we'd like to thank the patrons who sponsor our program. So our heartfelt gratitude goes out to Alan Huffman, Alan Murphy, Blair Ledoux, Boat and Aaron, Brendan Donahue, Brian Weasler, Karen Anscombe, D. Bruce Moore, Daniel Williams, Diego, Eric Canales, Glenn Hewlett, Graham Vebke, Grant Leedy, Henry Strickland, Jason Downs, Ken Reichard, Malfunk, Michael Pitsley, Paul Fiscarelli, Paul Shoemaker, 
Paul Thayer, Retro Tech Time, Rick Eulen, Rob Inman, Rocky Hill, Stephen Wagner, Steve Batson, Steve Rasmussen, Terry Steen, Terry Steggy, The Backyard Shed Gang, Tim Thayer, Tom C., Tom Gunderson, Tom Heron, Tom S., Tony C., and William Athing. Thank you ever so much, patrons. Hi, this is Eddie Zerbinski from beautiful Quebec City. Vous écoutez Coco Talk. As you're enjoying Coco Talk, we also want to remind you about the Coco Discord server. This is a place where people come to connect, to ask questions, to provide answers, to share information, and to socialize. So when you're done, why don't you head on over to the Coco Discord server and we'll continue the conversation there. The easy to remember link is discord.cocotalk.live. See you on Discord! Coco123 is the Glenside Color Computer Club community newsletter that's been in publication since 1985. While the Rainbow Magazine may be gone, it doesn't mean you still can't have a cool Coco periodical. Head on over to the Glenside Color Computer website at glensideccc.com and then click on the Documents link to view all the past issues of the Coco123 newsletter. Not only can you read all of the past and present issues, we'd also love to hear some submissions from you. So if you'd like to send an article, a column, uh, something to talk about, maybe even a program listing, send an email to glensideccc at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. The Coco World Map is a cool community resource where you can view cocoa nuts from around the world. Head on over to map.cocotalk.live and see where your fellow cocoa nutsians happen to be living on the planet Earth. If you would like to submit yourself to be on the Coco Map, send an email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live and we look forward to seeing you on the Coco Map. Hey guys, it's Stevie Stroh, and if you've been watching Coco Talk for a while, hopefully you understand that everyone is welcome to join this show. So you don't need an impressive resume to get on. You just need to enjoy the Coco and be willing to talk about it. There is no wrong way to Coco. There is no wrong way to be a fan of the Coco. There's no wrong way to be on Coco Talk. You just have to want to talk Coco. So if you would like to join us, then reach out to us on our Discord server, which is discord.cocotalk.live, or send an email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live, and let's get you on the show, and let's talk about the Coco. Hi, I'm Tim, and you're watching Coco Talk Live. And I'm playing Daggereth online like that idiot from the book. Uh, can you can you dial back on the condescension there as you respond there? Me now me turn you to call, call, talk. It's time for everyone's favorite segment. Who's new to Discord this week? Void Star Xanth. Thanks, I'm Steve. I grew up on a Coco 2 hand-me-down from my father. He used his Coco 2 to run his pool service business, yep, he actually used Spectaculator and printed invoices. Recently I acquired a Coco 3 since I was interested in checking out OS 9, something I never got into back in the day. Cobra 3282000. I am hoping someday to have the money available to build my old Coco 3 system back. I used to have a 512k system with 280mfm hard drives and how I miss it. Ring. Hi, my name is Scott. I am from Iowa. My first computer was a Coco 1 with 4K, later upgraded to 32 with piggyback 16K chips and a soldering iron. The Coco is still my favorite machine, probably because it got me started in computers after several months of paper route money, was saved. Ni. Nee, Jacob. Hi. My name's Jakub. When it comes to retro computing, I'm mainly doing homebrew for the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, with some brief forays into Commodore 64 and the Amiga. I want to look into the Coco because the 6809 CPU seems interesting. Whiskey. Sierra. So, my name is Warren. Hi all. Just falling down the Tandy rabbit hole right now. Mind is blown already. I'm an Australian who grew up in the 80s. 
I've now got a small collection of retro computers and consoles, but was stumbling through YouTube and found a Tandy assembly video, and whilst recognizing the Tandy machines, I've never seen one for real, so I'm here to determine if it's something worth seeking out. The previous bios were edited for time's sake. Thanks to, Melly, Boysontech, Paul Fiscarelli, Eric Canales, Terry Stagey, and the Coca Talk patrons for boosting the server. Please consider joining Discord and visiting the welcome section to read these bios in full and see what the community has to offer. At discord.cocatalk.live. Jay, we'll do our thing right after the game on challenge, just the start of the news, I think, just to get it out of the way quick so you don't have to hang around all day. Thank you. I'm dying for some supper at the moment. There it is. Why not? Come on. Oh, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> okay, high score challenge. High score challenge. You're not getting sound on. We're getting no sound on uh, Twitch. Just us, actually. Well, that's broke. We have anti sound. Soupy Malibu made it to level five with 51,450. Canadian that's Retro just, Things uh, made it to level five with 54,450. There, we're getting sound now. Tasman okay, made it to level to five with 58,100. Rich N made it to level five with 59,300. Brian Walsh so made it to level it? seven with 70,100. So. Didn't get any sound on the Cocoa Thoughts either. And the number one score this week. And both are bleeding is through from what I hear. Buck Owens, yeah. who made it to level 13 with 158,700. Thanks to everybody that played this week, and we will see you next week. Coco Talk salutes Buck Owens. Okay, we're back live ish. Um, sorry about the audio. Uh, what do we need to go try to? Do we try to do the redo the uh, Coco Thoughts again? Sure. It's short, won't take long. All right, so let me attempt to fix it and fly here. Ah. And now, they take okay. my boy and I'm saying I'm the gold bridge I need, and those guards are some bad mugs. Like and now, they take my boy and Coco Thoughts, for which I need, by Samuel There's Gimes. some trifling guards indeed. I am the gold runner. I run around. I'm hearing on YouTube now. They steal from me. Okay, so I'm gonna have to update these. They take my bullion. Yeah. I'm saying I'm the gold bridge. 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 bridge I need, and those guards are some bad. They take my bullion. I'm saying I'm the gold bridge I need, and those guards they're bad. I gotta leave. Dick down, man, man, man. Dick down. Do the high score again. I'm not hearing anything on YouTube. Ah. <sighs>
I can. I'm seeing uh, the the cocoa thoughts right now. Okay. Did the did we get to hear the uh, high score video? I think we heard half of the high score video. We saw that Buck Owens won. So. Okay. Well, do we move on? I would say, <laughs> I would say let's, so. Let's, let's move All on. Right. Enough of the train, Rick. All right. So <laughs> now that that dumpster fire is over, let's talk about the game this week. As we saw, we played Gold Runner. And let's see. There we go. There is a uh, review of it from the 1986 March edition of Rainbow Magazine. Uh, this guy liked it, uh, whoever the reviewer is here, um, said it is a quality piece of uh, software for a good price. Although it's kind of funny because he does say that uh, his minor complaint about the game is the slow drawing and erasing of the new screens where the circle goes in and out. Apparently did not know you can just hit any button and that goes away. Yeah. And that's normal for the original yeah. Load Runner, anyway. Yes. And he also the original there, Apple II version had that too. Uh, and he and he uh, said there's over 25 screens, so he didn't know exactly how many screens there was either. So, although I would be surprised if anybody, uh, well, I guess probably a few people made it all 33 screens, but it would have taken some taken some doing. And we also had some submitted scores here. And uh, top score of 373,850, which I think is perfectly reasonable. If somebody Recognize the third place person. He's actually been on our show as a guest. Ah. Eric some, some good scores there, but believable scores. So, And uh, yeah, so that's what I have there. Um, let's see where, there we go. Let's share this screen. This is some footage from the game, uh, that we played or the, uh, live game that we played this week. Um, so yeah, participation wasn't quite as yeah. high this week, but I, I think some of it just got busy. Like I was fully planning on playing and then I suddenly got two rush jobs in. So that screwed me up. Yeah, I think there was just three of us um, playing this week, or at least while I was on there. There's uh, me, Sloopy, and uh, Jim. I was digging out of the snow. <laughs> Whereas he could be have been today. Digging, it, digging through the girders on this game. This is like a dress rehearsal for shoveling snow is what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I don't know. Uh, for tips and tricks on this game, uh, yeah, don't get killed. Uh, I did get help from Curtis when I finally made it to level five. I'm trying to figure out how to get the box that was up at the top of the screen that you had to kill, um, kill somebody, kill the guys and get them to grab it on their way down. But yeah, when they respawn. Yeah. Other than that, I don't know. Uh, does anybody else have any ticks, tricks? <clears throat> the the okay. one tip I do is that they do try to follow you so that you can kind of lead them off to one side and kind of gather them up and then run down and around to the other side or run up and around to the other side. So you can actually get a big separation between you and the guards, mm -hmm. which will give you some time to, you know, get some of the gold stuff. Obviously they, they can carry gold. So if you you know look like you should have won the level, but your you know, ladder to the next level hasn't appeared yet. Obviously one of them is carrying it. Um, if you dig the hole really quick before they go in, then they'll be able to crawl back out. If you dig it fairly ahead of time, so that the hole automatically closes and it will kill them. So you can time whether you want to just slow the guy down, but keep track of where he is because you don't know where he's going to spawn. It's somewhere on the top, but you have no idea where. So sometimes it's actually better to dig the hole earlier just to slow him down, help up to pop in and then, you know, crawl his way back out again, but you gain some time to get away from him as opposed to killing them when you're trying to go up to the top to get some final gold. And all of a sudden he spawns right over you and you're dead. <laughs> so that's, that's another little tip trick. Um, this is different than the Apple II version and some of the other versions. Some of those actually had the ability to dig on both sides. You could just hit different keys to dig you left or right, no matter which way yeah, you were facing. You could only dig in the direction you're facing this time. Yeah. This and some other ports did that too. I think it was dependent on, on, on the platform. But uh, Yeah, the ones that all had single button joysticks and stuff. And, yeah. um, 
And then there's, of course, the things like, you know, figuring out that you have to like double dig and triple dig to make, you know, to get through multiple levels. There's also the hidden squares where you can just fall through. We have to kind of memorize. There's a lot of learning yeah. levels as you go to. It's just so. trial and error. Yeah. And if the 33 levels aren't enough, then, uh, there's a, go- a sequel called Gold Runner 2, which is basically another 33 levels. Mm-hmm. And I've heard some people said the levels on this one are actually quite close to the Apple II one. So, like the Apple II one, I think, has 150 levels because it was a disc-based game. This actually ran yes. a cassette. Um, so I don't know if the first 66 levels are represented between the two of them. And there's also another one done by a different author, also sold by Tom Mixell, called Gold Finder, which is based on this, but it's got some extra stuff. Like there's a little elevator thing on the right-hand side, and, and there's a few other things to it too, but it's similar. But it's, it's a fun game. And I mean, the circle effect, I remember the first time I saw it in the Apple, I was blown away. Like, how the hell do you do that? You know, type of thing. Masking. And then you know, when Dave pulled it off on the on the Cocoa version, and this is one he wrote in high school before he even started DICOM products, um, which he started, I think, in mid to late 85. And he did this one in 84. So this is an early Dave Dyes thing when he was writing for other companies. But he was quite prolific in high school. I mean, he wrote this. He wrote, well, Gold Runner 2, obviously. He wrote... Uh, Color Car Action, which is another one that Novasoft slash Tom Mix sold. He uh, did a kind of a clone of 1942 for a different company. He was pretty prolific for a teenager. And of course, this is one of the ones where the color set doesn't really matter. I prefer the gold to be, you know, the white and red combo rather than the blue and red or blue and white. So I obviously got my favorite character set, but it, it really doesn't matter. You can tell it yourself apart from the guards. The guards are white and you're a color. So. Mm-hmm. Now, Nick, was this one that you played a fair bit at one point? Or were uh, you joking on uh, Discord earlier? Really? I think Nick was joking. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> say anything about this game. Yeah, you well, said you, you had you a high score, just but you missed adding the, high, the highest score. Yeah. Oh, on that. Yeah, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I, he, he said that a few times, Curtis. Yeah, yeah right pretty well every I week, I think. Did, yeah. did you see the little... um? The, the long Pinocchio nosed character I put at the end of the line. <laughs> lying. <laughs> I don't know. You never turn your video camera on, so we never see when you're lying on the show. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> it does through a lot of monitors, doesn't it? it? It doesn't fit in the camera angle. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a fun game. It's it's one of those ones that has some adventure elements because you kind of like learn the levels as you go and you learn where the hidden trap doors and stuff are. Puzzles. And there's puzzles like that. That first real puzzle is figuring out how to get that gold bar in level five. Like I, you can't yeah. get up there. Like, how do you do it? And then you kind of figure, oh, if I kill a guard, he respawns and the you know, eventually he'll respawn over top that gold bar and bring it down for you. And there's Buck other Owens. things on later levels <laughs> that get complicated too. Buck Owens did say that uh, he got stuck on that level for like, over half an hour because he kept killing them and none of them would respawn over top of that one <laughs> just for half an hour. He kept killing them, killing them, killing them. And they wouldn't uh, respawn there. So, which mind you, if you're going for score, apparently that works well. Cause he did win yeah. the score challenge. So well, he also got to level 13. So. And I'm one trying to remember, I, I can't remember. I think somebody back in the day actually came up with a level editor for this. Like I know the Apple version and some other versions came with a level editor. So you can create your own levels and add them to the 150 base ones. And I think somebody hacked one. I don't think it was ever sold officially with the game, but I think somebody did make a hack for Gold Runner and Gold Runner 2. You actually could create your own levels. I always like this game because it's um, it's easy to learn, but hard to master because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as, as you get more, as you get more involved, I don't know on this one, the screens, but the Apple one had like a V where everything tra- tra- trailed down into a, um, like, a yeah, like a volcano. That level does exist on here. I've been on that one. Yeah. And it's like, you got to plan way ahead in order to figure that one out. Otherwise, yeah. And then, yeah. So it's just. And there's a little Easter egg levels where it'll spell something on the screen or have somebody's initials or something like that. So. Yep. Yep. The rumor is that Douglas, uh, uh, what was his name? Doug, mm, Doug Smith is the name of the guy that built this. He actually uh, paid some of the kids in his neighborhood to develop the levels for the Apple II. He basically set up the level editor and then set them loose and paid them by the screen. And that was why there were so many screens on the original version. I didn't know that. That's cool. That's hmm. yeah, that may or may not be true, but that makes sense. I mean, you know, if you if you had the game, you know, you he was a student, you know, you don't want to spend all your time building screens when you can have somebody else do it. Uh, well, I know did he pay them actual cash, or you just give him a free copy of the game when it came out? I, I suppose I know he paid him cash because he actually sold it through Broderbund. So I don't know. So 
when I played the Apple version as a kid, I don't think I made it much past about level five or six. So I never would have guessed there was 150 levels. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's I can't say I got through all 150, but I did get into the 20s. I think back then, I don't know if I could do it now. But cool thing about the level editors, you could actually load up uh, any of the levels, the hacked versions, and then you could play it. So you could, didn't have to play them all in order. You could skip through. So. Yeah, because you, you had to be able to play test to make sure they were solvable. So exactly. Yeah, but this was this is one of the rare games too, where it was a big hit on the home computers, the Apple II, and it was ported the Commodore, the Atari, and a bunch of others officially, and then a lot of unofficial ports for various platforms, including ours. And then they actually was popular enough to made it into an arcade game after the fact. So there's a, a multicolor one. Now that one, I think if I remember has scrolling and stuff like it, it's, it's a much yeah. more bigger cartoon. Like it's not as good as a game because it's, it's not the same feel. It doesn't quite capture it right. Yeah. I've, I've played versions of the scrolling one and it's not nearly as fun. Cause especially since you can't keep track of the uh, guys on the screen, you don't know where they are. They could just pop out of any place. Cause it's yeah. very interesting I, there's, there's, that, Japanese or the Japanese found this game very popular. And if you check out mm -hmm. the Wikipedia page, there's been like 37 releases of this game, uh, clear up until the last few years. I mean, it's a very popular game, to even today. Yeah. Well, as you said, it, it's, it's a very simple game to learn the controls and learn how the game plays, but very hard to master, especially when you come up with some of these incredible level designs that come in the later levels or you know, the yeah. later versions of the game. So, yeah, exactly. It becomes a puzzle game. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a lot of thought to figure out some of the levels. That's why I did, suck at it. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> did this guy then write a uh, sequel called Jump Jumpman? Jumpman to Jumpman Junior are very mm, similar well, to teams, either. but I don't they're think they're totally the different author. authors. When I remember, yeah, they oh, they, relation oh, to each okay. other at all. Because in that one, you're running around defusing bombs. Yeah, I do know that the original uh, game was actually a text-based one that ran on a mini computer at the University of Washington, where he was going to school. And so it was a game that the students would play in the meantime. And his, um, I think it was his nephew that was wanted to play, but only had an Apple computer. And so Doug Douglas Smith basically wrote the game and graphics for the Apple for his nephew to play. So There's we got some whole... comments in the chat here. I thought, as you mentioned, so Buck Owen says, I got pissed off and quit that stuck on level five game. Haven't played it since. <laughs> <laughs> And then he was also asking, what did the speech sound card add to the game? And I honestly don't know. Was it just speech? Did it say something? Like I missed. The, yeah, it's supposed to add some extra speech and sound, like some sound effects or some speech or something. I meant to run it through VCC and put the uh, speech card on it, but I never did. I ran out of time this week, so I don't know what it does. Yeah, because I, I'll be honest, when I was playing this regularly, it was way before I had a multi pack and a sound speech pack. So I never did try it, even though I have them now. I guess we kind of wish I had gotten a chance to play it here this week. I mean, I'll try that maybe this weekend. I'll see if I can fire it up for a little bit and see what it does. Because mm -hmm. I honestly don't know what it, what it I, had. I always wanted games to do like left and right clues in the sound because that's theoretically possible. And I well, that you need an ORC 90, any... wouldn't you? Maybe so. I, I, I remember you talking stereo. Yeah, I, I always wanted like Dungeons of Dagger to have the monsters left and right in the stereo field and stuff. And I don't remember ever hearing that. That that is an untapped nah. market. I only know of two games that do that, and they're both John Strong's. He did his Soviet Block, which is a Tetris clone, and then his gems, maybe Gems 2 does it as well, but he uses the Orc 90 card just to do yeah, as you're moving your gems or your your Tetris line left and right. It actually pans left and right on the Orc 90. Cool. But that's the only one I know, or only set of games I know. Yeah, that would be something that would work really good with Dungeons of Daggerth, as they. Yeah, they or Phantom have Slayer, it. or any of these other ones where yeah. you know you're in a 3D maze where you can you can already hear when they're coming mm -hmm. closer and closer as they get louder. It would be neat to be yeah, able being to able to hear, hear the panning and what side they're coming from too. Then we oh, just need just... quadraphonics; you can hear yeah. front and back too. <laughs> Hook up a whole surround sound system and. <laughs> Pretty soon we have a Coco with a Dolby THX 11.2 or whatever the heck it is. Well, there was the um, VR rig that uh, they had oh, right. uh, running the uh, that on, so that would work perfect for that. Yeah, it would. <laughs> anyway, I have no more right. tips or stories to do there. It's, nope, me uh, neither. So anybody want to see what next week's game is? No. Yes. No, yes. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> Oh, speaking of, here's another Dave Dies game. Exactly. I thought I'd make it a double header. 
by accident because I didn't know he wrote this game too. <laughs> <laughs> Fighter <laughs> pilot, I think it's called. Uh, let's just share the title screen, which is right here. Oh, I guess right. And this oh, was one that, of the last games that Dave did before he started his own company. Cause he had published, I think four or five games at this point for other companies. And he decided, you know what? I should keep all the money myself. So this is a game that is based on 1942. The, uh, yeah, it's not the game. full game just to yeah, get it's people. It's not the full game. It's, ba- it's, ca- it's based on it. It doesn't have the end uh, bosses and stuff like that, but. Yeah, and you don't um, flip your plane and you don't have the aircraft yeah. carrier stuff, but basically there's different size planes that take a different number of hits and some going It's, a, it's a fun little shooter, and I th- I think I just play tested it a little bit and I enjoyed it. So I thought, hey, let's give that a try. So if you like uh shooters, planes, everything else, then I uh, hope you'll enjoy this game and be there on Thursday. To play it live. Come on. People. When when is the next uh, afternoon one for Dragon Friendly? Uh, that is next week, I think, on the 16th. So a week from so next week's game or the, the game after this will be the uh, the game for the that'll be uh, on the Wednesday afternoon. So there'll be there, you know, for people that actually have some days off during the week or you know, work nights or something, they'll have two opportunities to make fools of themselves in the live yeah. trying to play these games. Good. Cool. I look forward. I'm, I'm going to try to my darndest to get into this one. I was I always try to save it for the live stream because <laughs> I usually have other stuff going on during the week. But in this case, just work hit right at the exact wrong time. And I'll try to submit my high score um, before the deadline. Okay, I'm looking forward to that, Nick. <laughs> so make sure I'm, you're wearing I'm your nose guard. It, really, Nick. I am. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, Fighter Pilots, the game for next week. Get it yep. on the archive. Dave Dice has given permission years and years ago from my site that all of his stuff is, you know, he's, he's perfectly fine people copying it. So go grab it. And if you don't already have it and uh, give it a shot. And next up, we'll start doing the game on news. Now I was going to originally save this for the project updates and acquisitions. Cause we just showed off this game a week ago, but we actually made a pretty good chunk of progress on it again. But uh, since Jay's patiently hung around for long interviews, et cetera, I thought we'd just do it now. So basically this is an update to Petsky robots. Um, we've got key repeat mostly working. It's because the tile system, I haven't done dirty tiles yet. So it's running a little slower. So it kind of gets jumpy if it catches it at the wrong part of a draw cycle. Uh, but Jay added in a bunch of animations. We've got the cinema working. We've got water moving and a bunch of other things. So I thought Jay maybe would demonstrate some of the stuff. And once again, like this is not optimized, uh, but it actually is running better than I was expecting it to, to be quite honest. So Jay, take it away. Okie dokie. You hear me? Yep. yep. All right, let me uh, see if we can figure out Zoom here. Give me a second. And this won't be like a huge, long technical demo thing or uh, you know, a description of what we're doing. Is just to give you kind of a, a visual update of some things that have been updated. All right, so here we are. What we'll do is we'll go up here first and check out. Hang on, Zoom's being stupid to me here. Hold on. Okay. I was trying to spotlight you and it refuses to even give me the option. Well, anyway, your screen is sharing, so you can go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. This new routine definitely seems to react more adversely to robots being on the screen than the old one. Curtis. Yeah, but that's because you could time it with the key hits individually. In fact, you can still do that if you want. But Right. All right, so this is what's called the cinema. As you can see, it's kind of laid out like a movie theater. A dual screen one. Yeah, dual screen. Yeah, this is a <laughs> THX, I believe, as well. And um, it basically tells you what the uh, next couple of movies coming up are going to be. So you can uh, watch the ticker tape uh, as long as you want to. And eventually it will repeat. 
Yeah, so it's just a nice little thing David threw in there. I don't know. Are we going to keep his original stuff or are we going to throw a few of our own in there too? I don't know. Well, I think what we'll do is what I'd like to do anyways is leave it the same for this version and then possibly do like a, uh, what do you call that? A uh, something compile. I can't think of the word where it will pick out different ones for the Coco version. If, if we have Coco, Coco 3, I guess we'd have to have two different uh, executables for that though. It should be all movies that Coco's appear in. Yeah. <laughs> There's Revenge what, of the two? Nerds and <laughs> two, maybe. You've uh, got two screens. But um, well, they have to say the same thing, unfortunately. That's the way it's, mm. that's the way it's I guess we could make them different, but that would be a lot more coding. Um so, anyways, that's what that does. That's one of the kind of like one of the fun things he put in, which I thought was pretty neat. Whoops, wrong buttons. Um, what I can show since we have the power now once I remember how to do it where am I at All right. so this is our new effect for when you set off a large explosion get a nice little screen shake going see if I can blow this guy up this time Here are you. Did I get him? Oh, yeah. He's dead. Oh, no, I didn't get him. Damn it. <laughs> it again. Everything else. Well, it's hard because I'm fighting with when the robot's moving right now, it doesn't, uh, it makes your control a little bit tough until we get it more optimized. Yeah, the way the game is is coded that when you move, it redraws the whole screen. When a robot moves, it redraws the whole screen. So when you got both on the screen at once and they're on different timings when they kick in, it's redrawing the screen twice as often as it should, which is something I have to fix. All right, so down There's here another you can one. see another one what? The, uh, the animations I was just going to mention. Oh, yeah. So you guys can see here um, we got water animation working now. So the water kind of sloshes around, which is nice. And up here, there's kind of a pool of water. So if I go up here, maybe we can do something. I don't know if I ever showed this. Let me try getting into this room here without dying. Oh, there's a hole. Come on, baby. So if I swap my weapon here, there we go. And wait for those guys to come back. Oh, uh, yeah. So the weapon he just uses is called the EMP. Now, normally when you set it off, when robots are on land, <coughs> they just get confused and wander around randomly for so many seconds. But, but if they're over water, it short circuits them. So you watch them spin, fuzz out, and then they die. So you can actually take a whole bunch of them out in one shot. Yep. So if you can catch, them, catch a couple over water at the same time, then you can kill them, which is pretty neat. Let's go down here and see if there's any fans. I don't remember if there is. We'll see. Yeah, because if you guys remember when we showed this last time, there was uh, these air conditioning units, HVAC things, uh, but they weren't spinning yet, and that, that's been fixed now, too. So those are animated as well. I don't remember if there's one on this level or not, either. Yeah, I can't remember if there's a... There's also a server computer, I guess, that blinks lights. I actually haven't looked at that one myself. I haven't yet. seen that one yet. Do you know where that is? Um... I can't remember. There's a level that has a whole bunch of server units. There's a little server farm building, basically. Okay. But I can't remember. That's probably it, then. All right. I can't find you on here, so we will drop out of that for a second, and I'll redo the uh, file. It's good to be the king. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Uh, I think Level two has some pretty quickly, so we'll try that. Ah, uh, stop pass. <laughs> gotta hate when that happens. Isn't it setup. startup? Setup. setup. Yeah, you're right. I was thinking startup. 
that up. I don't hardly ever type it, so <laughs> it always types it automatically for me. <clears throat> okay, now I believe that this one has some stuff around the bottom. Maybe not. Whoa. Well, I know that level one has some uh, air conditioners on the bottom of the uh, building. And that's what I was thinking. I thought it was, must have been what I was thinking of. Yeah. I don't see them here. Be nice if we can do the maths from inside the game. Plus, the start will be a lot quicker, too. There you go. There's level one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it always says level one. <laughs> that is non consequential at the moment. Eventually, it will mean something, but. Come on, Havoc unit. There he is. Woohoo. So these uh havoc unit rotates. Probably will rotate faster as we speed up the redrawing, which will probably look a little bit nicer, but um that's what that looks like. Uh let me get that guy out of the way so you can see a little bit better. What do we uh I'm trying to think if there's anything else. We showed him the screen shake, key repeat, kind of hard to show, but it's uh, essentially, I mean, I can hold down the key while I'm in here and he will repeat. Only problem is because of the timing of it right now, he doesn't really stop when I let go. So that's something we have to fine tune as the time comes to do that. Uh, we showed all the anim new animations. Cinema, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think the only one misses a server farm, but that's not really a big one to show off. Anyway. Yeah, you know what? And to be honest, I'm not sure where that is. I don't want to be searching around, wasting time while we're in this show to try to figure that out. Yeah. But that's all I got. Unless anybody's got questions or anything, just want to do a quick update on what's changed. Recently. And a fair bit of progress for a, a week. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it. Well, I say. Whatever Curtis is doing, I'm sure, is the heavy lifting at the moment. But what I had done this week has been pretty easy. So <laughs> that was uh, worked out pretty well for me. But Curtis kind of doing the heavy lifting at the moment. So, And I have to give a shout out to Nick, too, because he lent me a keyboard scan routine because we've ditched the ROMs. We're no longer using ROM yeah, calls. Thanks, so that, um, I, I did have to optimize Nick's code, of course, like I usually do. But uh, other than that, it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> And by optimizing means a complete rewrite, but he got it to work. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, I was wondering why the game was working so well. That's right. You took my routine. It's <laughs> the spirit of Nick. One, one point for me. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> No, a big big thanks, Nick, because I mean, I, I, <laughs> I haven't done keyboard routines in 20, 30 years, and I don't remember much of the details. And you had a nice, easily laid out routine that basically did exactly what you need, just map the keys, 
Don't worry about shifting and alting and controlling them. Because the game itself, we're not going to worry about having to hit those. You can select keys that you want to move and to fire in different directions and use and move objects and all that kind of stuff. And uh, makes you want just single key hits for them. So your routine worked perfectly. And then I just and, literally just optimized it a bit. And no ROM calls. Yes, no, that's no the big thing. And we're not going to have any ROM calls for the disc either. That's that's another thing because it'll free up some space and also time. So well, you said you're going to try to put the discs in a different uh, MMU, right? Different block. Yeah, but I still don't want to have to do the ROM calls because that's just a well, I don't blame you there. Yeah. Crap. Right. Well, plus, yeah, you don't have to worry about what basic is looking for and what it's not looking for. Exactly. Because the disc one is particular. It cascades through extended and color basics. You have to leave a bunch of stuff that those two ROMs use at the same time. Which right. you know takes up RAM that we could be using for like sound samples or enhanced right. graphics or whatever. So I'd rather just ditch the darn thing. Now, before we get onto the regular game on news here, uh, Grant Lady, because I think he has to go fairly soon here, has some uh, general announcements on uh, the Cocoa Fest. So take it away, Grant. Hey, thanks, Curtis. Yep, just uh, want to let everybody know that uh, that Cocoa Fest is coming up very quickly. It's uh, what the only what four a little bit over four months away now. <laughs> so just want to let you guys know that registration will open up at 5 p.m. Central Standard Time uh, later today. Uh, you'll be able to go on there and reserve your um, tables. Uh, just to remind mm -hmm. everybody that Coco Fest is free this year, uh, but if you want to uh, be a vendor, there's a small fee for that. It's $20 for your first table, $15 for each additional table. Uh, that also includes your $15 membership fee for the next year for the, uh, for the club. Um, if you're not going to be a vendor this year, then you can go on there and purchase the dinner and also purchase your $15 membership if you wish to be part of the uh, club as well. So everything will be going live at five o'clock this evening for the registration process. Does that include booking, um, doing seminars and stuff too, or, or is it just the vending tables and attending the show? Just, uh, just attending the shows. If you want to be a presenter, just send me an email and I will get you on the uh, schedule and get that all finalized for everybody. And I, I realize I'm doing this on the air lives and I haven't actually talked to both of you at the same time, but uh, Ken and uh, Grant, did you guys <laughs> talk about possibly us doing that base nine seminar? Uh, nope, I haven't speak to Ken yet about that, but uh, we can definitely get that squared away. I already, already got you and Ken down as a uh, as a presenter for the show. Okay. Yeah, so I don't have a choice. It's already written down. <laughs> <You're> gonna... <laughs> yeah, and the way I did it live here, you're committed now. So too yeah, bad. well, I guess that means I have to go. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> okay, well, thanks. Thanks for the right. update, Hey, th thanks, Curtis. Also, Grant, do you know how, like from Scott, we've been Trog's question earlier, like how far ahead do you guys book the hotel and kind of get the next show booked? Do you guys do it 11 months in advance, six months? I believe uh, this year, Jim did it about 12 months in advance. So, so, cause I think he was signing the contracts as soon as Coco Fest was over. So we book it pretty, pretty early. So we should be able to give Scott lots of time to him to book his uh, nomadic ways to end up in the Chicago area. Exactly. And if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, Jim Brain and I were both discussing we're going to try to move it back to uh, the April time frame for next year. Okay. Oh, well, well, if you don't like that, then speak up now and I can pass that well, to the, uh, the only reason I, that day. The only reason <laughs> I boo that is because that is the one time of the year where I have to be at work pretty much every day for a month and a half. So if you guys were to leave it maybe a little later in the spring, that would be awesome. <laughs> okay but so that I, would I, just that would just be for me i mean if that doesn't work for everybody else that's fine but any like after like mid may like later than that maybe even like the third fourth week of may or whatever that would be great for and me to be honest i mean that's a little bit me too i can attend in, in in april like the end of april but i usually end up having to go back to my room and working for walks i'm finishing up the late baseball seasons for my work and okay. uh, so the may always yeah. works better for me too yeah, after, i will note that, that down and then uh I yeah, will, actually, uh, let them know what, what is it going to be? Time. Is it going to be June this year? Is that what we're doing? Uh, no, it's going to be May, what, uh, 13th, 14th, May. and 15th. Well, that's 14th not four months. That's only two months, right? Oh, we're so in February, February. March, April, May. So three months. Okay. Yeah. So, like, late May or even June would be great for me. But, you know, like I said, whatever works for everybody else is, is definitely what you should do. But it would work great for me to be later. That's the reason, like, I went to this Cocoa Fest this year. Um, just because of the time, you know, time of year that it was, I can make it, you know, but, uh, I would like to come more often. So later, later in the spring, would be great for me. Awesome. We'll just have to hold two fests. 
<laughs> we kind of do. They have the attendee assembly usually at the end of the year, right? I know a lot of people hit that up. Yeah, but I think that's in October is when they right. really do that. Oh, yeah. I'll hire a sub room of Tandy Assembly. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great to have Scott come out and show off his camper. That'd be awesome. And maybe get some of the old gang together, like Alan Huffman and him, and maybe Paul Jacatus and a few others too that were part of Terry Todd, you know, some of the other people that were involved at that group that always hung together and get them all out for one fest again. That would be awesome. I used to call San Bay long distance as my um, email of choice. So that was Paul's thing in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. I remember it because they used to advertise in the one side, one, two, three. Uh, and I lived in Milwaukee. So I cost, I called a buddy in Racine who called Chicago and that somehow became not long distance. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thanks Grant and keep us posted if um, you know, there's any changes or anything else we need to wor- worry about or get set up for the show. All right. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Curtis. Appreciate it. Okay, so we'll go on to the game on news. Don't bother playing a little intro or anything. We'll just go straight into it. I've already um, been there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll share my screen here. There's actually, a, it, it's the game on news is nice and light this week for the most part, so it shouldn't take too long. So this is a bit of an interesting one because, uh, Tim Lindner and his sister AJ have been doing this series of what they call sibling rivalry. So it's a, a show semi-regular on, on YouTube and they take a bunch of different old, you know, old platform games, old computer games and stuff, as long as they're multiplayer simultaneous. And then they play them out and you kind of hear their live reactions. And usually AJ has not really tried the game before. And usually Tim has, and they've covered some Intellivision games and Nintendo games and that kind of stuff. So, the ironic thing is that they released two episodes this week. And I think that's the first time that's ever happened, but they've also released two Coco games in the same week too. So um, I'm going to play like little bits of it. I, I do know that sometimes the, um, the action gets a bit heated and some four letter words fly. <laughs> and there's also some pretty wicked humor in there in spots too. So I will just play very short little clips to try to avoid having, you know, this become unfamily. Friendly. Um, but the one, the first one they did this week uh, is cash man. AJ, welcome to Sibling Rivalry. Thanks, Tim. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, Yet again, here. another amazing week of fun and games with my brother. Yeah, we got a lovely game of Cash Man on the color computer. Ooh. And I would like to... Yeah, hey, I'm not going to play the whole video. You guys can watch that. But uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Cash Man, which I believe we already have done in the challenge, haven't we, uh, Ken? Or is yeah, still here? we did. Oh, we did. Okay, a while back. Okay, so that's, that's my time. One. But... And then, and this is a game that is 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 both cooperative and competitive simultaneously, because you can actually help each other to try to get all the cash in the level to finish it faster, so you don't get killed. And you can you know try to shoot the cats and stuff that can't get you, but you can also shoot each other too. So it's always a fun. And if speaking of lots of levels, this is a game that has I don't know how many levels Cashman has. I think the highest level I've ever personally been to is forty seven. So there's a lot. And then just, you know, the same week, uh, they decided to do Gantlet, uh, playing with joysticks. I'm not quite sure they have you AJ. You mean Gantlet, don't you? <laughs> no, I'm not French. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure why AJ is wearing like a Rampage style costume and kicking buildings, because that has really nothing to do with Gantlet, but okay. Have you heard her commentary? <laughs> yeah, no, this is the part I'm scared about. Maybe she fast forward this a bit. <laughs> Actually, her commentary wasn't too bad. It was Tim this time that went off the rails oh. of the commentary. <laughs> Treasure chest. Oh, I, I see. We're going to have a nice long game. Well. <laughs> now, one thing interesting yeah, here on, on their, uh, you can tell in the commentary here, is you can notice their uh, health points here on the bottom right of this Cocoa screen. It's got that weird less than sign. That's because this one has been patched. I mean, this is a patch I did for the 69, but it was already pre-patched to give you 65,535 health. Because this is a game that you tend to die pretty quick. And and they thought they were just going to play until the end of, uh, you know, until they died. But because this is patched to give you not quite infinite life, but pretty darn close. 
Um, they just actually cut it off after, after playing a few levels here. But this is uh, the first, I think, real three-player real three player game I remember. Rampage is another um, where you had you know two people on joysticks, plus you had the keyboard controls, and you could play all three simultaneous players. And then Gamlet 2, the Coco 3 version, actually went one further and crammed two players onto the keyboard. One had the right side of the keyboard, one on the left, plus two joysticks, and it was a four-player game. Isn't this as far supposed as I know, to be like a clone of Gauntlet, yes. the arcade? Well, where's yeah. all the creatures? I haven't seen a creature yet. Oh, that's just because of what I happened to fast forward there. Uh, the level you'll see. Because normally you're surrounded by people or creatures all the time in this game. At least you were in Gauntlet. I remember I played it all the time when I was in the arcade when I was a kid. Yeah, it tends to fill in a lot more in the later levels. It kind of starts a little bit easier here. I'll just fast forward and see uh, a bit more. Oh, my gosh. Oh, there we go. That's more what I'm used to seeing. Yeah. And of course, you get different monsters the further levels you get into. Right, and you get more, and they get fat. Well, at least in the arcade, they get faster. And... Yeah, yeah, or more powerful. <laughs> right. Pick in the arcade, didn't you get upgrades to your like bow and stuff too? Uh, over, over yeah, time. and you had you had like shooting potions and all kinds. Of yeah, stuff. yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's the honest response they give to playing that I was like, and the fact that there are siblings and they. You know, shoot each other down constantly. It's, it's just perfect. It reminds me of playing with my brother back in the day. <laughs> so, anyway, that was really cool. They did two Coco episodes in the same week. So, definitely go check those out. Uh, if you're, uh, I guess, not a fan of risque language, probably skip the gauntlet one. <laughs> uh, it's, it doesn't like, there's not a ton of swearing or anything, but there's some definite blue humor in the beginning of it that uh, if you're not into that type of stuff or not accepting of that kind of stuff, you probably should skip that part. <clears throat> Next up was just showing uh, Rick's official announcement of his uh, whatever we're going to call it here. It's calling it Coco Lay here, um, kind of demonstrating it. Now it, it kind of blew out the uh, colors here, so you can't really tell what's gray, green, and yellow as as close as we did when we watched him do the live stream of it. But this is his showing it off, and I'm sure he'll get the background color stuff working to get it more like the actual you know modern version of the game. This was kind of an interesting post here. So I was checking because I know they were releasing another AGD games pack, which is the stuff that Paris Rat and, and uh, Keys Van Oss, <clears throat> where they take the AGD engine games for the Spectrum, convert them over to the Coco. And uh, Paris has been involved Paris has been involved with the uh, Super Sprite FM Plus board, which is basically the MSX chipset with uh, the graphics and Sprite chip plus the sound chip. Uh, that's being manufactured by John Whitworth in the, in the UK, which is available for the Dragon and the Coco. And he's shown some demos that we've actually shown on the show before too of some AGD games. And the John Whitworth site, if you actually have one of those boards, and some people here in the States actually do have them, um, have actually been playing them and showing you it's got full 16 color screen. This is on Coco 1 or 2 yet. And with you know really good sound effects and sprites and stuff like that. One thing I did not know... Um, Pairs, I guess, been actually converting some of the background here. And John basically just put up, I think, six games right now that kind of use the Super Sprite FM Plus. But he's not like regularly updating because he's busy doing you know, all his hardware stuff. But he mentioned here, right now, I already have 12 games that support the Super Sprite board from the AGD games packs, but only six are downloadable. And he was asking about you know, uploading the upload section. So, Pair, if you're watching this, please do, because I'm sure that some of the people here in the North America, never mind the ones in the UK and Europe that have the Super Sprite FM Plus board, would love to have 12 different games to play rather than just six. And also means that this is a platform that is coming out of the gate running with a lot of software available for it right off the bat. We've got demos, we've got music players, we've got all kinds of stuff, but now we've actually got 12 games already ready to go that take full advantage of the, the hardware on this uh, upgrade. So that well, you're we get, of, Is there a chance to get like a Super Sprite section on the Coco archive and put them there? Is there one already, Mark Overholzer? Do you know? I think there is, isn't there? Oh, no, you mean the archive or in the uh, Discord? The archive. Yeah, I don't think we have anything on Discord. Well, we might have something. Yeah, I think we have the Discord one, but I, I'm not sure. Because the, the AG, I don't think any of the AGD stuff's on the archive, right? But the older, the straight Cocoa Port black and white ones are, for sure. I've actually okay. downloaded them from there. So <clears throat> I don't know if he's keeping it up to date, though. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, for me, and it could just be because I'm behind the times. But for me, if I'm looking for something for the cocoa, that's the first place I go. So maybe it might be worth. Yeah, and that's why I suggested there. Rick should throw his uh, Wordle clone on there right. too, because that is the first place I look too. Right. 
I mean, if you if you want to set up a site that you can download it from, which has a bunch of like a blog explanation why you wrote it or how you wrote it or anything, that's fine. And that's a definitely a plus because you won't get that on the Color Computer Archive site. But just as a place to make your software available for people to find, it's definitely best, I think, to put it in the archive. We do have a Super Sprite FM MSX board channel on uh, the Cocoa Discord. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I know some people are writing demos. I know Simon's been working with it too lately and stuff too. So, in fact, MAME supports the Super Sprite FM Plus too, doesn't it? Are you sure? I'd have to check. I don't know. So you can actually write the software. Actually, no, it for sure does, because actually there's a story about it a little bit later in the regular news. So there was that. And then, of course, because they're still releasing all the new games, he was playing catch up here because they hadn't done any updates for a couple of years. And now they've been converting everything over six games a week. So this is pack number 49. So now we're up to almost 280 games. So there's six new ones this time around. So there's Ninja Poison Part 1 and Part 2, Stickman, Tank Battle, the eight level game, and the Hair Rising Adventures of Mr. Hare. Which is a where do these games come from originally? Is there like an AGD system or like what is yes. what is AGD? A AGD is the uh, what's it stand for? Arcade, something game arcade game design, I think, something like that. Design. Yeah, something like that. It's a spectrum, spectrum. program that basically lets you design platforms oh, so based style. around the spectrum. Then okay, yeah, and basically, uh, the, the uh, Para and, and Keys have converted the engine over to the Coco because the, the yeah, screen right. resolution on the spectrum is exactly the same as Pima 4. They have that color attribute block tile thingy in right. addition, so they can do more colors on the screen than we can, but they, it's exact same resolution, so basically you just convert the <laughs> graphics over. And thank God we don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this new pack is now available for download. You can see the Dragon versions here, the Cocoa versions here. They got long names for the emulators and short names for the STC. <clears throat> so just kind of scroll quickly through here. Eight level game. This one actually was a little bit different here because the, the graphics are, are for the most part designed so blocky. It almost looks like a Tier City Model One game than a, a Spectrum game. But I don't know too much about the games yet. There's the Hair Raising Adventures of Mister Hair, which looks like Clippy with you know a hippie cut or something. There's some, you know, some pretty nicely done graphics for some of these here. Now, of course, we're missing some of the color stuff. I was going to say, is there any, is it only black and white in the MSX? No, this isn't MSX. This is uh, just a Spectrum. Oh, I'm sorry. Spectrum. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the Spectrum, it, it's, it's kind of strange. It's, it's done. There's two different chunks to a screen. There's the 256 by 192, one pixel per bit. Same as the code. Exact same as P14. But then they have a chunk afterwards, which is the colors. And basically every eight by eight pixel, you can pick a foreground and a background color for it. And they're independent from each, each block. So every eight by eight can have a different set of foreground background colors. Okay. Which was why you'll see a lot of this color clash and square effects. Was that but kind, yeah, I was gonna say, was that kind yeah. of what the guy was talking about the, on the show we were on a couple of nights ago? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. the same thing so, he was talking about? Yeah, yeah the Donkey so, Kong demo? Yeah, exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. So it was great for platform games because everything well, platform Split games, if they're, if they're horizontal, unlike Donkey Kong, that's not horizontal. And well, well, right. You your your traditional side-scrolling platform, right. you had an 8 by 8 cell of colors, and it didn't clash too much as you went horizontally along your horizontal platform. Right. But once you left that format, then, yeah, it kind of fell apart. Yeah, when, once you started adding, you know, fine-tuned vertical rather than 8 by 8 pixel jumps, it starts color clashing. If you have stuff walking in front of something else, well, all of a sudden, they have to change the colors because you only right. put two there. Yeah. So, so everyone just went for high res black and white that knew what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've seen some pretty well designed games to use the color. I mean, if if, oh, yeah. if it's in the hands of a graphic artist that knows how to use it, it actually can turn out to be quite good. And it, unlike like a sixteen color screen like Jay and I are working with, where it's a thirty two K screen versus six, that only takes like seven. <laughs> because the, the little color block table at the end there is actually quite small, so it's right. Yeah, because you only need. Well, whatever that would be. Yeah. So you get the illusion of having a really colorful machine, even though it's only two colors every eight by eight pixel grid. So it, it was a nice compromise, I think. I mean, the color clash gets kind of ugly at times, but in, in Stevie's terms, it, it's that color that solo tape color over the front. Yeah, kind of <laughs> like the old. Uh, <laughs> was that what was that uh, arcade game that did that? Xbox. What was it? 
Well, the cowboy shooter thing too. No, no, no. Oh, I think it was around. It was around. Uh, Star Castle. No, you spun the had a spinner control. And then as you spun around, tempest. it had round with a tempest it had like the and then it had literally had like a colored rings stuck to the screen or stuck to the. And it wouldn't be tempest because tempest was actually color vector. No, this had actually had a colored ring thing stuck to the screen. And that's what gave you the color. I know Star Cast was like that, but you were shooting at the thing in the center that was spinning around with different octagonal. I have to I'd have to go look through arcade machines and see what it was but i remember because i remember one time thinking like wow it changes color kind of as it walks and i like reached down and started playing with it it was literally like a decal that they stuck on yeah the screen yeah well space invaders part two is how they did that too because they just had a white black and white screen and they'd have the colored thing Sticky to get you know song. top rows green next rows red or whatever no uh, i never noticed that but i remember there was it was i remember it was round the the shape that you were using obviously because the rings were round but yeah, it was kind of weird. This tank battle one looks kind of interesting. I don't, I'm not sure if it's an arcade style game, or it's more of a strategy game almost, just because of the way it's kind of laid out with so many tanks. Like I don't know how you control all that, or maybe you're just the big tank. But it looks like a different. do have a different use of the engine than I've seen previously. We saw one last week, I think, too, that kind of broke the mold. It was kind of trying to do isometric 3D, which for mm. you know the AGD system might that's that's a little bit odd. So anyway, for those of you who want to try them out, there's six more games to try out there. You know, if you, if you haven't got your game fix in the Coco yet and you're figuring there's not enough games to play, well. That has a nice look to it, too. Yeah. Just kind of the way they've done the artwork and stuff. It's, it looks... Yeah, there's been some very well done clean, stuff. Now, I, I do know when we talked to Para uh, way, way back, before the Dragon Special, the first time we had him on, he had mentioned that this is actually used for some very young kids in schools to design their own arcade games. Cause there's a bit of a logic system, a bit of minimal programming to set the levels up. So it's not super complicated for somebody to learn. Hmm. And a lot of students had made games. In fact, we had a couple of batches of the game packs way back in the twenties somewhere that were actually designed by, you know, elementary school age kids. Hmm. And uh, the fact that they could actually crank this stuff out was actually pretty interesting that the, it, it was easy enough to use the, you, know, you get somebody that's like 11 years old to write a game. Without right. having to be a you know a master assembly language programmer like it would have been back in our day. This one here is an update to last week. So last week Jim Gary had published this, and this is a conversion of Atari ST game bat our laser chest, which he's converting to MC10, which is a pretty big jump in you know platform strength and power there. Um, but he had done a preview kind of showing it, and here he actually has basically finished the game. Now, we've shown the thing where you move the pieces and you change the angles and it shoots the lasers, but you can actually show near the end here, he actually manages to kill um, one of the shapes here. So I'll just play that little ending. So is this two player or one player? Uh, two, I think. I'm, I'm one yeah. computer or personal, you can do either. But you can see that you're basically the two players are trying to like shoot each other's pieces off, the actual pieces with all these little deflectors and rotational things so. yeah, but how do you know like what's a player and what you can destroy so the little triangle thing is your player right the triangle and the diagonals i think are your deflectors and i think everything else is basically a player piece i think uh, i okay. haven't actually played that much i never played the atari st version originally but i just i just found it fascinating he was taking atari st like a full 16 bit sixty eight thousand base machine and converting it down to an mc10 mm -hmm. game well i'm sure he's losing some graphic and sound fidelity <laughs> <laughs> it's ironic though because this this whole laser deflection thing is something that uh, Paul Thayer is working on in, on his current Coco Bond, which is a Coco Three game. Now it's a bit low res. I, I can't remember what he's using. It's it's not super high res, but it's sixteen color, and he's doing the same laser deflection thing. That's part of the game, along with a bunch of other Coco Bond style and elements combined too. So. Hmm. And the other one that Jim Gary released this week was another adventure game conversion here. Um, fairly nicely presented, nothing super special or anything there, but uh, this was originally from the Club 100 Library of Text Adventures, which is one of those uh, you know kind of cheap. Here's a whole whack load of adventure games written. Is this another MC10. Well, it's pretty well Jim Gary's forte. <laughs> oh, okay, I didn't know if he did anything else or just MC10. He has, but not in a while. Um, he's done some Base Nine stuff. And he's done some Coco specific stuff, um, but he's pretty much hardcore basic, right? That's all he does. 
Yeah, I mean, he has used a couple of ML routines that some other people supplied him with, and he's been using Greg Dion's MC10 basic compiler lately on certain games to get uh, about a three to four times speed increase. Um, and he's really started uh, getting interested in um, Robert Sieg's new graphical tile system that links into basic, where you can it'll basically take the screen and dump it to a, a P mode one equivalent, which is the highest the MC10 can do, but it'll take whatever text characters you put on the screen, redraw them as tiles. And he's got multi-size tiles ranging from 8 by 8 to 32 by 32. And he's, we've shown some animation stuff he did last week. But Jim Gary has been fiddling and converted a couple of his games to use that. And it actually looks pretty decent. And it, it's mm. all written in ML, those core drawing routines. So it actually runs pretty quick. Right. <clears throat> this is uh, Simon WGB. Now, we haven't added his stuff on for quite a while. He was actually part of our first Dragon special too, because he was kind of coming from the game streaming side of things because he streams a lot of retro machines he, and then some modern machines. He goes right from the Playstations and stuff too. And he goes back to Nintendos and everything else. Dragon was his very first computer. Now, he normally has his little cache of about 10 to 15 games that he really likes from the old days and he replays them over and over again, which is why I haven't been featuring his page on the uh, or his YouTube channel, I should say, on, on the show to watch because it's basically the same game you just knew. A month later, he decides to play Tut's Tomb again or whatever. But this time, he actually went and played Fire Force, which is not one he normally does. And I don't know how you guys have actually tried this game. It's got great sound. And this was originally a Dragon game that's been on the Coco as well. Uh, but for the time, for a Coco 1 2 game or a Dragon 32 64 game, it had awesome sound. It was multi track with actual percussion sounds and stuff too. But it is a hard game. You're going to die a lot. You're probably not even going to see the other levels where there's planes and everything else here, to be honest. But for those of you who have not seen the game, I thought I'd play a little bit of it. Anything. You can kind of hear the sound effects in the background there. You can hardly see the one who shoots at you. The controls are a little bit wonky in this one, for those of you who have not tried it. One issue I have. Looks like it has somewhat liberal hitboxes, too. Yeah, <laughs> but you can hear the music track here a bit. Sounds muffled. Is it just his recording, or is that the way it is? Yeah, it's a little bit quiet, unfortunately. But it actually has like a, a multi. It's got a melody. It's got a bass line. It's got a drum percussion style sound for a Coco One and Two. That's pretty impressive. We were used to like the organy generic four voice music player that almost every game used like grabber and sailor man and donkey king and all that there wasn't too many of the ones that actually uses digitized uh, style I, I think they're more uh, you know procedurally based but it actually sounds like a you know primitive version of a sid chip or something like that it's pretty pretty decent stuff of course that doesn't play while you're actually playing the game because you suck your cpu time to nothing and the last one for these here <clears throat> is a site called TGP High Score Runs. I think we have featured them a long time ago, but he basically just picks random retro systems and then just tries to get his best score in a certain, you know, picks a day, picks a game, picks a platform, tries playing it, records his uh, best score and then throws it on. So this was uh, playing Galacticans by Softech. This was a UK-based uh, company that uh, published it originally on the Dragon. It's been converted over the Coco afterwards too. Not the best version of Galaxians I've seen, but... Uh, Still interesting, nonetheless, to take a look for those who have not seen it before. I was surprised me that people make games with the green background. Well, no, I don't know. It just it just seems like it. That's the last color I would pick is that green background. The white pastel one's worse. Right. Uh, look at Puyon no as an example. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like. I mean, you, look, you stare at it in basic, you think you'd want to have another color when you're playing a game. The other thing, too, is you got to remember, too, like a lot of the Dragon games use this color set because they didn't have artifact colors. They had PAL and not uh, NTSC. So there's no artifact colors. If you pick P14, it's black and white. Or you start getting uh, more patterns and an ugly green and purple in the background, if anything. So we, they look actually worse than this. <laughs> we are into least headache inducing here. Yeah, yeah but that's that's kind of what I was wondering, like <laughs> what the other choices were, because to me this is headache inducing. But I guess if you no, that's it's, all you it's got, pleasant. you get It's mellow. It. It's pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and it depends on the game. I mean, some some would have like you can't get rid of the green border. Unfortunately, that's one thing. Like Nick always complains about. 
Right. But yeah. I did see some games that are space games, and they'll use a blue background for the main part of the screen. That doesn't look too bad. I mean, it's not quite space, but at least it looks like you're. So these are up. basically the four colors they got to work with. Yeah, the other one they could dragon. choose would be the white, cyan, magenta, orange. Ooh, that sounds worse. Yeah, I'm it, is. it is. Worse. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, some games, like if you want to do like a, a battle zone or something, using player black and white actually looks fine. In fact, right. their, their black and white was closer to what we would see on a Cocoa 3 with an RGB CM8 monitor with no color artifacting at all. But that mm -hmm. meant if you took a great a Cocoa game that used a bunch of the orange and the blues and you ran on the dragon, it looked like a bunch of vertical stripes. Of black and white that's all it looked like so it looked kind mm -hmm. of mess. you you had to design the game like if you look at like manic minor or jet set willy which were designed for the dragon to design to run on p mode 4 they use like little cross hatching and stuff like that for shading rather than vertical stripes and actually those look pretty good but you run them on the cocoa then now you're getting all the artifacting so you get a big swash of blue mm -hmm. and red all over the place it's, and, it's and that's mess. just due to <laughs> pal and ntsc right yes so they, they they picked the best of the, the you know, what they what they were working with, and we picked the best of what we were working with. Basically, is what happened. The Coco Three kind of solved that, except they didn't sell it in the UK and Europe. <laughs> right. <laughs> with with the RGB, of course. Then they broke the composite by having a completely wrong, different color set for it, as Nick will tell yeah, you. Yeah, that was always weird. I never quite understood that. Yeah, let's call process. it scraps. Yeah, scraps. my only guess. I should have asked Mark. I can't remember. Did I ask Mark this? Maybe I did. Um, I think it had to do with the fact they needed to do composite artifacting backwards compatible with the Coco 3 and the way they had to set up, the way the pallets were set up, they might have had, you know, trying to cut down the chip cost, which Tandy Lewis is doing. Maybe they had to make the composite work that way in order to get artifacting to work. I don't know. If you think they could either pick one color set and then made the other color set match or as damn close as you can get, you know, but they didn't. That's what the PAL version of the Coco 3 does. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's the exact same color set between rgb uh, analog and uh, composite pal right nick i think yep much better <laughs> <laughs> so anyway that's that's the end of the uh, game on news here so uh mark did you want me to go straight into regular news or do you want me to oh, well let you run play the a little intro bumper? yeah well we can try i don't think anyone's gonna hear it from around the world, what you need to know. Get caught up on news with El Curtis. And now a Muppet News Flash. All right, Curtis, it's yours. Okay, thank you. Screen again. So the first one up here is by somebody I think still on the panel, unless he's uh, gone to have his nap. <laughs> So, Ken, I'm going to mute it, and I'll let you just talk while I'm playing it kind of in the background for a little bit if you want to explain exactly what you were doing here. Okay, well, uh, my Tandy Deluxe joystick broke. One of the uh, arms inside broke, so I bought one of the much easier to find and much cheaper to buy IBM PC Junior joysticks and uh, did a transplant so that uh, now my Tandy joystick works fine. And a question that, I have for you is that I know like Rick Ulan, for example, he buys these and then he just changes the connector so that you can run it directly in the Coco. Is the reason you did this instead of that? There's also some wiring that you have to change on the inside. So right. I wanted to keep it as an IBM PC junior joystick because as I collect all kinds of systems, I may someday get an IBM PC junior. Then I'll have a joystick for it as soon as I fix the uh, arm. But yeah, you have all the right it, plastic parts to update the old one. And there's 3D printed models of these parts too. You can get done. I think some mm -hmm. people pretty That's my 3D oh. printer though. Three yeah, and 3D doesn't won't hold up. The ABS hardly holds up. So well, it depends you, what you, you print want, out of. They have that carbon to, fiber stuff now. That's pretty well, good. Right. But you really th this is the good, this is the solution. Get the PC Junior, take the parts, put them in the old cocoa. It's the original Coco, but it's new. Yeah, like and it, it still says Tandy on it rather than saying IBM. So it, it fits with my computer better. But it'll work fine and you're, you're oh, yeah. running again? I've, I've been playing with it for a couple of weeks now. and I was going to say, there's no more excuses better. for low scores in your games. And exactly. Game That's why I'm, all of a sudden, I'm higher up on the, uh, on the um, scoreboards now. Oh, you cool. better be. 
Now you go check out that video on uh, Ken's YouTube site, which of course has systems other than Coco's. I have no idea why, um, but he covers a lot of the <laughs> retro uh, machines here. And you know, this one kind of crosses two different worlds of the PC Junior and the and the Coco. So now the Rick and and Ken does the PC Junior joystick use the same? Like, would you could you plug that directly into Tandy, just changing the cable end, or is there still some wiring no, differences? No, no. What, what they've done differently is the PC uses the variable resistor as a variable resistor. So they feed voltage in and they see what resistance they get back at the PC. The Coco uses it as a potentiometer. So they have plus five on one side, ground on the other, and they see what voltage they get back in the middle. The difference being current is not an issue here. And therefore connection reliability is less of an issue. And it's kind of a better idea. So the, the Coco 1000 uses which version? Neither. It's different. <laughs> of course. Oh, is it? Okay. I, I thought it would sure, be the same yeah. one or the other. Well, no, the Tandy 1000, if I'm not mistaken, the Tandy 1000, you can use a Coco, the Coco joystick with it. But they also made a specific Tandy 1000 craft joystick that looks like exactly the same thing. But I'm pretty sure that you can take a Coco joystick and stick it right into a Tandy 1000 joystick. Well, well, now, it. it is true that you could use a Coco wired joystick as a rheostat and ignore the ground connection. So yeah, you could you could go back to the PC Junior style but you can't jump forward to the Coco style because you don't have the connection on one side of each pot. I don't know. I just know. Um, I remember reading about the 1000 and one of the few peripherals that came forward with the 1000 that from the Coco that would still work was joysticks. Yeah, no, that yeah, would work. The Coco yeah. has more than necessary. That's right, what right. it comes out to. Whereas the PC Junior has less than necessary to use on the Coco <laughs> with that little way of wiring inside. So, but they do it. have the same exact connectors, both five pinned in or six pin. Six five pinned in, yeah. So, you need that six pin for that connector. second button. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up, uh, there's been an update to MAME. And I know uh, Ron Klein has mentioned that this new version of MAME, I think, is already included in the Coco Pi distribution if you get an update for that. But basically, um, and this is mentioned on the World of Dragon forms, I should mention this here. Um, it's a bug fix for emulating the Super Sprite FM Plus board, the one we were just talking about that uh, you know, some of the AG games have been converted to. Um, basically, the way that board works is that you get a secondary display. So you can display the original VDG screen that the Coco normally does, 32 by 16, P-Mode 1, 0 through 4, et cetera. Or you can display the one that's actually controlled by the video chip on the Super Sprite FM Plus board, which gives you 80 columns and more colors and hardware sprites and blah, blah, blah. And there was a bug in the main one here between the Coco and the Dragon that if you initialize it on one or the other, it worked differently and you couldn't control the screen or bring up the wrong screen. It wasn't consistent. So that bug has now been fixed. So if you're doing development for the Super Sprite FM Plus uh, on MAME, you know, as opposed to on the real hardware here, you'll now have a consistent experience between the dragon and the coco which makes it a lot easier for debugging obviously because there's some cool ideas you could do the fact that the two screens are controlled completely separately from each other means you could actually have like dual display you know punch out or something like that or if you wanted to do you know two player games where each player gets to see their own copy of the maze where they're in fighting each other type thing rather than you know sharing a screen or just duplicating it like we do in the coco 3 we have multiple screen outputs but it basically just displays the same thing on every one so this would be more like a commodore 128 where you have two completely independent screens to each other so that is now properly emulated in the latest two or point two four o version of main and should be included in the coco pie for any of those of you who have coco pies so, so is this sprite board having a, a separate video output then um if they can do two different screens that's i think if output, i remember right? correctly it's a it's a poke to switch which one is feeding your current monitor hookup so you can no, but you just switch. said you can use two different monitors so how does it get to the second monitor well uh, i don't know if this is on the final production one i know when when john was originally doing the board you can actually have it go out to the monitor separately in fact when it was originally sold as a commercial product back in the 80s I think that's what they did because you're for an 80 column monitor, you're not going to run on a TV. You're in need of a right. monitor for it. 
But I think the way he set up the version he's selling is that you can actually have the two signals going over the same connector, like the composite on the Dragon, and you can just, you know, set one poke, you switch which one. So it's almost like having a built-in windowing system like OSI Model 2. Uh, but I think I think you can still do this separate one as well. I'd have, I'll have to double check that because, yeah, that's... I know the original did. I can't remember if his. I think it does. I think you have the option to do either or. You can switch it on your main one, or you can have it on the separate. I'll have to double check with John. Can't remember off the top of my head. Thanks for putting me on the spot, Jay. <laughs> I'm so so used to you having the right answer. I figured you'd have it there. Oh too. no, I just make stuff up as I go along. You haven't figured that out yet. Okay, so next up, Carlos Camacho put this up, and this was actually part of the uh, Coco Crew podcast, too, which I'll get to in a second here. But basically, there's a, a project that's been going on for a while called Turbo Rascal, and it's basically a version, it's kind of a take on the Turbo Pascal. It's a Pascal system, and it's the ID and everything else. It's a cross-platform thing. You run on a modern machine, and you compile down to, and he's got a lot of targets that are out there right now. Uh, there's 6502 cores, there's uh, Z80, Z80 cores, um, there's different you know display chips, etc. And basically you do this and it, it's a full-blown compiler to assembly. So it actually, he wrote it originally to do stuff like demos on C64s and those are pretty CPU intensive. So it's not a, a poor man's compiler by any stretch of the imagination. And he's expressed interest in porting this to other platforms. Now the screenshot that Carl's brought up here is of a millipede clone done for the VZ200, which uses the same VDG chip that the Dragon and the Coco 1 and 2 used, um, but it had a Z80 processor in it. So he's already got the core to handle the VDG chip, and he was wondering about you know getting some people that know 6709 quite well to help him get an actual compiler for the 6709. And there's been a huge discussion. I'm not going to go through his 43 comments on it already, but going through this all here, and it looks like he is starting to get some help on doing that. So hopefully we'll see another you know compiler that will be Coco specific and VDG specific. Uh, yeah, I think up. I still owe him an answer on that. If I remember yeah, I, I noticed you'd pumped in and then Simon Jonasson's pumped yeah. in. He said about, you know, I can't get it to auto start in MAME and I can't get it to load a disk in color in Coco 2. I'm like, I know that works. So I yeah, he forgot the disk ROM is what I gathered. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I when he said that, I'm like, I know that works. I've done it. So I I was gonna figure it out and respond, but maybe somebody else really helped him. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, this owns a lot of potential. Like, I, I, it depends on how active he gets into it and stuff here. Like, he does like the six and nine instruction set from seeing the comments because he's kind of gone well, through I, it a bit. I saw this like I want to say years ago, at least a year ago. And yeah, I the thought, project's wow. been around that long. Yeah, I said I thought this because at that time I was using Pascal for something else. I don't remember playing with it. And I was like, man, this would be great if you could do this with for a Coco, you know. But then I, number one, it wasn't for Coco. And number two, it didn't support Coco 3. So I was like, eh, so I kind of dropped it. But this looks interesting. Yeah, I mean, the fact if you can get the Coco 1 and 2 1 working, you know, to cover the VDG modes and stuff like that. I mean, that there's a you know, pretty big market. There's a lot of Coco 1 and 2s out there. But right. there's nothing to stop him from adding on the Coco 3 after, just like he did VIC-20 and then Commodore 64. I mean, it's... right. There's nothing preventing it. And then he'll have the 609 core done already, so then he just has to do the gimme graphics modes and mm -hmm. interrupt controller, mm -hmm. et cetera. So. so speaking of Coco Crew uh, podcast, they released episode 80, which actually did talk about that specific project. They actually brought it up. And this got released about a week before the discussion on Facebook started. Um, so some other stuff that was covered this month, uh, John went over his uh, joystick testing development in more detail. In fact, he did a new YouTube video, which I'll be showing a little bit too. Um, where you kind of redesigned it. You kind of think it, in the first one, he had, you know, the spaces between resistors were a little too small, so it kind of didn't quite match what he wanted to do. <clears throat> uh, Neil reviews Soviet Block, and you were talking earlier, Rick, about uh, not having any stereo effect games. That game that Nick, that, uh, Nick reviewed actually is one of the two or three examples we have, where mm -hmm. the sound will pan to the left and right speakers as you're moving your little Tetris block left and right. So by coincidence, there's your answer right there. Um, now, the discussion topic was actually an interesting one. I actually did send them an email response to this one. So it's talking about, basically, the discussion is on how expensive Cocos are getting to be on eBay and stuff. You know, is this good or bad type thing? <clears throat> and it's it's a complicated subject because it depends what you're in the Coco for. If you're in the Coco to get a Coco so you actually can, like, relive the nostalgia, do programming, playing the old games, whatever else, the prices of Coco 3s right now are ludicrous. I mean, you can... 
buy five Raspberry Pi systems for the price of a single Coco 3 with 128K and nothing else. I mean, they're going for $250 now for a 128K. You want a 512. That's like, cheap. If, you, if the one that right. they know works is 3 to 350. Yeah. And if you want, I, I've seen like, ones. Yeah. I've seen ones that they don't even know they work and people are paying 250, 275. And that's just nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that was basically Boise. Boise is just like, this is stupid. This has got to stop type thing. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, some people are doing them as collectibles. The Coco 3 is a lot rarer than the Coco 1 2. There's only maybe one and a half million made, as far as I know, looking at serial numbers. And there's at least 3 million Coco 1 and 2s out there. And that's not including all the European ones and Australian ones. So it's definitely a rarer machine and it's more in demand. So if you're a collector and you're in it to make money, well, then I guess this is capitalism at work, right? You're, you're buying them to flip. You're getting them, you're cleaning them up, making them look pristine, and then you sell them for twice of what you bought them for. Yeah, and I, mean, that's, I learned a long time ago, complaining about the price of something uh, is useless. It's basically need comes to. down... Yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to somebody's going to pay that price or they're not. And if they do, then you lose out on it. So you got to decide what is it worth to you. And that's what you pay. For. You know, I mean, that's that's it's just, like I said, it's capitalism. That's just the way it works. Well, we need to encourage the C market where computers that aren't worth collecting are still worth selling. And well, they I'm are. not I mean, sure how to do that. Well, but, that's even I mean, a well, lot of the computers on eBay aren't what I would call collector's pieces, but they're still selling for decent money. We're right. But on the other hand, machines that are worth keeping aren't, that aren't worth, if it's not worth a collector keeping, then it's at the hands of whatever scrap merchant has it. And there really needs to be some place in the middle for things that I could fix that will never be, the nine hundred dollar cocoa that you know some people want, and I just can't figure out how to see. For me, there's that. a third option now, which has just started thanks to people like Pedro Pena, for example, the guy we had on at the very beginning of the show. He's created a cocoa three duplicate motherboard. Most of the chips you can still get. He's got a new salt chip now. There's the uh, Gimme X from Ed. Once it gets into full production, we can actually make brand new cocoa threes that are you know fully compatible with the old ones and with enhancements. So for the people that actually want to run Cocos as opposed to collect them to flip for money or just to have in a collection and never really you know, turn them on type thing, we are going to have this other option of where you can buy a brand new, just manufactured, absolutely clean board, all the chips fully compatible with some enhancements like, you know, the Gimme X with extra modes and two meg memory upgrades or eight meg memory upgrades, six through nines built in. As uh, Pedro was mentioning, it have a built-in USB keyboard adapter, et cetera. There is another alternative besides trying to get, you know, for collecting and, and then you're going to pay money. If you're collecting, you're going to be paying lots of money for stuff that's rare. That's just the way it works. But for people who actually want to use the Cocoa 3 and can't afford these new eBay prices, that might actually end up being cheaper and better in the long run because it's actually got extra features. And the it's problem all brand is, though, new what's parts. that going to cost, though? Well, Pedro what's said it? that board should be well under $100. And you can get, you know, PIAs and stuff for pretty cheap still. Six or nines are pretty cheap still. The salt chip he's actually made himself. Um, well, it'll saying, be like, less than four hundred dollars US that you're paying on eBay. By yeah, far. but what about a case? I mean, what are you going to do for a case? What are you going to do? Don Strong's working on a case. He said a Coco Three case will be roughly around seventy-five to hundred dollars. And yeah. then you got to buy a keyboard. If you get a keyboard from like Zipster, that's what one hundred and fifty. Well, if you keyboard. want a specific Coco keyboard, but remember Pedro's got this little adapter. Buy any generic USB keyboard at any uh, okay. computer store. So you've, you've got lots of options and it also makes it a bit more customizable because some people will want an original style Cocoa keyboard like that. Or some other people might want a full-blown PC keyboard. And if you can reprogram function keys because you're using it for development and you, you want to hit one key to do it a complete editor or assembler compiler or something like that, you can do that too. We've had that in the Cocoa marker before. So it's, I it's, think this will actually help solve the problem in the long run. It's still a ways off from having all the pieces together and all manufactured. Still well, the other thing too is you got to consider probably in, 10 years from now when we're our our generation that grew up with this stuff is older like getting ready to retire older it's probably going to plummet in price you're probably going to be able to pick up coco 3s for i'm song. not sure on that i've one thing i've noticed we've even noticed here on the show and we've gone talking uh, to certain people that have kind of like joined in the show 
there's a lot of younger people getting interested in the retro stuff because if you get a modern computer and you want to try to learn how to say an operating system works, forget it. You'll have no idea. It's too complicated for one person to grasp. And some of these younger people, like the guy that did the VDR, 3D VDR glasses playing Phantom Slayer and Dungeons Dagger, like Ken mentioned, he's what, 30 years old, I think? Got into the dragon way after the dragon, you know, the dragon came or died before he was born. And he got really into it because this is something he can make hardware for that it's a simple enough machine you can interface with it. Or some of the people that are doing programming are going, you know, I understand how to program this machine because I can figure out all the hardware in one shot. Try to do that on a modern PC. Can't do that either because you're dealing with you know, whatever library driver somebody else came up with. So I'm not sure it's going to die down quite as much as some people think. I think there's enough of this. The younger people can learn how to do electronics, can do how to do simple programming and stuff easier on some of these older machines. And I mean, we're seeing younger people still buying Apple IIs and Commodore 64s, like the Commodore Minis and stuff here. I mean, they're selling like hotcakes. So I'm not sure it's going to die down when we die off or retire or whatever. I think it will go down somewhat, I think, obviously, but I don't think it's going to disappear. Yeah, we've I hope, given I hope up you're on... right. I'd love to see it, but I, I don't know. I just, like, I know, like, my son, I've tried several times to get him interested in this older stuff and zero. Like they just, his generation just doesn't get it. <laughs> We've so. given up on being practical. Now we have to be like model trains. This is like. How... Yeah, it's like people collect old typewriters, which is a bit of a fad too. Like, yeah, I personally wouldn't do it. I have no use for a manual typewriter. Well, it's like in a Coco, I can write a program where I understand everything that's being done. Where on even a pie. I'm calling in libraries to do this, that, the other thing. And I have no idea what they're doing. They just give me a result. Yep. And if there's and a bug I'm, in that library, good luck. Well, I'm not really programming anymore. I'm just asking other people to give me answers that I can pass on. And it's sort of, I'm an editor. I'm not a programmer anymore. You know, it's... You're a script kitty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting debate topic. I mean, the fact that they covered the kind of the, you know, they, the flipper, I guess you'd call it, the guy who's you know getting it, fixing it up, selling it for twice as much, is just doing it to make money essentially. And then there's the hardcore collectors who just want every model of everything. Um, and, and, and my problem is, if he can't flip it, he's throwing it in the garbage. Okay, that's more. That's what you're getting at. Yeah, but that's a good yeah. Point. Well, that may be true, but I mean, I don't know. Like I, I my person, and I don't want to get into a huge diatribe here, but like my thing with eBay that I hate is when they're like, oh, I turned it on and it made a click, so it must work. No, it doesn't mean it works. Right. <laughs> you know? yeah. But yet, they'll still sell those things for 100 150 bucks, maybe more, depending on you know how good the case is. And I'm just like, who is paying that kind of money for something they don't even know if it works? That's just the part about eBay that kills me. Like, I don't know. Well, I mean, Ped, Pedro Payne, in one of the videos that he's got, we'll get into a bit later here, he actually paired. <laughs> he got a Coco 3 on eBay. Um, 1986 gimme, uh, 128k, 115 bucks didn't work. Right. And the guy Ted did test it, he plugged in TV and it just it didn't work. When he got it, he found it was the one big capacitor down by the power supply. That was the only thing wrong with it. He desoldered it, replaced it, works fine. Oh, I believe that. I, I so, believe most of them, most of them that don't work probably can get repaired. My my problem is that it's obvious, at least to me, that these sellers are doing as little as possible to see if these things work or have mm -hmm. have actually see, checked to see if they work. No, they don't. So they use the cop out of, oh, I can't hook it up to a TV to check. It's like, come on. I mean, come on, like $5 worth of cable will hook you up to a TV. You know what I mean? One of those F-type connectors, you're done. So that's just, I don't know. That's one of the things about computers, specifically on eBay, that really... I don't know. Yeah. It just upset me. Yeah. No, I, I'm not a big fan of the flippers myself. I mean, for me, I get more fun using my Coco than I'd ever get collecting them. I would never have one sitting here gathering dust because that's just not me. Oh, yeah. I, I'm I, the want, same I want the nostalgia feel right. of like using it, you know, right. and, and the emulators don't do that for me either. I mean, the emulators I will use for large project development stuff because it's faster, but I don't get that same kick of endorphins that I get from doing it on the real thing. I just don't. Play testing games, running in, <laughs> or working on Nitrous Nine. I just it's not it's not as interesting to me, Nick. I'm sure you feel the same way. We've talked about that. Before. I think it's... if you could, I think if we could get a 
a solution and I've seen stuff that's close but not exact where you could take like a say a pie put it into a, a case that's identical to a cocoa have an identical cocoa uh, keyboard that you know does its thing I think that that would fool most people but yeah, and I've seen a few people experiment with that yeah it just doesn't exist yeah. yet yeah. And I've got to admit, it would be interesting to write a basic game and say if it could just run 20 times faster, it would be fun, and then crank the knob up 20 times <laughs> and, you know, play with it. I mean, I would love that with my old basic games. Some of them would be really cool. Oh, you mean like on an emulator, just crank it up in speed, yeah? Yeah, oh, hey, I yeah, wrote this yeah. thing in this basic and look at this, and now I go... Argh. Yeah, right. I guess it depends where you're approaching from. Like one of the things I like doing is optimizing the old games, like either the six or nine, or even just optimizing six, eight, or nine. Now, somebody else's code. And to me, more the fun for me is like how far could that machine have been pushed if we took the time and really learned how the thing worked under the hood? Because a lot oh, of these yeah. games are cranked uh, out as quick as they could. You know, it's Christmas. We got to get the sales out there. Yep. Don't worry about writing it as optimized as you can. We need to get sales now before get somebody else clones this game. Yep, get so for work. me, the nostalgia part is I want that old slower hardware and I want to see how fast I can get it to run. I think right. you're kind of pointing that out to us with the, the whole nitrous thing. Well, yeah, I mean, and, I uh, actually did a, I did, I did a little thing here just about two months ago where I actually booted up stock OS9 level two from Tandy with Multiview. And I was comparing A, what it looks like and then how fast it is. And I'd forgotten how much we've improved that damn thing. I mean, both from an aesthetic purpose, you know, with like, thank you for the trash can, Nick. Um, <laughs> no for G Shell. But also, <laughs> <laughs> also for the raw speed. I mean, just listing a text file to the screen is five times faster now on the same hardware. That's not even using the 6 or 9 upgrade. It's just way, way faster. Graphics, drawing screen routines like you know clearing the screen of a color on a graphic screen or drawing bars you know filled in color bars and stuff like that is many times faster on the six and a nine double it again for the six or nine all using period correct hardware from 1986 so that for me is part of the hobby i find interesting is, and, and i think a lot of the other people and others some of the other uh, retro computers like apple and stuff is now that we've learned all these tricks over the last 40 years Use them. See what you can do that, you know, people said, oh, there's no way you can do this on a Coco. And nowadays you go, oh, well, maybe you can. Like Gatecrasher from Nick was actually one of those experiments because said people said, there's no way you can do a full 3D game. You can just do wireframe. It's as far as it'll ever go. Sockmaster came out with Gloom, then Gloom 2. Nick kind of borrowed the elements of that engine and made Gatecrasher. All of a sudden we had a Wolfenstein 3D style game with digitized sound effects, 3D, the whole shebang. So that's what I find interesting. And I'm not a collector. I mean, I'm not going to spend $350 for 128K Coco 3 to do that kind of thing. I just want to get it fairly cheap and, you know, develop based on that original hardware model. That's where Pedro Pena's replacement board, replacement salt chip, that's a chip that's custom. You can't get anywhere else. The Gimme X, I mean, yeah, I can turn on the extra modes and kick up the speed and stuff there too, but I can also run it at the original speed. And well, then no, that replaces the one have... other chip you can't get new anymore. Yeah, the guy. Is, is, that, so, is he going to use it? the Gymex in his design, or are you just saying you could get a Gymex to go with his board? I'd have to ask Pedro that. It sounds like when we originally talked about it, he just wanted to get it to be able to run with the original chips, but you can't get those chips. And once those chips die, you're screwed. Right. right. Um, but the fact he's now including the USB keyboard adapter as part of the main plus plus board or whatever he's going to end up calling it. I think if you worked with Eddie, you probably could get it so that, you know, the wiring and stuff for the Gimme is set up for the Gimme X and you could actually put that right in the board as opposed to needing this little satellite board and attaching to the RAM and blah, blah, blah. So mm. we'll have to see where it goes with that. But yeah, I mean, there's some options now coming out that will solve a lot of this. We've got 3D well, cases just like of the Coco 3 like... case being made, new motherboards, replacement salt chips, replacement gimmies. Now we get to the point where we can make our own Coco 3 or Coco 3 Plus, and who cares what eBay is doing? They want to oversell them for $500 for 120 Coco 3? Screw it, I'll buy a brand new one, modern made, for half that or less. So, so now you've raised the concept of original stock. In other words, an emulator that is in no way better than the Coco 3 but isn't a Coco 3. That would be... Hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of well, different the ways you can take it. Is, so. yeah, the problem with uh, with a design like that, and he's... We, we almost are at the point where we have it completely licked now, but when I say we, I mean the community. 
that you if you're going to make a Coco 3 or a Coco 1, 2, whatever, any actually any retro hardware, in my opinion, you have to have a modern ability to replace every chip in that motherboard. Yes. And right now, the only chip that we don't have is 6809. And there's a project out there. I don't know if you guys ever talked about it on the show or not. Called Turbo, Turbo 09. 09. Yeah. Yeah. Which I believe, at least for Coco 1, 2, you could drop that in and just have it run at a slower speed and then that, see that what, from what i understand isn't quite ready yet the drop it's in not, replacement it's, it's close though yeah yeah there is new 6809s you can buy i can't remember the name of the company it's not motorola it's somebody else is doing it but they're expensive yeah that's um, what i'm saying like like long term my, my point yeah. is like we need something that's a fairly long-term solution yeah and that's where the gimme x comes in that's where right yeah pedro's uh, replacement salt chips and other yeah, because you need that and, for all three cocos. Well, he also did the uh, the DAC chip too, didn't he? Does he have a replacement as well? Oh, that's the or? same thing. That's the same thing. That's oh, a okay. Chip. Yeah. All right, because that controls the joystick, the, the analog, analog, everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Audio, the whole bit. Yeah, that's all one ch custom chip to India done that you couldn't get anywhere else. So. Now, James Jones mentions, and this is true, that Turbo 9 people, it's, it's, it's not quite, the Turbo 9 people are not shooting for cycle compatibility, are they? No, they're no, not. They're not. They're actually Which means faster. if you're trying to do, like, you know, specifically time games using timer interrupts or, you know, right. sick cycle counts to do certain effects there, that's not going to work great. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm saying this could be like speed runners. Well, my, my, thought is, is exactly. my thought is that you could have, like, a Turbo 9 that you could, you could, have a switch or some sort maybe even under software control but have it switch so that it runs at near coco speed and most stuff would run because it's not cycle counting but then That'd have a script switch a lot you, of games yeah. yeah but then have um a you know a switch you can you could kick it up to whatever i think it's i think they have it designed to run to like 20 megahertz can you imagine 20 megahertz 6809 what you could do with that but see, a true emulator could do cycle perfect emulation, and then you could crank it up from there. Well, they're not trying to emulate a 6809. Their purpose was to well, make I, a 6809 core, you know? I'm just having my wish list. I want a Coco 3 that's exactly Coco 3, even though it has nothing yeah. to do. Well, it's like, yeah. like OVCC can overclock to 511 megahertz. Right. It, it depends. I mean, everyone's going to have a bit of a different perspective as to what they want. Right. I've told you guys what I want because um, my nostalgia and, you know, trying to push the old hardware is more important to me than, you know, having an overclock to the nines, modern one with modern keyboard, modern everything else. I mean, if I wanted that, I would just run name or VCC or XROR personally. Um, but I, I get a kick out of running the original hardware and I get a kick out of pushing the original hardware to its limit. So it's, it's an interesting discussion, though. I think I need a ladder to get out of this rabbit hole. <laughs> I'll get you out of it right now. Boom. There we go. <laughs> so next up, and I'll play this in its entirety because it's only a minute and a half. So this is John Linville's update on his uh, joystick tester for the Tandy 1000 and the uh, Coco joysticks. We're just kind of talking about, you know, the connectors and stuff here too. So. All right. Welcome Coco Cruisers and other Coco enthusiasts. Um, previously, I made a video showing the Prototype for my uh, joystick tester, which you can see here. And I said I was going to respin the board, and that's what you see in front of you. So they're basically the same circuit. Um, the, uh, the footprint for the resistors was a little too small on the prototype. And the biggest difference, of course, is on, uh, on this board, I've got a PCB mount joystick connector. A DIN 6 has this there <laughs> label. Um, and of, of course, on this one, the switch, uh, I've got a, a switch that fits and works. Uh, so, very exciting stuff. Just thought I'd let you guys know it was out here and available. And like I said, I can uh, turn it on. So you see the light indicating the power. There's a joystick. And as I move the joystick back and forth, you can see the various lights. I don't know, it's a little. It's a little bright in the room. Maybe you don't totally see the lights very easily, but there you go. And uh, this foot joystick only has one button, so you're only going to see <laughs> the one but test button light up. But I'm pretty sure that'll work when there's a second button as well. Anyway, uh, probably need to get another joystick out <laughs> for some testing. But for now, 
this is how it's working. Appreciate your interest. And um, I hope you enjoyed the video. Okay. So that's his little update. So he's got his little resistor thing fixed up and stuff here too. Um, I think he was actually asking on Facebook to see how many people would be interested in getting this, you know, if you want to do a lot of testing and stuff rather than have to keep on plugging and plugging from your Coco itself and possibly wearing out the connector. You can just have this on the side type thing. Yeah, but how many like, people have that many joysticks to test? Rick Ulan does. Well, really? I would I would have I would have three of them because I would probably leave a couple of them in Goodwills as I tested joysticks here and there. So yeah, because you bought a whole batch of ones that you're converting from the Oh, yeah, I, I, I resell things. So if I see anything interesting that looks like a joystick, I would kind of like to just see if it looks yeah, like Yeah, the fact that this fun. is battery offer means, means you can take this into the Goodwill with you and quickly test the joystick and make sure it works before you buy it. And, and forget it. You and could, but so I, I my, my question is like, <laughs> I mean, what's he going to sell these for? Does he have a price in mind? Right, right. Because so I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I can't imagine being much. Parts cost isn't very high from what I'm seeing. So, yeah, if it's cheap, yeah. It's just definitely not for everybody, but you know, for people that do do a lot of testing or are, are reselling joysticks like Rick is, that it would save them a bit of time and wear and tear on the cocoa connectors. Right. Well, looks period cor correct. Huh? Well, and nowadays, if you bought it, <laughs> yeah. you bought it. So, you know, test it before you leave the store. Otherwise, that's the best thing because I'm not going to haul my cocoa down to a Goodwill or something here to go test the joystick. Right. Sure yeah. right. Well, the other problem. The well, the other problem too is like, I mean, reality nowadays is you're not going to find these at a Goodwill or very seldom. So you're going to end up buying it somewhere, eBay, whatever. So you're going to take it the way it comes. I don't anyway. know. Some people seem to have a lot of luck with Goodwill. So I don't know how. Maybe really? certain areas of the country know, or don't. something where I mean, they can just walk in. Oh, here's a cocoa two and a cocoa three. Right on. Five bucks each. <laughs> <laughs> I have never, I have never seen a retro right. computer right. in a Goodwill. And all never. I find in Goodwill is DVD players. Yeah, well, now I mean, I've seen I like see like, like uh, Sega Genesis's and stuff like that, but never a retro computer. Never I'll give you an example. That. Amigo Aaron from the Amigos channel went into his West Virginia small town equivalent of Goodwill, the hillbilly flea market, as he calls, it, and he picked up a Coco Three for like twenty bucks. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean that's the thing we used. Goodwill is a generic, but nowadays Goodwill is has a internet division that gets all their good stuff. And so when I say Goodwill, I mean miscellaneous thrift stores and Salvation Armies and occasionally a Goodwill. And, you know, someone dumped the $600 ultra fine precision through 35 millimeter camera in with the digitals. And I bought it for 12 bucks and sold it for 690 kind of thing so you're the flipper you're the flipper yeah you're the problem eric you oh, no, I'm, I'm trolling the bottom <laughs> hey I, I got my second cocoa and third cocoa from a goodwill in reno nevada uh, on you got 30 bucks for a cocoa two and a cocoa one this one from a goodwill that's in my soon oh no, this one the yellow one in a goodwill last week so i'm i'm looking for cocoa twos to test hardware on and uh there is one. Yeah. Doesn't work. Imagine Jay, that. Jay, I suspect that it is where you live because I've heard there's some certain stores that seem to get cocos like almost regularly. I don't know where the hell they're getting them from because yeah, I've never I seen them either. up here either. But some people do, and some people can pick them up. You know, every couple months they get a coco. Out of yeah, I mean, I, I I go into the Goodwill like I used to. I should say I used to go into Goodwill like maybe every six weeks or so just to see, and it got so it's gotten so bad like of wasting my time going in that store that i can't tell you the last time i went into one because yeah. there's just never anything there worth well, that i want to look at i think the problem since covid is everybody is reselling from goodwill so uh, <laughs> you know, good luck with all of that yeah Anyway, next up is an interesting one brought up by Alan Huffman on the Coco Facebook group. So he mentions that um, there's this episode of Atari Archive uh, about the history of Magic Card, which is a programming card for the Atari 2600 VCS. And it kind of goes into a bit of the history of it. So if you guys are interested in the history of the VCS and, and programming on it, you can definitely watch the whole thing. They have a uh, keyboard but... for it? Pardon? They have a keyboard for it? Like, how do you program in a VCS without a keyboard? Well, that's the interesting thing on this one here. So this company that made the Magic Card. So this originally um, was made by a company called Computer Magic, which later renamed itself to Comavid. 
And it's a programming development card that was originally constructed in 1981, and then they started selling it in 1982. And it mentions there were three people that were kind of involved in this project. They all worked for Fermilab, which I think Eddie Kuntz also worked at. So there's multiple Coca connections here, as you'll hear in a second. Um, but basically, he built this little cartridge that would plug into the cartridge slot, and then the actual cartridge plug into that, and you could actually, you know, read memory and off the ROMs while it's running and figure out where it is and, you know, kind of debug mm -hmm. and figure out how to program for the Atari 2600. So what he ended up doing is he ended up buying a Coco One and hooking that up to the card and then hooking that up to the Atari VCS and he'd do the programming from the Coco onto the VCS. And uh, they actually sold this as a commercial product for several years. So I'll play a little clip of it here, which kind of mentions this in, in passing. It doesn't go into like extravagant detail, but just so you guys can hear about it. Of the three, Bronstein was certainly notable for his skills in figuring out how the hardware worked. Interested in the VCS? Oh, you're going to stick a commercial in You started with Yoga for Beginners. <laughs> now you've moved into advanced inversion. I hate YouTube. I really do. YouTube! 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 Bronstein decided to reverse engineer the entire console using a kit of his own design. This box plugged into the cartridge slot and had a connector for a game cartridge to be plugged into it. From there, Bronstein could alter bytes from the game cart's code using the diodes on the box. Eventually, Bronstein would purchase a TRS-80 color computer and use it as a development system by forcing the 6509 microprocessor 6, in that 5, machine 9, that. to compile 6502 compatible code. He would describe Beale as the professional one and Gaines as the creative one. But so yeah, that, that was just, it's a brief mention in the history there, but that's kind of interesting that, you know, one of the main people doing development for this 2600 as a third party actually, you know, did the development on a Coco. So he's actually rewriting the ROMs on the fly with that thing? Um, I think he, it was more for testing ROM code and then he'd burn it with a regular EEPROM. Oh, okay. Burn is my understanding. Um, but the fact that they used the Coco as the cross development system using the 6809, not 6509, as they said in the video. Um, <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. To cross compile to across assemble, I should say, to 6502 code. Sounds uh, familiar about with something I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been done before. I mean, I, I know the 6809 was used for 6502 cross assembly for multiple companies um, on multiple right. platforms, actually, because it was a pretty powerful chip to, to do compilers in. Right, because we had more than that yeah. in terms of registers and so forth to... Yeah, because I've I've seen I've seen Z80 compile cross compilers on the 689. I've seen 6800, of course, because that's not compatible. I mean, instruction set wise, it's somewhat compatible, but it's not binary compatible. So I've seen multiple ones where it's being used. But because uh, we had the best 8 bit chip of the lot, that was the one they used until the 16 bit chips got popular. Yeah, you got an extra stack and some extra registers. And doesn't the Z80 yeah. have like a bunch of registers though? I thought it had like. Eight it does, but registers. they're very specific. I mean, Nick can tell you yeah. this. Like, you can uh, only do certain instructions with certain registers. It's not like a generic, we can do an LAA. Oh, pick, what do you want? X, Y, U, S. Right. It would be like, and, you want to use LAA? You have to use X. You want to use add? You have to use. You know, and uh, everything is, this register operates on that register. There is no register operates on RAM. Forget that. <laughs> uh, As I recall. It's, it's, this register operates on that register. So you have to have the right register and you have to have two of them. Yeah. Nick, Nick can speak more to that because he just actually did a coding project on the on the Z80 here recently. So never again. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's annoying because some commands um, don't set the condition codes either. So you're going along, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I, I reckon the zero flag will be set after I do this. You test for it. You nope. think you've done everything wrong, but then you look it up. Oh, uh, A does it, but B doesn't, you know, so it's just silly things like that. We should have had you on when we were talking to that Spectrum guy, Nick. You could have piped up a few times there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the next ones here I'm just going to briefly touch on because Pedro already talked a lot about this here. Um, so this was his first of two updates he did about his USB Coco circuit. This is the one where he got the shift key working. Uh, using some suggestions from uh, Mr. Dave, 6 or 9 has been in the chat earlier. I don't know if he's still there or not. So thanks to, to Mr. Dave. I think he's still in the chat. Um, but basically solved the shift problem. And then he does a second, I won't play these because like I said, we already had a discussion with him, but uh, 
They need a third one here. And this is where he's hot swapping like a PS2 keyboard and a USB keyboard and a wireless keyboard. And, you know, all while the Coco staying on, the Coco keyboard still running just fine on its own. And you're instantly switching between that, the different PC keyboards and doing both at the same time. Like actually briefly shows, you know, typing on both keyboards simultaneously and the keys are coming up from both. So that definitely does prove that that, that all works. Um, and he had the ship zero, the caps lock. He demonstrates that too. So it's a, it's a pretty cool project. I like having the option of, of not having to unplug or shut it off. Like the older ones, Rick, you can probably remember like the ones that Chris Hawks did and cloud nine, I think like the AT and the right. PS2 keyboards, you had to basically shut the machine down if you wanted to switch back to a Coco keyboard, right? We had to do that. You have yeah, to do yeah. that in IBM PCs. Yeah. You had to hard boot the keyboard. And so he's yeah, yeah, the like two you did the USB you don't. Yeah. PS2, no, yeah. the PS2 you had to like if you if you unplug right. a PS2 keyboard, you had to restart the computer. Yep. Get it Same with the mouse too. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So that's that's kind of cool. And the last one is one we touched on when we talked to him. So he picked up for 115 bucks this uh color computer three. It powers on but has video issues, which he shows at the beginning where it's just kind of a fuzzed out garbage. And, uh, but you can tell that it's something clicked, like the relay clicks when you turn it on, et cetera. So he actually goes through and, and he figures out that the one big cap is bulging on one side. And then when he takes it off, you can see how badly, <laughs> what bad shape the cap's in. <laughs> but basically he was figuring he might have to replace the salt chip and a bunch of other things to turn out just the cap. And then it's running hundred percent after that. So it's, and he actually does this, not as here's a video showing you how to fix a big cap. He does this, like, here's a Coco three. It doesn't work as advertised turns it on shows you what it does and then he does the whole debugging process live while he's recording right it's, it's still only 20 minutes i mean he figured the whole thing out within 20 minutes here but uh, he was speculating some other things that might have to get fixed and all this there's another guy so, so, called uh necroware that does a lot of stuff like that really interesting to watch yeah. so let me get this straight if you whack a whole butt ton of ac into a coco it makes bands on the screen and does weird video <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty interesting enough for you hardware guys out there, or especially beginner hardware people that are trying to figure out how to fix. Maybe I finally got an affordable Coco 3 on eBay because it doesn't quite work. This, this type of video will help you do some of the troubleshooting and stuff. So, and of course, they're available as a resource on, on our Discord as well. You can ask Rick, you can ask uh, Pedro and some of the, uh, Dave Berry and uh, some of the other hardware experts there. If you're having trouble trying to get a machine running, they'll be able to help guide you for what to check for type thing. So public service announcement. Tandy glued all of their large capacitors to the motherboard with hot glue. And it now looks like dried up snot. <laughs> that's not capacitors leaking. That's the way they glued all the big capacitors down. Yep. Nothing now in this case here, here that's what Pedro originally thought. He said, yeah, you see all this brown oh, gunk yeah. over here? That's yeah. the glue. And then he's taking a close look. Wait a sec. There's a bit of a bulge on this one side here. And then he took a look on the underside and it's corroded like hell. So then he, when he desolders, you can see like the whole bottom of the cap's kind of gone and <laughs> it's leaked through mm. and stuff. So, but yeah, it's really cool seeing the full debugging process, not just like, here's how you replace this. This actually teaches you to figure out what's wrong with the machine right. in the first place. So. Next up, this was an interesting one. So this is an Italian um show La Machina del Tempo mm -hmm. yeah which translates to actually did write it down this time finally the, the live machine time machine okay. the live oh, time man. machine so you'll notice the date in the left column there where his chat room is saying December of 1982 so what he does on this show from what I gather is he picks a random month and a random year and then he decides to just show off some games from machines that were popular at the time so hmm. he goes through like a Vic 20 game and he goes through some other games and he decided to pick two on the Coco 1 and one of them was Dale Lear's Firecopter, which is a three-dimensional, one of the early ones. And then he also picked Doodlebug, I think, was the other one. So definitely we want to turn on your translation, closed captioning on this if you want to be able to see what he's actually saying out loud. Um, but it was just kind of fun seeing somebody that was obviously not that familiar with the Coco, you know, trying out these games. And he, if I understood some of the translation correctly, he was pretty impressed with the 3D effects of Firecopter. Um, and Doodlebug, he thought, was a pretty fun game. I don't think he's ever played the original Ladybug arcade game it's been based on, because he was talking about how it was like Pac-Man, and yeah, I guess roughly it is, but the turnstiles and the, the bonus and the extras and the special and the hearts and all that kind of stuff. There's quite a bit of stuff there that's not in Pac-Man. Go and hit it's the uh, cool wait, Ladybug. Colors. Yeah, go hit the uh, fire cop. Can you get into the gameplay a little bit? 
Because sì, I don't think I've ever uh, seen that. In questo modo qui, insomma, Elzy, get those colors. Uh, he's running an yeah. emulator, and I think he's running uh, RGB uh, versus yeah, composite. Yeah, you know, a lot of people yeah. do. Yeah. Ho configurato. It's not skill, good, right? Nick. The tie got it. Skill. Yep. Yeah. He's running NTSC composite, Nick, so it's whatever the hell color he decided to fire up that <laughs> And he doesn't Never know the, the reset color. matching uh, so, trick. Perché mi fa giocare con due giocatori? Player one. Vabbè, proviamoci. So you got planes, it looks like. You're flying around, I'm guessing. Allora, come Your helicopter, you got to put out fires the yeah. and then shoot the fire bugs that are lighting the fires and shoot the guards that are trying to prevent you from preventing the fire. So there's a fire bug. You're shoot him. What's the little dude Lighting fires, he's got a little lighter. He's got the little incendio. So basically, there's, there's this group of you know, assassin guards and, and fire bugs that are going around trying to light your entire city on fire. <laughs> Stop that, as long as oh, you so can. all these are supposed to be buildings and stuff, these yes. blocks. Oh, okay, I got you. I was trying to figure out what all the blocks were supposed to be. Huh. Yeah, that's pretty neat. It's actually a fun so game. Um, when we, when we did our interview with Dale Lear uh, before he passed away, he, he, he talked about this one because this is one of his earlier ones. Now, does this force you into a certain area or are you able to move around freely? You're free, free flying around. It does wrap, like you'll see the same patterns. Oh, okay. You can go wherever you want. But you can only fly forward into the sides. You can't go backwards. So you okay. you have to if you if, if you have something behind you that's getting really high, I'll say fire level critical, like the buildings about to burn down. Then it's up to you to fly forward to go catch up to it. And when it wraps around, to put right, it right, wrap around to it, yeah. <laughs> and man, does this game get hectic? Especially when you got about five fires that are all critical level. So you have to like spray enough water to slow one down so you can get to the other one before it. Because once a building burns down, you've lost the game. You lost your map. So basically, okay. you have to like you. Know, Douse this one enough so that you have 15 and seconds you know before it burns critical? down. Does it give you a, a sound? It, it'll or? actually say fire level critical, but you have to go figure out where that building is and which building it's talking about. Uh, huh. It's pretty obvious because it, usually there's a lot of flames. So. <laughs> is, it, is he throwing water at it or he's vomiting like over? <laughs> I'm guessing it's, it's water. He's, 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 he's doing double farmer blows through the nose yeah. there. He's shooting snot at it. So. <laughs> Maybe if he had the right color scheme, it would... Blue. <laughs> That's on the NTSC <laughs> composite scheme. On on the PAL one, you're actually using water. Nick. Okay, so now farmer blows is burned into my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have a good I have a good story about that, but I can't tell it on here. No. <laughs> <laughs> no don't, please don't. <laughs> and then this is dual bug. I won't play this one because this is a much more common game. Have we covered this one or firecopter on the show, Ken? On, on the game on channel. Uh, Doodlebug was the second week because I looked at, I almost picked it this week and then I'm like, oh crap, we played it already. But Firecopter, no. Okay, well, there's one you can throw in the old holster. It's actually a pretty fun one. 16K RAM required too is a nice low level one. No, oh, okay. Uh, written by Dale Lear. Of course, we know that is the same guy who did uh, Double Back as an example. And, and how does uh, that score by how much fire you put out or? And, and how many of the assassins and stuff you shoot while you're going across. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's, there's multiple things. Um, but it was actually published by Adventure International, you know, Scott Adams' company. So it was kind of an oddball. And not on any other platform. It's one of the unique ones in Adventure International. I had a few games they did for one platform only. Most of the time they tried to make them cross-platform. Uh, that was one that was Coco only. So that's a bit of a unique one in the Adventure International catalog. What year did you say it was? Fire, 1982. Copter? 1982. Yeah. Both of these are. That's that's part of the theme of the show. You pick a month and a year. Oh, okay. And what the game was out. So these are. Yeah, I couldn't read the titles. Italian. Yeah. <laughs> what? Decembre was too hard for you to figure out. <laughs> no, the part right after it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you got to remember for Nick, it's upside down. But uh, right, 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 right. Oh yeah, it is too. Yeah. <laughs> Five eight six one. <laughs> So anyway, I don't know if anybody is listening to this who's Italian by uh, not native speech. Not. <laughs> yeah, especially not Nick. Uh, <laughs> but it'd be interesting, like somebody that fully understands is Google translates pretty good, but it's not perfect. Like there were some sentences that made no sense. So I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, it'd be interesting to get their take of what the show is exactly like and what he maybe thought of the games type thing. Next up, we have a fob. Alan Huffman's been doing series lately on doing uh, conversions 
uh, to printing out the binary versions of uh, numbers in basic. And he found a bug. He was trying to do 16 bit numbers, you know, which should be fairly simple. And he would do basically his little trick of, of printing them out to get the binary digits. And it would give you illegal function call errors every time you got past 32767, which of course is when sign math kicks in. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't get it working. He just kind of gave up on it. And then they got her a suggestion from one of his viewers that left a, ba- a message to him. I'm trying to find the guy's name, RFL Berg. I'm not sure who that is. But he mentioned the fact that if you treat it as sign, like if you actually send it a negative number, then it works. It's, it's, it can't handle the hex like and HF000. It won't hmm. treat that properly. But if you send it negative numbers in the floating point format, then it actually does work. Hmm. Uh, Sample code here. So this line right here was the critical one, 505. So if it's greater than 32767, you're about to wrap into the 16 bit, then make it that number minus 65,536 to make it a true negative number with the basic. <laughs> then it works fine, <laughs> which is pretty odd. But I mean, you got. But then how it. does he? So then he prints it again in hex for the display. Is that what he does? Because the display showed it in hex. Well, well yeah, yeah, because basically what the, the part that was breaking was trying to print the binary version of it because he's using two to the power of. Right. Um, but it would break on that 15th bit. So once he did that little thing here, now it runs fine. Oh, he prints it both ways. I didn't notice. Okay. Yeah. So it's an interesting little trick. If, you, if you've had to do this in basic, I mean, you might have stumbled across the thing. You have to send it a negative number or give it a legal function call. You can't send it the positive you know, number that has a high bit set on the 16-bit number. Which I wouldn't have guessed in a million years. So yeah. thanks to RFL Berg right. and, and Alan for publishing that. I think a zero has to be somewhere. Right? Yeah. Next up, we have John Wayworth, the guy who does the uh, super spread we were talking about. So he's got multiple hardware projects. I mean, he also did the replacement power supplies for the Dragon. Now, this here is a rather interesting one. If you guys watch the Dragon Live special we did in November at the Dragon Meetup in Cambridge at the uh, Universe, uh, was it the Universal History Museum? I can't remember the, the exact name of the facilities. It's on the university campus. Cambridge uh, History, uh, Computer History Museum, I believe it is. One of the things they showed there is a rare prototype. So Dragon, at the time they went under in Wales, was actually uh, been producing the Dragon 64 for a while, but they're also working on the Dragon L for the Dragon Beta and a few other systems. And we saw the Dragon Beta you know, there, and there's only a few of these in existence. And John has been working on reverse engineering the whole darn thing. So he's actually going to produce a new motherboard and he's going to publicly make available the actual files needed to create this for the Dragon Beta. So the Dragon Beta, for those that don't know what it is, was probably uh, the most advanced 689 machine I think I can think of, except for maybe a high-end gimmicks and maybe the Fujitsu FM77. So this thing featured an MMU. It featured from uh, 256K to 768K of RAM, dual 2 megahertz 6809 CPUs, 80 column card built in, RGB built in, floppy drive interface built onto the motherboard, and uh, actually had the auto boot ROM to let you go right into OS 9 right off the bat if you wanted to. And he's actually been working on this for a while. Now he said there's still a lot of work to do, but he's actually getting closer and closer. And there's definitely been some people interested in actually, you know, when he gets this done, is actually getting this thing remade, reduplicated, and actually getting this dual 6809 based system up and running. And I'd love to see, you know, the Fujitsu dual 6809 OS9 ported to this and then uh, see what this thing's capable of, because that, that would be more powerful than the Coke 3. So this was never actually released. Is that correct? No, they had a couple of prototypes made internally and they were working on the software and then they went out of business. Yeah, that was my question about it. Like, there's no software for it, like no OS or anything, right? Um, there was some software they managed to pull off some test ROMs and stuff that Dragon had. So there's a little bit of software for it, but yeah, that it, none of the software really got finished. Hmm. But there is a dual 6809 OS9 version of OS9 for the Fujitsu FM77 already out there. That was a commercial product that was sold in Japan. So if you took that and then you know adjusted it for the specific 80 column card this thing has built in, specific mm-hmm. floppy controller, theoretically that would be one you don't have to start from scratch. And you'd get, you know, full dual CPU action there, which would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Does that actually work as good as it sounds? You know what I mean? Like, I know, like, a lot of people talk about, oh, well, when they first, like, when they first took Pentiums and they, they pipelined them, they, everybody yeah. thought, oh, man, twice the speed. But it wasn't. It was, like, a 30% increase on average. 
So I, like, I think I, it depends on on what the roles. Like if they're trying to make it a general purpose, both CPUs where they're sharing the same RAM and they're sharing the same I/O and all that kind of stuff, it probably does. They probably just kick each other off. Right. You know, in certain areas. Can, My understanding of this one was that the graphics were controlled by one six eight zero nine, and the rest of the system was controlled by the other six eight zero nine. That so, would make sense. So, so then basically that. your graphics are running totally on their own. The 80 column cards running right. totally on its own with its own CPU. So, so in level two, each process had its own 64K of RAM, but in level whatever, each process has its own 68 or 60 X09 with its RAM. And yeah, so if you had your graphics middle. driver running as a separate process with its own separate CPU, you'd just pass you know certain byte sequences. But even do that, you don't even get you won't be getting no, really no benefit from that because you'd only be using the other CPU when you swap to the other program. It makes well, sense well, to me no, that it'd be, it'd be more useful to have one sixty eight or nine control like um, video and maybe I/O and that kind of stuff. The other sixty eight or nine do the hard lifting for all the well, like the stuff. level the way level two's worked out the RAM is segregated, but you could also have CPU segregated. So each process is running independently until it comes to some edge interrupt condition where the main or IO or something. To, it. Yeah. Cause right. I mean, basically the six, eight or nine only knows about the 64 K it's locally got mapped. So if you have an MMU right. that can handle multiple CPUs and say this six and on, you get the first 64 K this six and on, you get the next 64 K they could run completely independent of each other simultaneously. So it depends on how the system's set up, and I'm not sure on the Dragon Bait exactly how that was. But my understanding mm. was that the graphics stuff was under control of one six eight nine, and the main system was under the control of the other. Mm. And this last one here, this is another Dragon Star, but the last one we've got for the news segment today. So this is Adrian Sinclair posted photo, photos of these in the Facebook gra- Dragon group. Now, he had posters made up. Now, we've all talked about how the artwork that was used on the Dragon soft release was far and above better than the stuff we saw in North America. We usually got a you know, Xerox sheet of colored paper with just black <laughs> text. With a few exceptions, Tandy, of course, did some color ones. Uh, Mictron slash Computer Shack used to do full color photos on some of theirs. I've got you know some here myself of those, but mostly it was pretty cheap. Dragon went all out. I mean, they did cassette-based stuff, and they actually had some posters they used to sell of certain really common games. Now, these are recreations based on box artwork at poster size. What Adrian did is he actually scanned them in really high res, cleaned them up a bit because some of the boxes were in a little bit of rough shape. And he's basically duplicated what the original graphics were. And these are actually now 60 by 40 centimeter posters that he made, which works out to- What's uh, that 20, in American? I was just about to say, 23 and a half <laughs> inches by 15 and three quarter inches. So almost two feet by you know a foot and a half. So pretty big. Mm. And some of these look really nice. I wish we had had our artwork like this up here. So they can see oh, Shap, yeah. which was a prickly pair software game from here. Madison Mentor by Spectral Associates. Star Trek Chameleon by Ken Kalish from Computerware. So these are all American games, ironically enough, on this particular page. And here he's got Astro Blast by Mark Data Products. Cosmic Invaders, I think, was Spectral Associates as well. Black Sanctum, which is by Mark Data Products. Again, these are all originally American games. So you're saying but, these are American that got ported, or they were written for the Dragon. Well, they were written in the States for the Coco. And when the Dragon came out, a micro deal that did a lot of the software reselling for the Dragon approached a lot of the American bigger companies like Tomic Software, Computerware, Spectral Associates, Mark Data Products, and resold them on their behalf in the UK and Europe. Mm-hmm. But they did their own artwork. They did their own cassettes. Sometimes they'd even modify the programs a little bit, like the different color sets, you know, because they wanted to see right, color occasion. Right. Um, but they did their own artwork right from scratch. Here's Clicks to Island, Meteoroids, which is Spectral, Quest, which is by Artvark 80 software. And then here he did a zoom up a part of the shaft one, just kind of mm-hmm. give you an idea what, what the artwork looks like. I really wish we had done this up here. And the funny thing is, is that they did this fancy full color artwork and they charged less for games there. Like people in the UK and Europe were used to paying far less than we did. And there was an interesting article on, on a, another retro podcast I saw recently where they have to take what a Coco game or any, you know, North American game for any of the CP platforms in the early 80s, like an Apple II or Atari, and you converted them to today's dollars. We were paying the equivalent of 80 to to $100 a game for a lot of our stuff. That's what we pay now for a game. So it's about right. <laughs> yeah. In the UK, <laughs> they're paying it. like two to 10 pounds. Which even with the pound at that time being worth twice, a little over twice as much as the American oh, yeah. dollar, we're talking five to twenty bucks. Yeah. 
So we were kind of getting screwed here. Well, they were getting them on cassette though, right? Yeah. And so we were, were we for a lot of these. Just... They still charge 28 bucks for the cassette version of Bricks to Island. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> like, for a black and white, you know, generic leaflet in, in the cassette case. They were getting right. this full color stuff. So uh, we were getting rick, ripped off a bit there. <laughs> didn't know though, right? Because we didn't hear oh, no, nothing back then. <laughs> no internet then. <laughs> yeah, we had no idea. That's right. No idea. <clears throat> but I have guys, to say the arbor Nick, What do you awesome. guys have down there in Australia? Were they like written on the back of like ch- kookaburras or oh, something? Like, the paper, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some paper. Print it yourself. Yeah. That's when they published white wipeout software, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all I got for the news. Woohoo. So I don't know if there's any other project updates and acquisitions. We've got Rick Adams kind of gave us an update. Pedro kind of gave us an update. Jay and I kind of gave you an update. Does anybody else have any updates Rick, or acquisitions? Rick has one. Rick? Go ahead, Rick. Who? Is this news to you, Rick, that you have an update? Or? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> my, no. my, my update is it's dark out. <laughs> it is dark out. That's a good point. I think that's still I got to do. Still light here. We got hours to go, man. <laughs> oh, jeez. So you're you're saying you don't have an update, Rick? No, no. I was being facetious. My oh, update was it's five forty three. I'll I'll take his place. I have a little. Well, not really an update. Just uh, some some stats to give on uh, my game. Okay. How big is your nose so far? That's a stat I want to know. It's kind of, three, How much four, is it going to grow after this? That's what that, I want. That goes to six. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, I was uh, just looking at getting some stats together of my my game, uh, the new one, Zero Hour. So I've come up with a few stats about the game. The code, the actual code, uh, compiles to 12K, 12K of code. The graphics... Um, the the graphics that I have stored or load up, 24k, sound samples, 56k, wow. sprite tables and graphics, 16k. Um, the program when it's running all up uses 160k. That's that's all the code and media and space it needs to run. So we're gonna oh, need sorry. like a two-meg ROM then, huh? Sorry, um, not not got that. Hang on, what have I written here? RAM use. Oh no, all that all that stuff I mentioned before was 160k, but the total amount of RAM that it uses uh, is 268k. So I'm really only using half of 512k RAM uh, memory expansion. <laughs> well, you better sorry, add some new levels and features then. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> So, so you are go. you like close to being done that you made those numbers? It or is you just close. Interested? Yeah, it's getting yeah. close. I'm just wondering. Cool. Yeah, some people were asking, I, I think, a week or two ago about, you know, what, how many lines of code yeah, is it so someone, far? Yeah, someone whatever. mentioned it, and I thought, oh, yeah, that'd be an interesting stat to get. So I, Well, our code stats. for our thing is like, what, 14K when it's compiled, I think? For um, sure. Is it I that big? I don't It's pretty big. Let me look. 18k or something? I think it's pretty big. Yeah, if I remember, it's pretty pretty large. But I mean, that's including like the character set. So some of the graphic yeah, assets are yeah. too. That's tiles, the character set. Yeah, yeah. Well, 16, mine, 16k we're at. Yeah, yeah, well, mine was 160 when you include all the tiles and stuff. So mine is bigger than yours. Man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not talking about the nose again here. Did I say we're talking <laughs> about the nose? Or... <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping That's to see all. another uh, video update from you sometime in the next couple of weeks here just to kind of show some of the newly yeah, redesigned. I'm getting, I'm getting very close. Yeah, so anyway. Okay. That's Anybody it. else have any project updates or acquisitions? Because we are coming up on you know the end of the sixth hour or whatever they go on here. So. No. Oh yeah, oh. six hours. Holy cow! Well, we we kind of it was a bit different. I mean, Scott, I knew that our, I knew Scott talks a lot, so I knew that interview would last a while. But he's <laughs> always got so many fascinating stories. I don't mind. 
But we also had Pedro Pena because he had a hard out at a certain time. We also had Rick Adams at a hard out at a certain time. So we want to get their stories in at all this week. I had to kind of sneak them in. So that made the show almost like we had three guests instead of the, the one main one. Next week, no special guests. So it should be a shorter show. Cross my fingers. I'm more worried that it took six hours. It means I've got to go to the toilet. <laughs> Are you sure you didn't already and you just didn't notice? Yeah, 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 I did oh, already. Yeah. yeah, I did already. <laughs> he's, he's wearing his uh, astronaut diapers already. So be fine. <laughs> anyway, I don't think I have anything else to add to that. So we'll see okay. you next week. Oh, did you you already played the Brian Bruder, um, um preview? Yeah, I did that. Uh, <clears throat> it was in the uh, break between um, uh, our two guests. Okay. Because I don't think we need to come back for any summary thoughts or anything. Um, that that interview's in two weeks. No guests next week, so it should be a shorter show. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll skip the outro because nobody could probably hear it anyway. <laughs> <I'm just that. laughs> okay, Zoom, so in that case, we Zoom will is still see... unhappy. Yeah. So in that case, we will see everybody next week. Uh, thanks for hanging out for such a long time here. Everybody in the chat, Tom Eric Anderson, David Lord, uh, Kevin Holloway. Um, can he, well, I guess Kenny Richardson's actually on the panel. Dave Veery, I'm sure his wife's not sitting here listening to all this. Um, at least I hope not. Um, <laughs> Jeremy Landry is in there as well. James Jones is in there. Frederick Provence is in there. Uh, is this a record for, for a normal show? What, what's the what are our shows ever close normal? To six, close to um, six hours, yeah. Our average runs about three and a quarter hours. Oh, well, yes. if it's not a record, I think we could break it. Yeah, let's go. For- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Who wants to be interviewed? <laughs> I think the the image producers might have been this long, and the dragon special definitely was. So, and the virtual Cocoa Fest in 2020. Well, that yeah, one, that, that one beat a- this. Hands that there. had to be that yeah, had to be we two were- parter, So that was eight hours total. Yeah. yeah, but we ran close to this about a year ago. I remember yeah. it. But like I said, we, we almost had three guests with three different segments, so that's that's part of it. So. <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll shut up and actually we'll end it before we hit the six hour mark. So um thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks right. for everybody in the panel. Thanks for everybody in the chat, and we'll see you all next.